Hello, everyone. I'm Yvonne Bennett, a program officer at the National Institute of Mental Health. I want to thank you for joining us today in person and online. On behalf of my colleagues of the, with the Brain Behavior Quantification and Synchronization Working Group and Sensors Workshop Planning Committee, I would like to welcome you to our workshop entitled Sensors Technologies to Improve Our Understanding of Complex Behavior. Now I'm excited and honored to introduce to you one of our inspiring leaders, Dr. Holly Lissenby. She is the Director of the Division of Translational Research at the National Institute of Mental Health, which funds research supporting the discovery of preventions, treatments, cures, and cures for il mental illness across the lifespan. She founded and directs the Non-Invasive Neuromodulation Unit in the NIMH's Intramural Research Program, a pioneering translational research program specializing in the use of brain stimulation tools to measure and modulate neuroplasticity to improve mental health. Currently, she is Professor Emeritus at the Duke University Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, where she was the first woman to serve as chair of the Department of Psychiatry. She has been principal investigator in a series of NIH and DARPA-funded studies on the development of novel neuromodulation technologies, and her team pioneered magnetic seizure therapy as a novel depression treatment from the stages of animal testing, first in human, and now international trials. A prolific author with over 290 scientific publications, she has received national and international recognition, including with the Distinguished Investigator Award from the National Alliance for Research on Schizophrenia and Depression. She is a board-certified psychiatrist and Distinguished Life Fellow of the American Psychiatric Association. Without further ado, please welcome Dr. Wilson -Bee. Well, thank you for that very kind introduction. And I want to start by thanking Dr. Yvonne Bennett, uh, Dr. Dana Slosser, the entire Brain Behavior Quantification Synchronization Work Group Planning Committee uh, and Working Group. It's really been a team effort. And I'm so excited to be here today to, launching, uh, to launch this uh, workshop. Uh, I want to also give a special thanks to Dr. John Nye, the NIH Brain Initiative Director, for recognizing that sensor development is going to be key to our ability to establish brain behavior relationships and encouraging us uh, to explore this area. And that leads us to today's workshop, where we have uh, upwards of 1,100 attendees, mostly virtual, but many of you here, which is testimony to the interest level uh, in this area. So we're really excited to see that. I'm just going to show two slides to introduce us to the Brain Initiative, which many of you are already familiar with. But as you know, it, the mission is to revolutionize our understanding of the human brain by accelerating the development uh, and application of innovative technologies. And if we can uh, advance the slide. Okay, great. And this is a partnership, okay, let me, um, uh, between five U.S. federal agencies and several private foundations, and this workshop uh, itself is a collaboration between NIH and the National uh, Science Foundation. The BBQS initiative, if we can advance the slide. Next slide, please. The goals of uh, brain behavior quantification and synchronization, or BBQS for short, are to develop high-resolution tools and analytic approaches to quantify behavior as a multi-dimensional response to environment and to synchronize these with simultaneously recorded brain activity. Uh, next slide. Uh, we also have a goal of building new conceptual and computational models of behavioral systems uh, to establish causal brain behavior relationships and to enable the develop of, uh, development of novel interventions such as closed loop interventions. We also seek to establish cross-disciplinary consortia, which is part of the goal of this workshop today, to provide an opportunity to mix across the disciplines uh, to be able to develop and disseminate new tools, ontologies, research designs, and ethical frameworks to transform mechanistic brain behavior research. Uh, that brings us then to the goals of the workshop. Uh, if I can advance the slide. Uh, just go ahead and build out the slide there. So our goals for the next two days are to bring together sensor developers, neuroscientists, translational psychiatrists, and neurologists, computational specialists, and others uh, who are interested in developing new sensor, te sensor technologies that will help us be able to quantify behavior in the context of environment and stimulate our understanding of brain behavior relationships. I list on this slide uh, four funding opportunities uh, to draw your attention to regarding PB BBQS research in humans and also uh, cross-species uh, studies, as well as the data infrastructure, data archives, and data coordination and artificial intelligence centers to be able to support this effort. 
Now I'd like to introduce and thank the co-chairs of our symposia, starting with Dr. John Rogers from Northwestern University, who is the Simpson Query Professor of Materials Science and Engineering, BME and Neurosurgery. He also has positions in the electrical and uh, computer engineering, mechanical engineering, chemistry, and dermatology, reflecting the transdisciplinary impact of his work. He directs the Query Simpson Institute for Bioelectronics. Among his many awards are the MacArthur Foundation um, Award Fellowship and the M MIT Limelson Award. Uh, and he is highly um, multi his highly multidisciplinary research focuses on soft materials for conformational electronics, nanophotonic structures, microfluidic devices, and microelectromechanical systems, with an emphasis on bioinspired and biointegrated technologies. I'd also like to introduce our second co-chair, J.C. Chow from South, uh, Southern Methodist University. He is the Mary and Richard Templeton Centennial Chair and Professor in Electrical and Computer Engineering. He's the founding uh, editor-in-chief for the IEEE Journal on uh, Electromagnetics, RF and uh, Microwaves in Medicine and Biology. He has expertise in RF, uh, microelectronic and mechanical systems, um, quasi-optical wireless systems, micro-nano optics, uh, and in addition to his extensive publication and patent record, his work on uh, microscopic windmills and tiny turbines has been covered by uh, National Geographic and many other uh, media venues. Among his many prestigious awards are the Tech Titans Technology Innovation Award, uh, Research in Medicine Award in the Heroes of Healthcare, and uh, I met JC when he invited me to speak at the IEEE Sensors um, Symposium in Dallas, uh, which he chaired, and it was a wonderful eye-opening uh, to see how sensor developers are developing tools that are not yet, but really could be used to advance neuroscience research. And he introduced me to the IEEE sensor community, as well as to Texas line dancing, complete with cowboy hats. I can't promise you that here today, JC, but welcome and thank you. Thank you, Holly. Um, uh, my name is JC Chow. Please call me JC. Uh, November 1st, 2020, when I, Dr. Nzambi, and Dr. Bennett start talking about a workshop. It was six months ago, and today, finally, we realize it. The, one of the reasons is that it is such a huge field, and we feel like, how can we bring engineer, neuroscientists, and behavior scientists together in one place so we can have a strong multidisciplinary collaboration. So that's why we have this uh, workshop. Uh, could you go back one slide, please? Um, however, because this field is so big, we can't invite everybody or cover every field. So we decided that we will have a special uh, issue in IEEE sensor letter, and we are now uh, discussing this to all the uh, uh, speaker, discussion, and facilitator. You are welcome to submit an uh, invited paper to this uh, letter. Uh, to summarize your research uh, overview or review of your research, so we can share amongst the uh, researcher. Also, original paper, original research work are uh, also uh, invited uh, to submit to this journal. The deadline for the submission is July 1st, and we aim to publish this before October 1st. And hopefully this will bring our society all together to form a better bond. So next, uh, let me uh, uh, start with today's session. Uh, we have a very, uh, please next slide. Uh, we have a very uh, tight uh, schedule. So we have to uh, limit each speaker's time. However, I hope that uh, after today's speed dating event, we can have a better uh, uh, understanding of each other and we can start form that multidisciplinary uh, connection among us. Uh, in the first section, we have four speakers. Uh, Professor uh, Sarkar at uh, MIT will join us uh, virtually. Then uh, Professor Rogers from uh, Northwestern University and Professor Dahilia from uh, uh, Northeast University and then Professor Gao from California Institute of Technology. Uh, to save time, each speaker will introduce the next speaker so we don't take time from them. 
and please stick to your uh, time slot so we can have enough time for discussion. After the presentation, we have 30 minutes discussion. The discussion will start with uh, three discussants. Uh, Professor Enant from Georgia Tech, he will join us virtually, and Professor Bessio from University of Rhode Island. I'm sorry, uh, this should have one more, uh, Professor uh, Chris Roberts from UT uh, El Paso. And they will start asking a question to the presenter. After that, we will open to the virtual participants uh, for two or three questions, and then it will be open to the in-person attending here. So now let me start with the section one and professors uh, Sarkars from MIT. Hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here today. Uh, my name is Devlina Sarkar. Uh, I'm an assistant professor at MIT. It's a great pleasure to be here today. Sorry I could not join in person, but uh, still great to be a part of this amazing workshop virtually. Uh, so I started my uh, research journey as a nanoelectronics engineer, and from there took a steep transition to the field of uh, neuroscience. <laughs> So what I will do today is uh, tell you the story of my journey from nanoelectronics to neuroscience and how in my own group, I am fusing these fields together. So all of you must have noticed how your laptop heats up after working for some time. The heat generated is so high that a while ago, I even cooked an egg on my laptop. <laughs> So the energy consumption of information technology is so high that data centers of large corporations use as much electricity as the whole country of Turkey. And developing low power electronics is specifically important when you're thinking about healthcare and bioelectronic interfaces. This is because uh, the bioelectronic interfaces, you want to make them small for them to be minimally invasive. And in those small form factors, they can we can provide a very uh, little amount of energy for the electronics to work with. So the electronics need to be low power. So if we are thinking of embedding sensors and feedback circuits and analysis circuitry for the sensing data within a small form factor of a biomedical implant or a bioelectronic interface, we need to have uh, low power electronics. And that way we can increase uh, the battery life of the medical devices if they have a battery, or it can even open up new avenues for being powered with wireless power transfer mechanism, or even thinking of energy harvested from the body itself. So at the very fundamental building block of electronics is an electronic switch or transistor. And traditionally, what we have done is we are able to reduce the size of this transistor so that we could fit more and more of them. So we can have more functionality within a small area of the chip. And we are also able to reduce the power by reducing the power of this single transistor. So we could reduce the power of the whole electronic circuits. However, the Moore's law has come to an end and the fundamental limits have reached in this uh, scaling, of, specifically for scaling of power. And the fundamental nature of the problem means that evolutionary techniques will no more suffice for the scaling. And you require radical innovations along multiple fronts from materials to device physics. So let us understand where these fundamental limitations are coming from. So in an electronics transistor, the electrons need to jump over an energy barrier to cause current flow. And when this barrier is high, very few electrons go from source to drain and your transistor is off. And when you want to turn on the transistor, you lower the barrier height so more electrons can go from the source to the uh, drain and your uh, transistor turns on at this time. But this way of electronic switching creates a fundamental limitation in how steep the current can increase. So ideally you would want the current to increase from off to on state with application of a very small amount of voltage. But because of this way of switching of electrons jumping over an energy barrier, 
we actually get a very slow kind of gradual switching of electric current with the voltage that we apply. And that causes a fundamental limitation in steepness and, and that parameter that uh, quantifies that is called the subthreshold swing, which tells us how steeply the current will increase with voltage. And at room temperature, uh, there is a limit of 60 millivolt per decade. That means you would need at least 60 millivolt of voltage to turn on the current or increase the current by a decade or tenfold. Now you might think, how would we change this paradigm of uh, electron transport in a transistor? So instead of making the electrons jump over the energy barrier, can you make the electrons just sneak through a barrier like a ghost walking through the wall? You must be thinking, how is this possible? Because we cannot just walk through a wall like that. So while classical physics says that it is not possible, quantum mechanics says this is possible because very small particles like electrons have this wave particle duality, which allows it to sneak through a barrier. And the, uh, like the scientific name of that is a quantum mechanical tunneling effect. So you might think that you would solve all the problems by this tunneling effect, but there are still many challenges. Suppose there's this guy here who really likes low power and thinks that I'm just going to sneak through a barrier. But by the time he reaches the other side of the barrier, he finds himself looking something like this. And this is because the electron waves, they decay exponentially as they pass through a barrier. So that reduces uh, the current uh, to a point that it is even difficult to turn on a tunnel field effect transistor. So to develop an efficient uh, transistor, which can take into effect this tunneling properties has uh, severe intricate device design uh, uh, challenges that needs to be solved. Uh, to increase this tunneling probability, we need to have very high electric field at the tunneling junction. And you need to reduce the barrier width as well as the barrier height. And all of these have to happen at the same time. Moreover, note that just having steep characteristics over a small range of current is not helpful. That would not help to reduce uh, the voltage. And then also voltage is related to the power supply. To re really reduce the supply voltage, we have to have this steep characteristics over a large range of this on-off characteristics of the current. And the International Technology Roadmap for Semiconductors, their requirement is that we need at least this sub-60 subthreshold swing over four decades of current for this electronic switch to be low power or helpful. So now I'll discuss uh, the transistor that we had developed, uh, which helps us to achieve that. And it's called the Atlas TIFET, which is the short form for uh, atom atomically thin and layered semiconducting channel tunnel field effect transistor. So let me explain uh, to you in the next few slides how this transistor works. So this transistor uh, basically uh, uses a 3D material as the source. It's a heterostructure of a 3D material and a two-dimensional material. So we use 3D material as a source because it helps us to create a highly doped source region so that you make sure that the electric field drop in the source is minimal. The channel for this uh, transistor is made of 2D material. And the reason is that in the world of electronics, the rule of thumb is that thinner you can make the channel, the better you can get the electrostatics, uh, even when the transistor is scaled down dimensionally. So in this case, by using a 2D channel, that means basically in this channel, the third dimension is almost missing. So these are materials uh, such as, um, uh, you know, like graphene, you might have, you, you all know about graphene, but graphene does not have a band gap. So we used a 2D semiconductor so that we can have a channel which is only atomically thin, few atoms in thickness, so that you can have improved electrostatics. 
And this heterojunction of 3D and 2D material is van der Waals in nature. So that, is, that means there is no chemical bonding between the 3D source and the 2D channel. So that creates a very abrupt doping profile. And that helps us to create a very, very high electric field at the tunneling junction. So as I mentioned, we need three things. We need very high electric field at the tunneling junction, low barrier width and low barrier height. So this is with this hetero junction of 3D and 2 material, 2D material, you are able to achieve this high electric field, but you still need to have low barrier width and low barrier height. So how do we achieve a low barrier height? So for that, you can choose the materials judiciously. In our case, we use germanium as the 3D material and molybdenum disulfide as the 2D material. And uh, if you draw the band structure of these materials, you will see that they align in a particular way so that the barrier height, which is defined by the conduction band of the channel and the valence band of the source comes out to be low. And also we have to reduce the barrier width. And in this, this case also, the way we have uh, designed the transistor such that the tunneling width of uh, the electrons in this case is only through two atomically thin layers of molybdenum disulfide. So the barrier width is here in this case, only six atoms in thickness. So we can also get ultra thin barrier width. So with this transistor design, we showed that uh, we can actually overcome the fundamental limitation of power of current transistors. You see that the fundamental limitation is shown by this uh, red line here, while our transistor overcomes that limitation and achieves a minimum substitution swing of 3.9 millivolt per decade. And when you compare with a conventional transistor, you can see that this substitution swing always remains above this fundamental limitation of 60 millivolt per decade. And moreover, uh, since this uh, transistor not only achieves a subthermal substitution swing, but also is atomically thin channel, so it's only six atoms thick, and as I mentioned, the thinner you can make the channel, the smaller you can make also in its lateral dimensions. So this transistor can achieve, uh, achieve simultaneous power as well as uh, dimensional scalability. Also, this kind of transistors have uh, are very, very promising for making uh, electrical biosensors. So when you want to make electrical biosensors, what you do is you get rid of the physical metallic gate and the getting effect is provided by the charged biomolecules. Now for transistors, which you want to use as biosensors, what kind of materials uh, would be interesting? So 3D materials are, um, are not very promising when they are you know, not scaled or thinned down because uh, they have lower electrostatics and provide low um, sensitivity, basically lower electrostatic control of the gate. And uh, one-dimensional materials provide great electrostatic control of the channel through getting effect, but uh, processing is difficult because of their one-dimensional structures. 2D materials, uh, on the other hand, could be very interesting because uh, they not only provide high sensitivity, but also provide a easily processable planar platform. And moreover, when you're thinking of designing biosensors, we want something which can conform to the curved surfaces of our body, which can you know, stick to the skin and conform to the skin. And our skin uh, is uh, highly flexible, may not be as flexible as this person's. Uh, so 2D materials provide high flexibility and toughness, and it is ideal for implantable and wearable uh, medical devices. So we had developed uh, um, uh, field effect transistor based uh, biosensors made of uh, two dimensional materials, molybdenum disulfide in this case. And uh, also we have shown that if you take into account uh, different gating regions, whether it is the linear region and the saturation region and the subthreshold region, we can get actually highest sensitivity in the subthreshold region for the transistor biosensor, because in here, uh, the current basically changes exponentially uh, with the gating effect, leading to higher sensitivity. 
Now the question is, can we increase the sensitivity in even further compared to a traditional uh, field effect transistor? So if you can think of the principle, so when a small change in voltage can cause a large change in current, that means also a small number of biomolecules can cause a larger response or uh, give you higher sensitivity. So steeper you can make the characteristics of your transistor, the higher sensitivity you can get out of your uh, biosensor uh, based, based on the transistor. And so instead of using a conventional field effect transistor, if we use a tunnel field effect transistor, we can see that while a sensitivity of a conventional field effect transistor based biosensor is also limited by the subthreshold swing limitation of 60 millivolt per decade, by reducing the subthreshold swing and having steeper transistor characteristics, you can actually increase the sensitivity by five orders of magnitude. So while working on these low power electronic devices and steeper transistors, I got fascinated by the brain because the brain probably can be thought of as the lowest power computer ever. It consumes only about 20 watts of power, similar to a you know, mere light bulb and does all these fascinating functions like thinking, cognition, you know, emotion, feeling. However, at present, it's very dif difficult to understand the brain. Because if you even look into a small region of the brain, you will see that it's formed of a dense jungle of biomolecules, which will probably look very similar uh, to the gum wall in Seattle. So to decipher this dense jungle of biomolecules, you need a super resolution methods, but current super resolution methods are either high, uh, are um, you know, uh, highly expensive uh, procedures or require expert handling, and they are not scalable to 3D brains. They only work in 2D, very thin slices. So to overcome uh, these challenges, um, we, we developed a technology based on next generation expansion microscopy and developed a technology called expansion revealing and showed that it helps us to reveal previously unseen biomolecules in the brain. And in this case, you see example in Alzheimer's brain um, structures, periodic structures of amyloid beta seen through this expansion revealing technologies, uh, which cannot be seen uh, with, at the same level of resolution using existing super resolution techniques. So in, that was my postdoctoral work. And in my own group, what I've been doing is I'm fusing these fields together, the fields of nanoelectronics, um, applied physics, and biology. And our group's major aims are to develop novel technologies for nanoelectronic computations and also fuse these nanoelectronics with biology to create new paradigms for uh, life machine symbiosis. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, my name is John Rogers. I'm co-organizer with uh, JC, and it's been wonderful interaction with Yvonne and uh, Dana to pull together this exciting workshop. I'm looking forward to uh, you know, the presentations that we'll hear today and tomorrow. And getting into discussions, I think, is is the main motivation is to you know, present technologies that, that will stimulate you know, collaborations uh, among the various groups that are uh, excited about this field of study. Uh, my background is in engineering. And so we develop new sensor technologies, and I'll share with you some of the advances that we've made over the last several years in platforms that enable studies of the brain, specifically the human brain, and specifically on uh, devices that can kind of translate and scale and be used uh, you know, in real world settings outside of confined uh, ho hospital uh, you know, settings and, and, and laboratories and so on. And so if you think about you know, uh, behavior in the brain, you'd like to be able to measure brain function, so sensor suites that allow you to do that, uh, but also you'd like to be able to measure behaviors uh, at the same time. And to do that in a way that uh, presents minimal burden you know, for the individual participants in, in studies that, that we could envision you know, as a collective uh, community to explore these very fascinating scientific topics. So I'll give you a little bit of background uh, on what we've been interested in, uh, specifically in the development of soft sort of biocompatible platforms uh, of electronic sensor technologies with wireless communication capabilities, starting uh, you know, with uh, a focus on, on hospital care and ICU monitoring, 
uh, as a background for the uh, platforms I'll describe uh, to you in the next 10 minutes or so, specifically in pediatric multi-channel uh, EEG and uh, functional NEARS uh, measurement technologies uh, with kind of clinical grade levels of precision, but in fully wireless wearable forms uh, through, through collaborations that we've had with folks at Lurie Children's Hospital, Prentice Women's Hospital uh, in Chicago. I'll then uh, talk about how you can combine those kind of measurements of brain function with uh, measurements of vital signs and, and other behaviors uh, associated with physiological processes. And, and in particular, trying to think about measures that would allow you to quantify levels of mental distress and pain in particular in, in pediatric uh, patients. And then I'll kind of conclude with a very large scale sort of population level study of um, your new sensor technologies that might allow for a quantitative assessment of neuromotor development status uh, in infants. So as I was mentioning uh, at, the, at the outset, you know, my background is in, in engineering, but I have uh, joint appointments with our medical school and we're deeply involved with uh, collaborations ac across the clinical community in Chicago uh, and elsewhere. So, um, you know, I run a research group, but, but what's unique, I think, about our setup at Northwestern is we're also operating in the context of an endowed institute that allows us to really accelerate development efforts at the boundaries between engineering science and medical science. And our main focus is to you know, try to develop sensor technologies based on advanced uh, transistor devices, similar to what the Blaina was talking about, but we're really with an emphasis on things that can scale and translate and be directly applied uh, to humans. And so from a material science or biomedical engineering standpoint, what we'd like to do is develop strategies for taking this kind of uh, technology, which sort of serves as the basis for all of consumer electronic gadgetry and many industrial and defense systems and reformulate it in a way that's compatible with soft living tissues so that it can be integrated in, on, or around those soft living tissues uh, in a chronic, chronically stable uh, fashion to, to allow you to sort of blend electronics with, with biology in a sophisticated way that opens up new capabilities in sensing uh, and therapeutics. And a lot of what we've done, uh, at least with human subject studies, is uh, thinking about that interface in the context with, with the skin. And I would say over the last 10 years, we and many other groups, and Janan Bao is here, and, and many other leaders kind of in this space have developed a portfolio of technologies that allow you to really build skin-like forms of electronics that can reside on the surface of the skin in a nearly imperceptible fashion for continuous monitoring of underlying physiological processes, including brain activity. And, um, you know, I think through community level uh, efforts, you know, uh, at, at a global scale in engineering departments or, or around the world, there's been a tremendous uh, amount of um, you know, advances in measurement capabilities in those kinds of skin-like or epidermal electronics. And I won't go through the details here, but just note that each device can be operated in a multimodal fashion. So each device platform can have multiple sensor um, types, uh, you know, co-integrated. But many of these sensors can be uh, mounted at different anatomical locations around the body uh, and operated in a time-synchronized uh, fashion to develop kind of full-body assessments of uh, behavior and brain activity with clinical grade quality, continuous and able to sort of scale, as I mentioned before, outside of uh, laboratory and clinical environments into the real world. An additional area of emphasis uh, for us is in developing low cost platforms that could be you know, uh, you know, available and, and useful not only to parts of the developed world, but also lower and middle income countries. Uh, and so one of our initial areas of focus was to develop technologies of that sort to address you know, one of the most vulnerable and precious patient populations in a hospital setting. And for us, that meant premature babies and trying to move away from old style engineering solutions for monitoring vital signs in these critically ill patients based on hardwired uh, interfaces to expensive uh, boxes of data acquisition electronics and sort of uh, you know, tape based interfaces to uh, the fragile skin uh, of these uh, patients to, to something that would look uh, more compatible with, with these um, your, your pre precious patients uh, in, in terms of elimination of wires and elimination of these invasive tapes. And so it turns out you can do all of that. And this is not a talk to get into the details of exactly how you go about doing that. But a few years ago, we, we were able to publish a paper on skin-like battery-free wireless devices that recapitulate all of the vital signs mo uh, monitoring that's done even in the most sophisticated uh, neonatal intensive care units, level four units, like those that we have in Lurie Children's Hospital, but without uh, the invasive tapes and the uh, expense of the data acquisition electronics and the cumbersome 
a uh, nature of the wired based interfaces that are used today. So those have been deployed on hundreds of patients uh, in NICU units uh, across hospitals in, in Chicago, also now deployed at a global scale in 20 different countries, FDA approved. And really, um, you know, I think moving the needle in terms of how we improve the care of these uh, patients. And again, with, uh, you know, clinical grade uh, quality, multimodal assessments of all vital signs, now actually going beyond uh, what's done even in level four uh, NICUs because we're measuring uh, body sounds as well. So we actually do uh, seismic cardi uh, cardiography as well as uh, electrocardiography, which is, is sort of sort of the standard. So, so not only replicating what's done today, but actually looking for opportunities to go go beyond. And, and, and so those technologies are, are quite quite mature now and entering uh, the, the commercial realm. But what I like to talk about today is sort of advanced versions of those platforms for measuring not only physiological uh, characteristics, motion characteristics, but also uh, processes of the brain. I'll just step you through a few uh, device platforms that we feel are reaching levels of maturity that allow them to be uh, translated you know, out uh, onto patients at, at scale. So I'll just uh, quickly step through first uh, neonatal multi-channel uh, EEG, and here we have uh, deep collaborations with Jeremy Wong and others uh, at uh, Lurie, Lurie Children's Hospital. So we're able to do this now uh, at clinical grade uh, quality. So multi, uh, you know, point interfaces across the, the scalp, all interface to a wireless data collection and uh, data communication uh, module that's compatible with uh, conventional Bluetooth enabled electronics. So you can stream data multi-channel to. Uh, uh, you know, an iPad or, or an iPhone, uh, for example. And this has been scaled and demonstrated across, you know, about 100 uh, patients at, at Lurie, Lurie Children's Hospital. Pediatric patients, again, is main focus. Uh, with benchmarking against, uh, you know, state-of-the-art, you know, clinical uh, standards. And I won't go through the details here, but but the data are essentially indistinguishable. You don't lose anything in terms of resolution. Actually improve things uh, in a sense because you eliminate a lot of the noise channels that uh, are captured by uh, more conventional hardwired uh, interfaces. So this is an example of uh, measurement of an epileptic seizure in a pediatric patient with those wireless uh, devices, along with uh, a NADA system, which is a large uh, rack-mounted um, you know, EEG collection technology that's used uh, as, as a standard of care uh, at Lurie Children's Hospital. So that's one example. Other things uh, that, that can be used in this kind of wireless skin uh, compatible format that allow you to assess various aspects of brain function include functional uh, nears. And so you can replace the wired based systems with a very small, compact, again, flexible, soft uh, mechanics is a, a critical uh, you know, aspect of an interface to the curved surface of the, of the scalp. Uh, and so you can do uh, functional nears. So you can do nears measurements at multiple locations uh, across the head with, with very little uh, you know, adverse uh, impact or device load uh, on the patients. And again, clinical grade quality. So this is uh, you know the kinds of comparisons that we've done to just show that, that Technology is not, uh, you know, a laboratory curiosity, but something that actually you know, realistically replace what's done in a hospital today, but also something that can go uh, into a home setting as well uh, due to the simplified user interface and the lower cost structure associated with these uh, technologies. So two other examples I'll, I'll give you now sort of blending measurements of brain function with uh, physiological measurements and motion characteristics. One thing that we're very interested in collaborating uh, with folks, pediatricians at Lurie Ch Children's Hospital is to try to develop quantitative metrics around pain levels that pediatric patients are, are, are experiencing. They, they can't vocalize or describe uh, what they're feeling, but perhaps with different sensor technologies, monitoring the brain, monitoring physiological characteristics, you could tease out a quantitative score around pain level. And so we developed this particular protocol that involves mounting the devices on infants, waiting for 15 minutes, doing a blood draw, which is already scheduled for that particular patient, monitoring their uh, you know, physiological parameters throughout that blood draw, and then uh, mon monitoring sort of a, a relax, uh, relaxation back, back to uh, your quiescent state uh, for some time after the blood draw. And so this is sort of exploratory effort, but the question is, can you detect sort of physiological measures that could be correlated to uh, pain scoring that's currently done uh, using surveys by uh, NICU and PICU uh, nurses. So not another example. And then one final uh, example I'll, I'll give you is, is one that really exploits not only the multimodal nature of each one of these devices, but this kind of time-synchronized multimodal um, operation that I, that I mentioned previously. And here we're using 11 wireless devices mounted at strategic locations across the bodies of uh, infants to capture a full uh, mo locomotor uh, be behavior for, for periods of time. And so you can use those data streams to recapitulate an avatar for form 
sort of the nature of uh, motions, but, but it's quantitative data. And so the goal here is to take that data, develop machine learning algorithms that can replace the kind of neuromotor assessments that are done by a trained neurologist uh, in a way that can deploy out into remote locations across the country or across the globe to allow these kinds of assessments to be done to capture neuromotor delays at the earliest possible time point so that intervention uh, can be delivered to babies who are at risk uh, of delays and development of CP and other kinds of uh, neuromotor uh, disorders. So this is a massive study, actually. Many hundreds of uh, babies have been um, you know, enrolled in these studies. It's funded by the Ryan Family Foundation, and it's all a data-driven approach to detect uh, delays at the earliest possible uh, time point to not only replicate what uh, neuro uh, neurologists uh, do in terms of assessing these delays, but actually to do better. That That's kind of the aspiration, to capture these uh, delays but before they're even detectable by a trained uh, neurologist. And so we're fairly early in these studies. Hundreds of uh, you know, patients have been enrolled. We use hundreds of these devices and deploy them uh, at scale. And these are some of the initial results from the machine learning that uh, you know, is being developed around these uh, data streams. So those are some of the activities that, that we're uh, looking at. I'd be you know, happy to talk uh, to, to folks who are interested uh, you know, and get, give you all the details and look for collaboration opportunities and you know, cer certainly looking forward to those conversations. I want to acknowledge all the senior collaborators who've been involved in this work. We're deeply engaged with the clinical community. I think it's a very important aspect of how we do engineering sciences uh, to be directly embedded in, into that medical community. That's very important. The senior collaborators, but the students and the postdocs uh, who do the work are the most important folks. And so I always like to conclude my presentations by uh, acknowledging them for their hard work. Thank you very much. So I think my job is to introduce the next speaker, Ravinder uh, Dahia, uh, who recently moved to uh, Northeastern University, and he'll share with us some of his work in this area. Um, thank you again, John. So, All right, so I'll uh, I'll complement what John said. I'll be speaking more about learning capability of sensors. Uh, a brief background. Uh, the research we are doing in the field of sensors, we try to understand uh, humans uh, and use this knowledge to, uh, to apply in robotics and prosthetics. We have developed large area skins, and which has been used in uh, humanoids as well as in prosthetics. But there's a lot uh, that that is still missing when we come to to uh, you know comparing robots with uh, humans. And the key difference here is learning, and that also gives a key difference that I see in the in the field of sensors in general. We see a lot of sensors these days and wearable uh, and as a wearable devices. They are outside the body, or the sensors, uh, implantable sensors inside the body as well. We have seen a lot of uh, uh, microelectrode arrays based work also in the past. And uh, in context with uh, with the um, uh, brain, uh, it has been also implemented. Some of these have been used to control the uh, the artificial limbs as well. Uh, they have been used for the excitation of certain parts of the brain as well as for the recording of the data. But the eventually all that data is recorded goes to in hardware where you further process it. And that's where I I would say sensors limitations of current sensors would lie. Uh, we have seen a lot of work on electronic skins also, and uh, um, and the major focus has been on on developing the top layer, which is the sensing layer. But if you look at the humans uh, human skin itself, the data processing starts from the from the point of contact itself, and that is where you have to think about behavior. If you if you look at the behavioral quantization. Uh, and the sensors can, in addition to recording the data, if it, they can also learn the data, uh, learn from that, and that learning over a long period of time, it will reduce the number of devices. It will also help us solve the problems related to power consumption. And in this direction, there is a well, there's uh, you know a work already uh, taking place. It's just that it has to be brought together. If you look at uh, biological level, then you'll see. Uh, there is a sensory neuron and there are nerves, which is uh, related to communication channel. Then we have the soma, synaptic junctions. Uh, some work has been uh, taking place here in, in, in terms of sensory neuron. You, you see various type of sensors, touch sensors and temperature sensors and, uh, and other sensors that have been reported. 
then we also come across the uh, the uh, the devices such as which uh, you know these simple circuits which create these spiking networks. We also uh, come across memristors. But these are kind of being uh, the research is is uh, is disconnected in many ways. And if you look at the the how the tactile data is processed in the human skin, then you will realize that it starts at the at the point of contact itself. So that is something we need to bring in. We have to we have to see how human level sensation and perception can be brought into artificial systems. And in that regard, you may have to think about multiple layers uh, of the skin, which has sensors layer as well as the the neural layer or a neuromorphic layer, all implemented in hardware, so that the data that that you generate or sensors generate can be reduced at the point of contact itself. And what comes out is is a learning part. In this regard, I will uh, I'll also uh, present an example where we recently reported a synaptic transistor, a printed synaptic transistor. And this slide shows the kind of comparison between uh, biological tactile neural pathway and artificial tactile neural pathway. And my hope is that this uh, such such examples could be uh, could be used also for quantization of brain behavior, particularly because this is important over time scale. So if the device, if the transistor itself learns over a period of time, then it will uh, it will help us resolve the power uh, issues as well, because device will be turning on only when it is required, otherwise it won't work. So that's the, the kind of sensory neuron block, and this is the cuneate neuron block that we see. And as far as touch receptor is concerned, there's an analogous, uh, the touch sensor here, which is uh, shown by the variable resistor. And there is integrate and fire neuron, which is something that happens here as, as uh, spiking or, or pulses take place. Then there is a transistor which learns over a period of time. And you can reset it as, as required. And after that, you again have integrate and fire neuron, and then there is an action takes place. So it's a complete cycle from sensation to perception and then action. So in this regard, the transistor I mentioned, we printed these transistors. These are nanowire-based transistors. A large number of transistors were printed on flexible substrate. We characterize these transistors. Um, and uh, also then we, uh, we evaluated the learning behavior using excitatory and inhibitory functions. So this is the pulse that you apply, positive pulse or negative pulse that you apply. And based on that, the weight uh, modulation takes place as the number of uh, pulses increase. The, the fundamental behind this is simple that in case of inhibitory signal, you have a T less than zero uh, gate voltage is equal to V rest. There are some, the interface, some charge carriers are distributed in this way. But when you apply a pulse, then there's a redistribution takes place. And when you remove it, this redistribution can be reset, but at this point, it may not be the, uh, the same as the initial value. And because of this, this change at the interface, you can say over a, over a period of time or a certain short term or a long term, depending on the interface properties, the, 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 the distribution can be different. And you can assume, you can say this is how the transistor is learning. We, uh, we evaluated this sort of uh, behavior of the transistor in this way, and we applied, for example, what higher voltage frequency of the, of the signal would change. That was amplitude to frequency conversion. And we then also evaluated the, the efficacy of this approach in case of robotics by applying the signal before learning. For example, you see here, user is pressing the sensor, but nothing happens. But once the, the, the transistor learns after after a couple of times, robot also starts to react to that. So there is also electronics behind it. It's not fully printed. So as you can see, some PCBs, uh, some uh, breadboards are still there. And the synaptic transistor part was printed. So our goal is to print everything and make it, uh, make it quite small. Another example in this case is the temperature sensor. This is under another printed temperature sensor. And in this case, we, we, we mimic the skin in a sense that the, the sensitive material, which is uh, again nanowires, vanadium pentoxide nanowires, they are embedded in uh, PDMS, a soft material such as our skin is. Uh, the PDMS, uh, it was not thick, it was about 100 micrometer. The good point here is that the sensor, despite the, the 
cover layer being uh, thermal insulator, sensor was working nicely. In this case, sensor does not learn. So we were trying to compare, in this case, sensor does not learn, but there is, you collect the data as we normally do these days. We collect the data, then apply machine learning algorithm. But like previous example where we have synaptic transistor, the same thing can be also implemented uh, in case of uh, in case of temperature sensors also. So these are the printed temperature sensors. These these are lines that you uh, silver color that you see. They are all nano wires. We tested these sensors over large number of heating cooling cycles, and the response was uh, was quite good. Uh, less than a second response uh, rise time and and the same order in the in the recovery time as well for temperature sensors. It's quite interesting. Interesting, and we tested it for. Uh, 5 degree to 55 degree on, on different body parts as well. And the video here shows uh, the pain reflects the temperature related pain. In this case, sensors are again placed on the fingertip of the robotic hand. That was one sensor shown here. And the video shows uh, the extreme scenario where a red hot rod of about 400 degrees Celsius was brought uh, close to the robot and robot was reacting to that. So such uh, sens sensors and electronics, if we put them together, if we make uh, 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 the device itself such that it learns over a period of time, then the behavioral aspect can be captured by single device and number of devices that are needed to, to, to capture such uh, 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 so behavior over a long period of time can be lesser. And that would also uh, help us resolve the problems related to integration at system level and also issues such as power. So I would like to conclude by saying that physical, chemical and biosensors, they have been investigated a lot and they are important to measure various parameters uh, for advances, not only in um, for the behavioral sciences, behavioral quantization, but also in areas such as robotics, bionics, healthcare, IoT and wearables. But at the same time, I would say sensors alone may not be uh, sufficient particularly under dynamic environments um, where learning and forgetting capability are important and we they can help unravel changes over a period of time as in uh, behavioral studies. So in this regard, intrinsic properties of sensing materials can also be exploited uh, in addition to the structure of sensors. So uh, that is where I would like to end my talk. Thank you very much. And now I invite uh, Vega to present his uh, part. Hi everyone, it's wonderful to have this great opportunity to share our recent research on skin interface wearable biosensors. So as we know, wearables can play a very important role in personalized healthcare because they can continuously collect data from our body and tell us what's going on, what's going wrong with our house. But if you look at all these commercially available house monitors like Apple Watch or Fitbit, they can mainly track the physical activities of vital signs, cannot provide more useful information about our health at a molecular level. So we think a major gap, which is also a great opportunity in the field of wearable biosensors, is how can we perform physiological monitoring at a molecular level continuously and ideally non-invasively? Think about the continuous chemical sensing. We know there is CGM right now, but it, that, that is only limited to glucose. So we are looking at one important body fluid, the human sweat, which, which we can retrieve conveniently, continuously, and non-invasively. And surprisingly, sweat contains many important biomarkers, including a variety of electrolytes, metabolites, nutrients, over 300 proteins, and many different types of peptides and hormones, including multiple important stress hormones. And we can also identify different types of substances and drugs from human skin. Imagine that if we could develop a sweatband, a wearable sensor that can analyze the different type of chemical biomarkers from the skin continuously and non-invasively, we could use this larger set of chemical information for a variety of fundamental and clinical investigations, and especially toward biomarker discovery. When we can combine chemical information with physical information through AI, machine learning, we can discover or underline the, and basically the intrinsic the role of each biomarker or combination of these analyzed biomarkers in disease management. Back to seven years ago, we presented a fully integrated wearable system that can perform multiple analysis of multiple metabolites, like glucose and lactate, multiple electrolytes, such as sodium and potassium, along with the skin temperature. So this is a wireless system that can continuously collect data 
and uh, process the data and send data to the cell phone through Bluetooth. And we have the uh, cell phone app as well. You can real time read the analytic concentration and save the data to the computer or in the cell phone. So in this way, we can continuously collect data from our daily activities. We also made a sensor patch with high performance in a mass-producible way using laser engraving, for example. We can make this laser engraved graphene biosensor that can very sensitively analyzing biomarkers in human sweat. And they can also be used to develop a physical sensor to monitor cardiac activity or other vital signs such as respiration. We can also use the laser engraving to make a microfluidics to sample sweat efficiently to get real-time information out of sweat. We can also mass produce this chemical biosensor uh, using inkjet printing. In this case, you know, we use different nanomaterial. We can customize the ink to make our own nanomaterial ink to prepare different sensors that are suitable for detecting different types of low concentration biomarkers. So since we are talking about sweat sensor, many people have a question, what if I don't have sweat, right? So we have to make sweat accessible without the need of any vigorous exercise. So we monitor our chemical information or health information continuously 24-7. So uh, then we need to learn about how to get sweat throughout uh, you know, time in general. We learn how we can our body uh, generate sweat. Basically, uh, for some reg regulation, our you know, uh, somatic neurons in the sweat gland secrete acetylcholine, this neurotransmitter, which binds to muscanic receptor that you know, enable sweating process. So instead of letting our somatic neurons induce acetylcholine, this neurotransmitter, we can locally, transdermally deliver certain type of neurotransmitter or drug to tell our sweat gland to let them sweat. In this case, we develop a new platform that can be used to on-demand access sweat without need for any vigorous exercise. In this case, we apply a very small current, around 50 microampere, for only a few minutes, so we can deliver a drug called a carbacol that can locally induce sweat for a very long period of time. Again, only a few minutes, very small current, and the user will not even feel anything, but you will get a continuous sweat for hours or two days. It works for me three days if I do five minutes stimulation. So we can have this microfluidics continuously sample sweat in real time. You can see here, a sweat come out. We have this black dye to let you see the old sweat will be easily pushed out by new sweat very efficiently. The sensor is sitting in the middle reservoir. You see now black dye get cleaned out. We can get real time chemical sensing in this case. This really opened the door uh, for continuous monitoring throughout the activities. We also made our sensor so stable, the enzymatic sensor, ion selective sensor, they can stable for days without obvious drift. In this case, we can continuously monitor our health throughout the activity. We also improved our energy harvesting system, even we can using sweat or even weak indoor light to power every single module of this wireless system, including sweat induction, different uh, type of uh, wearable chemical sensing, ampermetric, potential metric, voltammetric impedance, and Bluetooth wireless communication without using any battery even. So regarding to sweat, uh, like a stress and mental health, we know that stress is very important. It is related to over 95% of diseases, including cancers, anxiety, depression, PTSD, and cardiovascular diseases. But again, even stress is so important if you are using Questionnaires. This is gold standard right now, which can be very subjective. Same, same thing applied to depression or suicide, still based on questionnaire. So can we have a way using wearable sensor to quantify stress or mental health? People you try to use the heart rate, temperature, or skin conductance. Those are general, not the condition specific and lack accuracy. So we are looking at is there any chemical information we can get from our body. Of course, one of the most well-known stress biomarkers is stress hormone cortisol. So, but if you get blood to monitor blood cortisol, it is problematic because blood draw itself induces stress. That's why we can apply our sweat sensor to quantify cortisol in human sweat using this uh, laser ingrained graphene sensor. We develop the sensor so accurate and efficient that we can quantify cortisol within a minute. So we also identified there is a circadian rhythm in uh, sweat cortisol, similar to blood. You know, cortisol level is important, but you have to know the baseline because every day cortisol fluctuates high in the morning, low in the evening. The pattern of cortisol is very important for people with depression 
for people with PTSD or even people with diabetes, their circadian rhythm of cortisol is different from, from healthy people. We identified a sweat of circadian rhythm of cortisol from subject, you know, over six, seven day period. The correlation between sweat and serum cortisol level is pretty high. And we did different type of uh, stress response study, apply psychological stressor, physiological stressor. Here are two physiological stressors we applied, aerobic exercise and cold pressure test. We can see that this stressor caused rapid increase of both blood and sweat cortisol level. And our sensor can rapidly access these rate changes in general. And the sweat contains many other biomarkers related to stress, not only about cortisol. If you look at this in general, the process, how our body produces neurotransmitter and stress hormones, uh, phenylalanine, uh, tyrosine, our dopa, dopamine, noradrenaline, adrenaline, you know, these are all in the process. Actually, we can identify most of these chemicals in human sweat, and they have good correlation with the blood one overall. And uh, our stress biomarker in general is not limited to these chemicals. Even glucose itself is a very strong stressor. It actually, even we don't have dietary intake when we're under stress, glucose level quickly increase in our body, actually. You can, people apply CGM to monitor stress as well. So we could use this wearable sweat sensor to quantify stress biomarkers from skin. For example, here, we can use this laser engraved graphene electrode to quantify uric acid and tyrosine. Tyrosine is a precursor for neurotransmitter production. So we can directly uh, measure the oxidation of uric acid and tyrosine from a skin and using this uh, highly uh, sensitive graphene electrode. But again, this doesn't really give us specificity if we want to moni uh, monitor electroactive molecules at very low concentration. Why? Last year, we presented a new approach. We can apply a uh, biomimetic uh, wearable sensor, which uses molecule imprinted polymer, which acts as artificial antibody. They can selectively find or recognize very low concentration of different type of biomarker. It is a universal approach. We can apply this to monitor broad spectrum biomarkers continuously to transduce the signal to measurable electrochemical signal. Again, to transduce recognition to measurable uh, uh, chemical signal, we are introducing a redox probe in the middle of this molecule printed polymer and the laser engraved graphene. So we can quantify the redox signal change to know the specific biomarker concentration. Using this way, we can monitor broad spectral marker, as I mentioned earlier. Here, we show that we can apply this to continuously tracking every single type of essential amino acid, vitamin, and of course, many other stress-related biomarkers. And some examples, we can look at this uh, amino acid or metabolite level change over time during our daily activity when we have dietary intake. We also recruited different type of patients. We have evaluated our sensors on obesity subject, up to diabetes subject. Recently, we also accessed ETSD, uh, COPD, heart failure, different type of patient population. So in general, how can we apply this to quantify stress? We already showed you know, this sensor can be useful to monitor stress biomarkers. Uh, specifically, how can we quantify different type of stress or stress levels? And we know that a stress response is actually a multi-dimensional uh, response. Not only it affects you know, uh, cardiac activity that also affect uh, our uh, metabolic process. In this work, actually, we show that we, if we couple the typical vital sign collection, we can monitor temperature, skin response, uh, skin conductance, and the pulse valve form. You know, these are very important to monitor stress. We can couple this with a series of chemical sensors, which are also known to be respons uh, res I mean, responsible for stress in general. We couple this multimodal sensor patch in human trials, we apply different types of stressor, physiological stressor, psychological stressor, using AI, using machine learning, we can train our model, they can distinguish each stressor, they can also quantify stress very accurately, actually over 98 and 99% of confidence level. So in summarize, uh, I showed that you know, we could monitor chemical information through non-invasive and continuous sweat analysis. And I believe this type of wearable chemical sensor will play a very important role in personalized healthcare and also very important in stress, of course, stress and mental health assessment, especially we quantify this multimodal, multiplex physical chemical information continuously around AI, machine learning. We can really uh, like a, enable biomarker discovery to identify biomarkers for stress and mental health. 
in the end, I would like thank my group, our collaborators in different uh, in different medical centers, and uh, our funding support. Thank you very much for your attention. So now, I welcome all the presenter on the stage, and also discussing. Adada Rogers, the Tahima. <clears throat> uh, we have discussion on Dr. Uh, Bestio from University of Rhode Island and Dr. Uh, Chris Roberts from UT El Paso. And we should have Dr. Inan online from Georgia Tech. Uh, for the uh, time's sake, so we will uh, kick off the discussion uh, first with the discussion asking question to our presenter. So I don't know if uh, Dr. Bestio or Dr. Roberts, uh, which one you want to start? Sure. Uh, can you hear me okay? So uh, thank you all for uh, fascinating talks. Um, kind of an open question, I think, to to any of you. Um, as sensor and electronic experts, what do you feel is the largest challenge to applying your technologies to the brain behavior quantification effort? Can you speak uh, about your use of uh, commercial electronics and packaging to enable uh, moving your uh, research into the uh, clinical realm? Maybe I can take a stab at that. So um, I would say a good fraction of the work that we do in my group is very much oriented around development of technologies that can scale and translate and be manufactured in a cost-effective way to, to allow real meaningful, you know, population scale studies. And so I think we take an approach whereby um, if there there is a route to a commercializable solution where we're leveraging componentry and manufacturing processes that are already established for consumer electronics gadgetry, we try to do that, you know, and uh, I think it's usually the case that um, you will modified and adapted versions of those kinds of uh, platforms can can have utility but but you had to add sort of innovation on top of that so most of what what we do is sort sort of a blend but but we try to leverage what's already available to the greatest possible extent um you know and and that's kind of what we do at a translational level i think it's an academic group you should be doing like really exploratory next generation far out stuff but I think for real practical studies of brain and behavior science, um, you, you need you need devices that go beyond what can be constructed by hand by a grad student in an academic lab, you know. And so, so I think there's a great synergy between those two styles styles of work. And if you don't have to reinvent something, use a commercial solution is is kind of the way the way that we approach things. Yeah, I, I wanted to add to what uh, John said, and I, I tried to include in my presentation because its uh, behavior is has a time component. So, if we can also the one of the challenge that I'm seeing is is the lack of learning capability within the hardware itself, which leads to the point where we have no choice but to use conventional electronics, the same strategies. You got the sensor, you got you know. Um, digitalization of the data and then rest of the things. So if we can look at new paradigm, new ways in which sensors are fabricated such that they exploit intrinsic properties of the material to also have learning capability, then it will help resolve, you know, uh, the, the questions such as number of devices can be reduced, integration challenges will be lower, power consumption will be lower, that way, we could look into new new directions. Uh, could you speak into the microphone? Online people may have problem. In yeah, in case of the uh, wearable sensor, uh, when we want to collect data for behavior for mental health uh, mental health assessment, we think uh, the the capability of continuous data collection is very important for us, especially when we want to integrate more and more sensors. Uh, you know, we need a multiplex real time data collection in this way. The off the shelf uh, uh, ICs has much higher uh, in the. Um, capability overall. That's why we try to assemble these off-shelf ICs into a flexible wearable PCB that allow us to real-time collect data. I think uh, this type of system integration approach is very important to reliably 
for us to access data for biomedical applications, and in this case, in particular, in behavior and mental health assessment. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Bessio? Yes, I've got another general type of question. You know, I'm curious, well, it was amazing that you all were able to get your talks done in 12 minutes describing all of that material. But um, what applications are there that you haven't been able to develop the sensors for yet that might fit into this uh, BBQS? That seems like a tricky question. So, uh, John, would you like to take the hit? Well, maybe maybe just as a very practical kind of straightforward answer. I mean, I think you could, you know, consider consider things about 10, 20 years out, and, and I think there's a lot of opportunities in that space. I think Weigal and you know, we we're also interested in chemical biomarkers and multimodal assessments, not just biophysical but biochemical. So, I think there's a lot of things, but like. As an immediate example of a, of a challenge is uh, around EEG, for example, in, in, in sort of realistic kind of, um, you know, practical scenario, just due to the very um, low signal levels and, and, and the complications associated with noise, especially like motion-induced artifacts, Johnson noise picked up by, you know, the leads that, that connect the electrodes to, to the um, you know, data acquisition electronics. So that's something I, like we, we struggle with. We, we can achieve exceptional performance in a very controlled setting, but, you know, in daily, uh, you know, activities, it, it becomes pretty challenging. So I think me measuring brain activity directly in a non-invasive way, let, let's put it that, that way in, in a more general sense. And so I think functional NIRS, EEG, the, these are great measurement modalities just because there's an established base of knowledge around how to interpret that kind of data. And I, I think that's a great starting point because behavioral scientists, clinical, you know, um, physicians and so on kind of know what to do with that data. And so I, I think you start there and then kind of add advanced modalities on top of that. But as a practical consideration, EG is pretty hard, but but it's pretty important, you know, kind of, kind of measurement to make. Thanks. Um... You know, uh, you're online. Uh... I'm sorry I couldn't make it, uh, but I really enjoyed the talks virtually. And and uh, it's a little difficult to hear in the Q&A part of it. It's been a little bit difficult with a couple of people, but I think hopefully that's resolved. But um, so hopefully I won't repeat something you've already talked about. But my, my question, actually, I think that Dr. Rogers' talk, especially where he was discussing the quantification of pain in kids, I think brought up some really interesting questions from my end that I think seem to sort of um, seem to be pretty common in this field overall, which is sort of relating to gold standard and how do we, how do we essentially um, take something like pain, for example, where sure there's pain surveys and there's kind of subjective quantification of pain, but that can sort of fall into the pitfalls of interoceptive um, sort of challenges and and especially when it comes to kids you know <laughs> we used to yeah it was very difficult to ever find out what level our kids were hurting after some sports injury or something so how do we um how do we i guess think about for these sorts of technologies especially when recovering the breadth from wearables that are maybe measuring physical or biophysical parameters out to molecular and you know uh, maybe even further sort of uh, nanotechnology kind of work. How do we make sure that that what we're measuring kind of tracks the gold standard? And what is the gold standard? And how should we be, you know, how should we be going about that? What do you guys think? Maybe I can say a, a couple of things, and and I think way way is deep into this space as as well. And so uh, let let him comment also. I I think these are great points, Omar. I mean, what is ground truth, right? I I think it's not clear. So there are surveys that that are used pretty pretty standard you know forms that that nurses use to assess pain levels, but what we find I don't want to cast any aspersions on on nurses because they've been great great collaborators for us. But if you look, they're incentivized actually to downgrade you know pain because they're you know the performance of the hospital gets uh, scored in, in in part by you know, what levels of pain their their patients are experiencing. And so that distorts, you know, the, the outcomes of those uh, surveys. And so I think it's a great, great question, something we certainly uh, struggle with. But um, 
I think I think it's the best we can do at, at, at the moment. And maybe, maybe some of these biochemical markers, we've been, done cortisol and sweat as well. I think Wei's probably deeper into that than we are. But but I think, um, you know, there's some novel, you know, sensor modalities that, that are emerging. The idea of looking at heart rate variability and correlating that to mental distress is a pretty old concept. So you kind of want to fold that into to whatever you're doing. But, but all sorts of uh, additional things can be measured now and and you can track things at multiple body locations and so anyway i think it's a rich space and and there's tremendous uh you know diverse data streams that that people can now uh access i think we have kind of an interesting protocol where pain is being induced so we know where where the changes should occur and you know the magnitudes of those changes and how they connect to the surveys is kind of uh you know a, a, an area of on, on ongoing work but uh but but it, but I think it's very interesting pediatrics especially because because they as I mentioned before you can't really vocalize what what they're feeling and so that's very much our emphasis. But I'm sure Wei, Wei has deep, deeper thoughts than that. <laughs> Thanks. I don't have deeper thoughts, but uh, in general, I think a pain is like a stress. I've talked with some clinicians on both pain and stress. It's very hard to access. The gold standard are both based on subjective questionnaires. So what we can do, I think, is really multimodal sensors. So. Uh, I know for the pain test, people try to use uh, imaging, uh, different type of imaging modality to do AI, do machine learning. For stress, we apply a very similar uh, way by applying vital signs, chemical information, actually more data is better. So we have to rely on still right now the gold standard, which is still subjective questionnaire. But we can train the model when the subject number is large enough, the model is, can be very robust. So we can build a model that can predict the stress score or pain score much better than individual's questionnaire response. So actually, this AI model will be more robust than uh, personal answer in general. But we have to rely on this questionnaire subject ones right now. Uh, I think the AI multimodal sensor will be the uh, way to go. Yes, uh, that's what this uh, workshop is about, uh, because uh, for engineers, we need our colleague in neuroscience and uh, behavior science colleagues help. How do we define the standard? So I think we will skip the online question. We have an in-person question here. Hi, um, I'm Val Gritlenko from West Virginia University, and my background is neuroscience. Um, so to comment, maybe if, if you could comment more on the future of AI uh, applications here, um, because we do get a lot of data and making sense of the data from these sensors is very important to do it right, right? Well, we want to gain insight into the mechanisms underlying these um, uh, conditions, deficits, you know, pain levels. Um, and AI, it seems like so far is notoriously bad at getting insight into mechanisms. So maybe you can expand on that. Thank you. Uh, I think Ravinda, uh, your work is very related to this. Maybe you can answer the question. Oh, well, uh, the question, a uh, current approach is of using AI is that you collect the sensor data and you start, you know, using those AI algorithms. So, I mean, from the way I see, we don't really gain much because you have already collected the data. So as, as a future, I'm seeing more uh, AI entering into more hardware itself. So the transistors and circuits will be developed in such a way that they process the data uh, as a you know algorithm would do. And that would bring this uh, together in a sense, we reduce the amount of data and along with the type of devices I was mentioning with learning devices with learning capability, uh, we may see more and more cognitive circuits uh, going forward. Thank you, Ravinda. Um, we only have time for one question because we have to get back on the schedule, please. So um, I'm just uh, reacting a bit to Dr. Nan, Dr. Rogers, and Dr. Uh, Gallows. Can you introduce yourself? Oh, yes, please. I'm Ken Kishida. Uh, I'm a assistant professor at uh, Wake Forest School of Medicine in North Carolina. Uh, I'm a neuroscientist, um, and I'm really interested in biological basis of subjective experience. <clears throat> right. So the the comment in the discussion earlier um, about jumping to kind of physiological biomarkers that correlate to these kind of subjective surveys and assessments uh, in the discussion, it sounded to me like there's still a huge gap, right? That that the, that the research could try to solve. Um, it's one thing to correlate 
physiological measures to kind of subjective reports, but we don't really understand how that's mechanistically connected, right? And, and so maybe the discussants can can talk about how maybe their tools um, and what they're measuring uh, might um, be one side of the, the, the bridge uh, that we need to build to, to understand how the brain generates these, these feelings in these reports, rather than what sounds to me like we understand one side of the, the spectrum, the other side, but we don't understand how it's connected. And so we're building correlations where we may be missing the actual feeling of pain and how that comes about. Uh, thanks. Uh, this is the reason we have this workshop to build that bridge. Uh, who would like to take the question? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think you're getting right to the uh, core of the issue, right? And and maybe the opportunity that might arise from you know multidisciplinary collaborative work among this community, uh, because because I think you know that connection is is missing. But but I would say you know you know understanding that connection is missing. But I but I would say that connection hasn't really even been firmly established yet. So so. Um, I think you kind of have to work on on both both aspects. Uh, I think one, once you have a set of measurements, biophysical, biochemical, that you know can you know reliably connect to some aspect of pain experience or brain function, th then you can begin to sort of tease out you know how these th these parameters are actually related. Please move the microphone closer. Yeah, and so. Um, you know, we we do machine learning and and you know as an engineer I I think you know, the you can't you can't use machine learning and AI as, as a crutch I I think that that's kind of a a flawed approach um, because not only is it black box it it can you know learn features of the data that that aren't really intrinsic to to the response that that you're uh, see, seeking to capture so so I think there needs to be a continued emphasis on sensor fidelity and reliability and multimodality and uh ai will will pair with that but but the data has has to be you know accurate and 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 sort of sort of sort of re reliable but but one thing that we're doing just to give you give you an example so you know try to connect physiological measurements that you can do non-invasively to blood pressure sort of a continuing interest you know that that's uh you know, addressing in a very important unmet uh, clinical need. How do you do uh, beat to beat non-invasive uh, blood pressure? So you can measure things like ECG, SCG, PPG. You can collect all these data streams and then try to develop a model that that connects those measured parameters to say arterial line measurements of blood pressure. So you can kind of do that. But then getting to your question, how do you then tease out what are the key features that that are re really leading to that blood pressure uh, estimation? And there are ways now. Uh, in explainable uh, AI to begin to um, use the algorithms not only to establish that connection, but to tease out key features of the data that are driving that prediction. And I think maybe that sort of strategy could, could be useful in answering your question around brain uh, uh, behavior uh, as well. So that, that's kind of the way I would see things play out. Yeah, sorry to cut in. Uh... Our online people are getting fanatic. They would like to get at least one question in. And please uh, stick uh, uh, for the whole workshop because in the end of the day, tomorrow, we're going to address the AI machine learning issue. Okay, uh, we have one question from online. We only have one minute. So um, lots of interesting questions online if panelists could take a look at them. Um, I'm picking one that's interesting um, broadly. So has anyone considered sensors that can pick up on food intake behaviors in humans in ways that are more scalable, perhaps um, wearable microphones of bowel sounds or anything like this. So you want to take the things? I don't want to dominate here. Somebody, <laughs> somebody else can, we're deep into yeah. that issue. So yeah. I'd be happy to talk to you about it offline. We have many, many activities in that space. Uh, so uh, uh, this afternoon, we're going to have a section about remote sensing and wearables and at that time, I think uh, the presenter will talk about that issue. Okay, um, we are really behind. Uh, we only have about uh, nine minutes uh, for the break. So uh, thank you all very much. Uh, I know this is a very deep topic. We probably need month to talk about them. Uh, so please uh, come back at uh, 1140. Uh, eight minutes from now, and we'll restart the uh, second one, second section.
So at this time, I would like to introduce our next session one moderator part for part B, Dr. Svetlana Tatic Lucic. Svetlana is a program director for communication circuits and sensing systems in the Division of Electrical Communications and Cyber Systems of the Engineering Directorate at the National Science Foundation. She manages the interdisciplinary science and engineering thrust in the area of sensing and biomedical applications of advanced technologies, while also addressing the underlying fundamental research. Svetlana joined NSF as a program director in November of 2021. She is also a full professor with a joint appointment between the bioengineering and electrical and computer engineering departments at Lehigh University, where she served as the associate dean in the College of Engineering. Please welcome Dr. Tatic Lucic. Thank you for this kind uh, introduction. Uh, so my task is to introduce you to the second half of the sensor session here. And we'll have three speakers. Uh, first speaker is Professor Reza Gozzi from University of Maryland. The second one, Professor Jean Anbao from Stanford University. And the third, Professor Andre Schell from University of California, Irvine. So they're going to introduce each other as they go. And then we'll have four discussions. Uh, Professor Omar Inan from Georgia Institute of Technology, Professor Walter Bessio from University of Rhode Island, Professor Chris Roberts from University of Texas at El Paso, and Professor Satrajit Ghosh from MIT. Professor Gotsi, floor is yours. Good morning. I hope I could uh, be able to explain um, some of the um, ongoing work in our group in this area but particularly with the focus on um, this uh, neurotransmitter molecule, serotonin, uh, that I would like to talk and, and focus on today. Uh, so I'm with the University of Maryland, and I'm affiliated with Electrical and Computer Engineering Institute for Systems Research and also Official Institute for Biomedical Devices. Um, let me start, oops. Let me start the talk by um, just pointing out that there's so many um, exciting researches now surfacing that are related to gut microbiome and gut brain access that in a way is kind of uh, not only exciting but overwhelming. And this very last, the latest paper that was published last week by our colleagues at Harvard in collaboration with the uh, UIUC uh, is it actually a good one and relevant to what I want to talk about today. And it offers uh, actually human evidence supporting linkages of emotions and regulatory processes with gut microbiome. Uh, the emphasis on positive and negative emotions that are associated with a certain bacteria in the gut and, and really highlights the impact of the gut microbiome in our understanding of emotions related and the association with physical health. So on that note, um, I would like to touch upon some of the technologies that we are developing in my group to uh, particularly measure this neurotransmitter molecule that is so important in this pathway and, and doing it in an in vitro or what we call ex vivo and then ultimately and hopefully in an in vivo environment to um, generate reliable uh, data that uh, actually would be helpful for our colleagues in, in neuroscience. So that's really the focus of our work. And uh, I'm going to highlight uh, some of the lessons that we learned at the end of the talk. Um, so gut-brain gut access is, is really a bi-directional communication pathway between uh, GI tract and brain. And it's really done through this uh, molecular or molecules that are getting secreted uh, and the interactions of these molecules between enteric nervous system and central nervous systems. Uh, particularly uh, when it's functioning correctly, uh, GBA is actually highly beneficial uh, in many ways for proper immune and physiological function. But when the pathway is dysregulated in the gut, um, this can also lead to dysregulation in the brain and sometimes in neurological diseases. So, uh, you know, some of the examples that uh, are so challenging 
who not only scientists and engineers and, of course, medical doctors in the neurological disorders include depression, anxiety, stress, and so forth. The list is there. And also the GI tract disorders include uh, some of the major area, leaky gut syndrome, IBS, and IBD. So it's really a communication between these uh, two that results in some of these uh, diseases and illnesses that we have that we are facing today. Um, at the heart of this uh, are neurotransmitter molecules, as I mentioned. Uh, I'm sorry, my throat gets dry. And uh, serotonin is one of them, which is a biomarker and, and it's, it's one of the key molecules that actually um, impacts this communication pathway. Um, it triggers ENS and in a sense signals to vagus nerve and then to the brain. And um, it's fair to say that 95% um, of this um, serotonin molecules produced in the gut but there are also other sources such as neurons, immune cells, platelets, and so forth, and bacteria, of course. Um, but really, I, I think what it does is it contributes significantly to the inflammation throughout the gastrointestinal tract, and is a link to inflammatory uh, neurological conditions uh, via the gut-brain axis. So it's important to understand um, not only what this molecule is doing, but then also, can we actually measure it? Can we actually measure the concentration and see how it's behaving? So on that note, the traditional um, measurement that's done to understand you know, the concentration of this molecule of, of serotonin um, normally includes techniques such as um, HVLC and ELISA, but these techniques uh, actually cannot detect this molecule real time. And they are laborious and uh, also equally important, they lack a spatial temporal uh, resolution. So electrochemical sensing is one approach in actually trying to do this measurement real time and uh, is suitable, of course, for miniaturization. And uh, what is really important here that is low power. So there were some really good reasons for us to pick this method and to work with. And of course, there are challenges involved that includes uh, falling, um, sensitivity and selectivity. Of course, at the heart of a lot of biosensing that we work with, biocompatibility, and uh, of course, accessing to basolateral ECC region, which is really important. So here in our group, we have taken, as I said, three approaches, starting with an in vitro model, trying to understand how actually we could measure this molecule uh, in a sort of a um, you know, phantom type environment that includes transvel, and also um, attempting to measure this molecule and in real time using an animal model, in this case um, is a crayfish, and then um, also subsequently doing this in real time and ultimately doing it uh, for a human model using uh, ingestible capsules. So uh, the first approach, the transfer, uh, really includes two types of what I call interfacial sensors uh, that uh, really provides information on the dynamic of these uh, cells, the cells that they secrete, serotonin, the ECC-like cells, and then also uh, another set of sensors that will provide the information for the secretion of this molecule, how much we're actually be secreting, all done in a membrane, in a porous membrane of one diameter um, in size, and uh, trying to be able to measure the secretion of this molecule as they get uh, uh, secreted through these ECC cells into the, into the sensors that measures them at the bottom. So if you're looking, you know, if you look at the sort of a cross section of this, uh, this is what it looks like. Um, I don't know if this is gonna work. This is not working, sorry. But the platform um, actually includes, as I said, 
uh, electrochemical sensors that utilizes gold as an inert material, uh, which is biocompatible, and also uh, carbon nanotube, uh, which increases surface area binding, and it also preferentially uh, binds to these cationic idols like uh, 5-HD, and, and it has shown promise in reduced falling, which is so important in measuring this molecule. Uh, we, uh, of course, trying to do this both in a spatial and temporal manner, and, and the type of cells that you're using is listed there. Uh, but, but the whole idea here is, can we actually do this measurement as the molecule is getting secreted? If you look at uh, some of the results, we see on the left-hand side, uh, we have shown the actually detections of these molecules in a, in a flax typical environment uh, that has been stimulated by butyrate and before and after stimulation. And, and we see the actually reliable um, differences in measurement uh, before and after the stimulation. On the right-hand side, we have done the exact measurement uh, in a transwell environment that actually shows uh, that not only we can measure this, we can measure the serotonin reliably, but also uh, it shows the significant difference between uh, prior to the stimulation of the butyrate and after. Uh, and what is important here is that uh, we see that there is an increased sensitivity with longer accumulation time. Moving forward, expanding to this whole work today, more real-time measurement. Of course, from our best practices, we see that there are problems such as large footprint and non-penetrative aspect. So we work with crayfish, uh, which is actually a, is a simplified model for this type of behavioral and, and neurological measurement in collaboration with my colleague Jens Herberholz at Maryland. And, and the key features of this is to sense this in environments with biological interferences, a small sample volume, high spatial resolution, and minimally, uh, of course, invasive approach in this case. I'm not going to go through the details of this, but the method in this case is carbon fiber microelectrodes uh, that we use and we modify it with some surface coding, such as Nafion. And again, in this case, a carbon nanotube again, but um, etching the surfaces to create more surface binding, which is the key um, in this type of measurements. And, and this has shown and proved to be actually um, quite successful, um, particularly uh, with an improved sensitivity that we have achieved. And uh, if you look at some of the results again, in the left-hand side, we show um, a measurement of this, uh, of this molecule using this carbon fiber microelectrodes um, in, a, in an environment that the cells have secreted the, the molecule. And uh, so we are able to measure this um, very reliably before and after this stimulation, in this case with AITC. And uh, we have measured this in the, at the as low as 120 nanometer um, in concentration. And uh, looking at the right-hand side, um, you see that we actually segmented the, the tissue. Uh, this, is a, this is a more like a homogenized uh, crayfish tissue that we work with and we use um, the similar method and we have achieved, a, a, actually I can use the, the pointer here, a significant difference before and after again. Um, the, the secretion of the molecule. So this has shown promise that this method is actually successful. And moving forward, uh, we are um, working on actually demonstrating this in a wireless format. Um, of course, this requires more miniaturization and integrations of this component. And uh, our first attempt was to actually do this measurement um, after we actually injected the serotonin in the abdominal of the crayfish and being able to measure it uh, real time by um, scaling down and integrating the electronic components and putting it on uh, the body of the crayfish. And I was promised that this is harmless by my colleague who works on this for many years. 
but uh, looking at the right-hand side graphs, you see that we have shown uh, actually reliable measurement of this molecule and with saline as a control. And, and what is interesting about this is that we can actually repeat this uh, with the reduced pick uh, of the measurement. And that really goes back to what I was saying, which is you know, the problem with the falling. You can really do this for a longer time, but for a short time is actually very reliable. I'm coming to the end of my talk, but I'm gonna do this very quickly. Uh, we are now attempting to actually do this measurement in an ingestible capsule type format. Um, of course, initially in an in vitro fashion, and then moving on to the preclinical way. And, and we have shown a limit, limit of measurement as low as 140 nanometer, uh, which is promising. Uh, but again, this is done in, in on bench. And, and we are moving forward to actually do this in a uh, preclinical uh, environment, as I said. So just to highlight, I'm not gonna go over the points that I mentioned on the left-hand side, but the challenges here that we are facing today, you need to do this measurement um, with reduced sensitivity uh, by biofalling in a long-term uh, monitoring fashion, uh, limit of penetration of these sensors in an ex vivo tissue is a challenge that we need to uh, actually address. Uh, we need to do this for a more uh, low concentration of these molecules. And, and of course, miniaturization is an ongoing challenge that we always have to address. Um, but the point that I would like to, to make at the end is that you really actually have to do all these three methods concurrently, and you can do this sequentially. Uh, because there are informations that are surfacing from um, in vitro, from ex vivo even, and then also in the preclinical, uh, hopefully ingestible devices. And uh, so this is the sort of the scope of my program. Uh, we work on different areas that are related to ingestible devices. Uh, I'll be more than happy to talk to you about some of them. And uh, on that note, I want to uh, acknowledge my group and the funding agencies and particularly this young, uh, bright, uh, innovator uh, people who work with me, and I have the privilege uh, to, to advise them. Thank you. So now I'm introducing my colleague, Dr. Bao from Stanford, and uh, she's gonna continue the presentation. Thanks very much. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, in my group, uh, we are working on uh, trying to, uh, trained as a chemist, we are working on trying to uh, focus on the issue of making sensors uh, to be uh, more compliant and uh, more um, uh, integratable and uh, biocompatible with the human body. Uh, so this is uh, what we call skin-inspired uh, electronic sensors. And in this talk, I'm going to talk about several different kinds of uh, sensors we have been developing, including uh, physical sensors uh, that measures uh, forces uh, and temperature, uh, also electrophysiological sensors, and finally, uh, some neurochemical sensors. Uh, so what we are focusing on is trying to change the status quo of the current uh, limitations of sensors uh, that is uh, being very bulky and uh, uh, difficult to to, uh, to be uh, integrated with human body or not providing sufficient information. So what we envision uh, is uh, the sensors uh, being uh, very comfortable, invisible, imperceptible, and biocompatible and be able to measure information autonomously. Uh, so this is the uh, vision we have been working towards uh, for uh, many years, uh, basically developing electronics and sensor systems that takes the form factor of human skin and uh, basically uh, entirely based on uh, materials uh, that are soft uh, and uh, 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 and uh, intrinsically stretchable. Uh, so th these are new generation of electronics. Uh, uh, they are not yet commercially available. So it's going to uh, still take some development to, to really uh, get them to be widely spread and widely used. But I hope to convince you that uh, the effort is well worth it. 
So in terms of um, uh, examples of sensors uh, that we have been uh, working with, uh, there are several categories uh, that I um, uh, kind of outlined at the beginning. Uh, the first uh, groups of sensors are basically measuring uh, physical information. Uh, so the um, uh, pressure sensors uh, takes the form factor of uh, being flexible and stretchable and measuring uh, very fine forces uh, that can uh, differentiate the uh, basically uh, as sensitive as uh, human touch. And uh, then uh, the directional forces uh, can also be measured by incorporating bumps uh, into the um, uh, sensors, uh, string sensors uh, showing over there. And combining the um, uh, pressure and uh, string sensors can allow us to differentiate uh, the type of object uh, that we're, um, uh, the uh, sensors are in contact with, whether these are soft objects uh, or rigid objects. And then finally, uh, temperature sensors uh, here. Uh, temperature sensors are made so that they are not uh, sensitive to pressure or strain, because uh, many of the physical sensors are essentially sensitive to everything. Uh, but here is a circuit-based uh, sensor uh, that is only sensitive to the uh, change of temperature. Some of the applications are shown here. Uh, so these sensors uh, can be made into uh, arrays of large or small size. Uh, they can be made into a uh, fiber form factor uh, that are um, uh, easily implantable. And then uh, to allow them to be uh, easily uh, attached to human body, especially to have various sensors, because we don't want to have uh, many uh, bulky sensors wrapped around the body in different locations. Uh, we have been developing this, um, uh, what we call body net uh, sensor network. So basically, these sensors uh, takes the sticker format, and they have um, uh, simple sensors and circuits integrated onto them. And then uh, the uh, more bulky uh, electronics, uh, battery and the uh, wireless uh, um, uh, communication, those are all incorporated into the clothing that's uh, very close to the uh, sensor tag, uh, so that the sensors will not constrain the movement of human body and the bulky uh, um, uh, devices are being placed in place where uh, we have the uh, space. Uh, so for example, in this case, we have uh, multiple sensors uh, that are uh, sticked onto uh, the arms, uh, chest, uh, and legs. Uh, so this allows a measurement of the, um, uh, the heart rate uh, through pulse wave measurement uh, breathing rate, uh, the movement of the body, and all of these are just simple stickers. Uh, and there's a central communication Bluetooth uh, reader that's on, uh, placed on the um, uh, closing that sends information to the uh, to the cell phone. And to showcase the um, uh, such sensors uh, uh, can be also made very small and very um, compact. Uh, for uh, imp uh, implantation type of uh, measurements, uh, we made these sensors so that are uh, implanted in between the brain and the skull uh, to uh, allow monitoring of the intracranular uh, pressure. So this uh, would require still the user place uh, the reader near the, uh, the head of the mouse uh, to uh, read out the information. And then uh, the, the one on the right is uh, implanted sensor that can allow reading the um, uh, blood flow uh, in the uh, major artery. And if there is a clog in the uh, artery, then this kind of sensor can detect the change in the blood flow and be able to, um, uh, to predict the clog within uh, 20 to 30 centimeter away from the sensor. This is a recent application that where we uh, integrated uh, such uh, strain sensors uh, into uh, stretchable materials uh, that was implanted into the intestine uh, of the mouse. And the mouse is uh, allowed to be uh, freely moving. And here, the string sensor allows the detection of the motility of the intestine. Uh, and since the intestine is uh, hidden inside the body uh, and the camera is too rigid to be uh, inserted 
into the intestine and allow uh, the animal to be fr freely moving around. So this kind of sensor potentially can allow us to monitor the motility of intestine. And furthermore, we have integrated uh, uh, electrical stimulation and serotonin sensor also uh, in this kind of uh, uh, fiber. This is another example of um, uh, ultra low profile uh, skin sensors uh, that's used for tracking motion. Uh, so here, the uh, sensor is basically the, uh, the silverish um, uh, material. It's a, a gold-coated uh, silver material that's spray-coated uh, onto the um, uh, any parts of the body. So in order to determine the detailed uh, movement of all the joints, here, instead of uh, making a complex sensor array that is uh, aligned to different joints, uh, with the ultra-conformal sensor, basically there's no substrate, just pick the ink and uh, this is a biocompatible ink that's sprayed onto the uh, finger. And then we put on the um, uh, Bluetooth communication uh, tool to uh, send the information to the computer. And through a meta-learning algorithm, this allows us to be able to quickly train the algorithm uh, with just a few uh, strokes uh, of um, uh, either uh, touching the object, uh, then being able to just after um, uh, train uh, by a few touches, uh, then it's able to differentiate the shape of the object or uh, for the uh, virtual keyboard uh, by uh, again, uh, just typing a few words, uh, then it's able to, um, uh, to uh, for the computer to guess the, the words uh, that's being typed. Uh, so this could be a, a very simple system that allows uh, tracking of uh, movement uh, uh, of all different joints, leg or, or whole body movement with uh, uh, simple spray-on sensors. Moving on to uh, electrophysiological sensor, uh, the video is a little bit distorted. Uh, here we use um, uh, stretchable conducting polymer-based uh, uh, sensors to measure electrophysiological uh, information. Uh, the advantage for such material is not only being uh, flexible and stretchable, uh, but also it reduces the um, impedance uh, when in contact uh, with um, uh, tissue. This has been shown uh, by multiple groups uh, previously uh, that the impedance at the tissue interface can be lowered by several orders of magnitude compared to that of metal. So the implication is that it can lead to smaller electrode size and higher signal to noise ratio when using this kind of electrodes. Uh, so these are some uh, high resolution uh, mapping uh, that was performed uh, using a uh, stretchable uh, electrode array that we fabricated. Uh, the first one is a 64 channel uh, ECG measurement uh, directly on the heart tissue and being uh, stretchable and conformal allows the accommodation of the, uh, uh, the beating heart. And the one in the middle is high resolution EMG measurement um, uh, using stretchable arrays and finally, uh, where ongoing uh, development is a high density um, uh, EEG and also direct insertion into the brain uh, as neural probes. And the other advantage of using these electrodes is um, uh, the uh, lower voltage required for electrical stimulation because of the large capacitive uh, component in the um, electrode. Uh, here on the left uh, shows uh, comparing the uh, conducting polymer electrode stimulation and the platinum electrode stimulation. Uh, the voltage can be significantly decreased to cause the same uh, stimulation of the uh, lag movement. And now on the right is high resolution stimulation by implanting the electrode array at the brainstem region uh, where uh, individual um, uh, nerves uh, on the uh, uh, face of the uh, of the mouse uh, can be addressed whether it's the uh, whiskers uh, movement or whether it's the um, uh, facial nerve movement. One of the advantages of uh, using such a soft electrode is uh, comparing uh, these uh, um, uh, 
soft ones with low modulus and also flexible devices. So even though they are flexible, but modulus is 10 times higher, uh, you can see the, um, uh, the high modulus electrode can easily cut into the brain tissue and uh, cause damage. And another uh, potential unique opportunity with these sensors is that um, uh, the, the devices uh, can be designed uh, so that uh, they actually expand uh, with the um, uh, growing tissue and accommodate the growth of the uh, organ. Uh, finally, in terms of a neurochemical sensor, we have been developing this stretchable version uh, where uh, there are catalytic sites uh, to allow the differentiation of the um, uh, dopamine from serotonin. You can see uh, this is also electrochemical sensor, very similar to the fir uh, first one, uh, but the catalytic effect uh, allows differentiation of these peaks uh, uh, going to uh, tens of uh, nanomolar sensitivity. This is uh, an experiment we have done uh, where we uh, implanted the neurochemical sensor simultaneously uh, in the brain as well as in the intestine at the same time for a week uh, rat. And in this case, we give chocolate to the, um, uh, to the rat and able to uh, measure the dopamine level in the brain uh, while when the uh, serotonin uh, from the chocolate arrives at the intestine, we were able to um, uh, measure the intestine. Final message is that additional opportunity with uh, soft electronics is now we have the ability to build integrated circuits uh, also with um, uh, soft materials with megahertz level of uh, speed. So that means uh, the devices can now be expanded. Sensors expand to large areas, still maintain uh, high density. I see my time is off. Um, uh, this is uh, uh, the summary uh, of uh, different sensors I think uh, are uh, possible to understand a number of uh, different um, uh, behavior related uh, problems uh, that's of interest. Uh, with that, I'll just um, uh, invite the next speaker uh, to the podium to speak. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, well, still morning. Um, and uh, my name is Andrei Spiel. I will be talking about uh, inertial sensors. Um, inertial sensors uh, are used in a variety of applications. It's one of the success stories, I would say, of mean utilization. And uh, the question still remains, uh, can this sensor be used as an analytical uh, tool? And I will try to give a few examples and uh, try to outline some uh, challenges with it. I figure out how to advance. Um, all right, so let me just uh, uh, outline a few historical remarks. Uh, uh, inertial sensors never were never intended for what uh, uh, pretty much many on this uh, room are uh, using it for. Uh, it's uh, traced back to uh, some innovations in the 19th century, uh, where first was used to demonstrate that the Earth actually rotates. So Foucault used his Foucault pendulum, which was really an uh, origin for a lot of inertial sensors. And then uh, around uh, 1940, uh, people figured out, well, you can actually use it uh, for uh, guidance and control. And uh, our military fully embraced this type of uh, devices. And um, uh, and uh, it really was a re revolutionary development, uh, really not uh, intended at the time when the sensors were invented. Um, and this is really attributed to 21st uh, century. Uh, I sort of uh, was lucky uh, uh, to be right at the beginning of all these uh, great developments. Um, so we start seeing these devices in electronic systems and cameras, gaming platforms, smart and health and life um, uh, lifestyle systems. Pretty remarkable. Uh, we need to understand, however, that uh, sensors, inertial sensors, are very, very different. Uh, some are uh, small and uh, uh, very cheap. Uh, $10 for automotive applications can be 50 cents. Others are a little bit larger, uh, can be small as well, uh, and cost can be a quarter of a million dollars uh, to a million dollars per single access. So the range is huge, and uh, this is a continuous uh, trade-off uh, between size, uh, weight, and power of the sensors, and cost, of course. 
but uh, performance is also part of this metric. So the battle is how to make devices uh, low swap, C, plus a uh, high performance. So why, uh, and really what uh, made this possible is uh, is the power of the miniaturization. Uh, uh, these are the systems um, which were used um, in um, uh, a conventional Boeing 747. You can find devices of this sort, which are large, really boutique process of combining uh, individual components, uh, making systems very precise and uh, very well um, uh, performing its function of navigation. And uh, what, it, what was possible with miniaturization is, uh, uh, is uh, this extremely small, uh, complete inertial uh, measurement unit um, uh, with the feature sizes of uh, submicron. Uh, the basis uh, what uh, what made this a possibility is uh, is uh, to adapt uh, uh, semiconductor based technologies and uh, silicon is one of the first materials which was uh, used uh, for miniaturization uh, along with uh, all the infrastructure and the way these devices are made well uh, silicon is not the only technology uh, um, uh, something that I couldn't escape but include, it's uh, part of, uh, I feel, my contribution of things I've been doing, uh, is, uh, is to uh, come up with three-dimensional uh, sensors. So um, on the left, uh, you see a wine glass a fused quartz device. It's sort of, it's a golden standard what inertial sensors are. The cost of such a device is uh, $1 million per single axis. Uh, it takes three months uh, to produce a single device. It includes 96 components, which are uh, assembled by hands and literally polished by hand. Um, and uh, this has been my dream since I was an uh, undergraduate student to come up with a way of building these devices. And some you know, 20 or so years later, um, I can report that we actually figure out how to make wine glass device uh, using uh, a few squares, the same material on the wafer level. And uh, what was used there is adopting this ancient technique of glass blowing, of making devices, the temperatures of uh, 15 to 1700 degrees deep to build these devices in large quantities um, and uh, reduce the cost and increase uh, uh, performance. So it was silicon is not the point here, silicon is not the only material which is used. Uh, fused quartz uh, is uh, is a very attractive uh, is a very attractive um, option. Um, typically, in applications, even um, we use uh, we, we really can't find a single application where a single sensor uh, would be useful for the function, you know, a single accelerometer or a single gyros. So typically, it comes as uh, three accelerometers and uh, uh, three gyroscopes, and um, uh, uh, it's pretty much what is needed for any rigid object to find its position and orientation in space. In some um, uh, uh, more recent developments, uh, we started integrating magnetometers. So this is what is called nine degrees of freedom uh, system. Uh, these devices can be made uh, using a variety of different options. Uh, you can uh, build uh, the entire inertial measurement unit on a single substrate. Uh, there are trade-offs. Um, there are advantages, of course. You can make it very small, and you can use it as a patch. The disadvantage is uh, you are reducing performance of these devices, and in some applications, it will not be a um, possibility. What is more common for high-performance devices is to optimize a single-access device and then assemble them uh, by hand, typically. And this is what would make inertial navigational system. What we try to do uh, under some of the uh, programs is um, uh, combine this uh, very rigid material, such as silicon uh, or quartz, and soft materials, for example, uh, polyimide, and uh, build these devices uh, on a wafer level, uh, very uh, sort of optimizing performance of a single access device, and then uh, folding it in a 3D configuration, whether it's a pyramid or, or, uh, or uh, a square, um, and um, sort of almost like a narigami, and then fixing it, uh, uh, sort of fusing it, uh, as, and uh, pr producing them a 3D, uh, um, uh, um, 3D um, unit. Uh, you can find examples of this um, on uh, display at the Smithsonian's Design Museum. So next, I would like to give some examples where inertial sensors can be used and, um, and uh, what are the exciting opportunities and challenges as well for making devices of this sort. So one 
example has been my Saturday afternoon project for a number of years uh, is development of a vestibular prosthesis. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a balanced system function is a, is a very intriguing uh, uh, system. It uses as an input uh, information from vision, uh, from vestibular organ, from uh, hearing. And based on this information, brain integrates this information and, uh, and uh, uh, uses uh, to, for stabilization of images, for example, for posture control and, and uh, uh, special um, awareness. Uh, so there is a, uh, a need, um, a large uh, population really uh, uh, needs these devices. Uh, 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 it's, uh, it's really a part of the inner ear. It's a vestibular prosthesis. It's uh, very frequently forgotten the sixth sense that we have, the sense of balance. Uh, so what it is, is the uh, three semicircular, uh, semicircular canals, utricle and saccular. So when, there, when we rotate our hand, or when we accelerate, or when we're trying to orient, orient ourselves relative, relative to uh, gravity, uh, cupola will uh, deform and trigger chemical reactions. Chemical reaction will trigger uh, pulses, which are sent to the brain, and brain accumulates all this information. If something is wrong with either endolymph or a cupola or physical damage of the sensor, when we get older, it's also uh, declining uh, uh, this organ. Um, uh, there is a need uh, for, uh, for, to find uh, uh, a solution um, of, uh, of a prosthetic uh, device uh, to restore this function. And uh, uh, gyroscopes and accelerometers, inertial measurement units, can be used for these purposes. Uh, pretty much, uh, it will be the exact mimicking of the system would be to measure rotation and uh, to produce uh, pulses proportional to this orientation, to, uh, to angular velocity of rotation, and uh, transmit this information uh, to the vestibular nerve. Uh, so the challenges, even though uh, it's a very much uh, needed device, uh, one of the challenges is uh, to uh, to Keep in coordination the number of impulses sent to the brain and the angular velocity of rotation. Small devices, the devices would be candidates to be implemented uh, in um, instead of the inner ear. In the inner ear, uh, they drift over time. They drift over temperature. They drift over time. And over um, a period of uh, uh, use, uh, the sensor will be uh, pretty much visible. Prosthetic will not be uh, functioning as needed. What is Technology is needed, but technological challenges are still exist, and they require continuous calibration of systems of this sort. This is sort of a complicated slide. I'm not going to go over this. It, horizontal uh, is averaging time. Versal, vertical is LN deviation. Is, it's explaining uh, different trade-offs in, in, um, in uh, noise uh, mechanisms. Uh, the point here is that uh, the minimum detectable signal uh, human uh, vestibular system can detect is 0 0.5 degrees per second. Uh, if our threshold of detection is 5 degrees per second, it's only 10 times um, uh, uh, um, uh, lower, uh, is, is a dysfunction. Pretty much we lose uh, the ability to stabilize images. So from the performance point of view, we can reach this level of performance. The challenge uh, is, uh, is um, um, ability to calibrate the sensor so that the sensor data is uh, actually uh, useful. Uh, human motion is another uh, good example of what can be done. I will um, uh, show how this uh, type of um, modality uh, can be used. Um, and um, um, uh, when we, uh, for navigation, um, you can place sensors in uh, any different part of uh, bodies, but uh, food is a preferable uh, method for uh, precision uh, navigation. When we walk, our foot touches the ground, it goes through zero velocity event. And this is what is used uh, as a concept for zero velocity update algorithm, where uh, it's, a, it's a combination of uh, prediction coming from strap down inertial navigational system and updates coming from the stance phase detection. And uh, uh, remarkably, uh, this type of solution allows to um, achieve a very good performance. Uh, this gizmo, I call it uh, lab on shoe. Um, and uh, this is basically an illustration how complicated uh, is uh, to make um, a navigational uh, solution. Um, uh, it's not sufficient just to use uh, uh, inertial sensors. It's much more complicated. Uh, and uh, um, uh, this is what um, we use and uh, miniaturized over time, going from lap on shoe to sugar cube platform to uh, ultimate navigation uh, chip, which integrates multiple uh, modalities. 
And uh, so in uh, sensing human, there are a number of challenges. Um, our different parts of the body go through different accelerations um, from um, uh, 4G uh, to 6G to 15G to 40G when it's on a foot, which makes uh, development of such sensors a complicated, uh, a very complicated um, uh, option, even though um, uh, there are algorithmic solutions which are um, attractive. Um, so uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, another few examples, my colleague Parokayazi uh, uh, sends this uh, to illustrate that um, uh, other uses of sensors uh, can be used for, uh, for example, for asthma detection and uh, uh, um, uh, to detect the um, uh, uh, lung um, um, uh, response um, and predict uh, uh, asthma and, uh, uh, and monitor the disease. Uh, by uh, creating sensors uh, beyond what is available on the market, one can um, actually um, uh, do better than a digital um, uh, state of that telescope. Um, one can also use uh, sensors for um, for monitoring uh, uh, heart, basically by placing in close um, uh, proximity uh, to, to the chest uh, by uh, detecting a linear acceleration and angular velocity. One can assess not just electrical um, electrical signals coming from the heart, but also um, uh, the mechanical response of the system. Uh, each of these um, modalities uh, do require sensors, uh, very special uh, type of uh, uh, sensors uh, um, specifically designed for the purpose. So uh, just uh, uh, to uh, uh, summarize, uh, it's been um, a truly revolutionary development in, in miniaturization of inertial sensors. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great story. Um, in inertial sensors and the performance are uh, uh, beating uh, more slow. Uh, there is need uh, for, uh, it's not uh, there yet, low swap and performance, and um, uh, there is a, a path forward with probably application of specific uh, uh, sensors and uh, huge uh, importance of sensor fusion al and algorithmic layer. And um, inertial sensors has, uh, uh, as an analytical tool is something that will be uh, coming up as uh, the performance of such sensors is increasing. I would like to acknowledge a number of uh, funding agencies for this and the group was uh, doing for this. Um, and now I would like to invite all the presenters and discuss. And... Thank you very much. And uh, please make sure to talk into the microphone and to press the button when you wish to speak. Um, so three of our discussions you, you'll recognize from previous discussion. And we have a, a newcomer. <laughs> Professor Satrajit Ghosh from MIT. So I would like him to ask the first question. Is this being? Okay, I think people are here. Fantastic set of talks uh, and introduces us to a whole world of sensors. So I heard molecular to start with, going through physical, neurophysiological, neurochemical, and then inertial uh, across the talks. One of the questions I had, and any one of you can pick this up, this is kind of a general question. Uh, all of us would like all of these things, right, simultaneously. What do you think are the biggest challenges and where do you think are the biggest opportunities in integrating some of these sensors so that we can get more multimodal things happening simultaneously? Can you hear me? Okay, so very good question. And, and I think um, I want to emphasize what I hopefully try to do during my presentation. Uh, there are so many challenges with each module that one needs to improve and optimize for the data to become actually um, validated by clinicians and, and neuroscientists that they need to use and analyze that it's absolutely important that we gain that confidence from that at that modular level with one sensor before moving on to the multi-sensors. But, but I think it doesn't mean that we can do the multi-sensors. I think we should, and, and I think Roger was right. We, it's, it's the key to a lot of the information that we need to, to gain. But uh, what I'm trying to emphasize here is like, for instance, in the case of God, like Bao also showed uh, my colleague, from Stanford, um, you you really need to gain that confidence that you could you know your your modular sensor is working both in vitro as well as in vivo, 
And then the limitations could be anything from miniaturizations to power to transmissions to um, signal to noise ratios, you know, selectivity, sensitivity, all these issues are all there and, and they vary from one sensor to another. So I don't know if I give you a concrete response, but I just listed some of the challenges. Yes, uh, I, complete, I completely agree that first, uh, individual sensors uh, need to be reliable and have very low drift uh, and uh, reproducible. And then um, uh, depending on the applications, uh, I guess uh, we, we do both the sensor development as well as uh, trying to, to look at what applications are most suited for our sensors. And we find that um, it really, the sensors really have to be designed uh, based on the intended application. Because once we know the application, the design, the form factor, and also the sensor signal output, everything need to be um, uh, adjusted to meet the requirement for integration. And then finally, even though you see John show so many of the wearables that look simple, but it's actually really challenging uh, from engineering point of view to, um, uh, uh, to, to integrate everything, uh, especially to make them uh, to have wireless communication and data processing, everything all integrated together. Uh, so I, I would say there are a lot of challenges for specific design related to the app specific application as well as the um, uh, integration. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question should be asked by Dr. Eden from Georgia Tech. Thank you. Uh, I agree that we, we saw uh, so many excellent talks again and um, uh, again, hopefully you guys can hear me. Sorry, I had to switch the headset so I could hear you. Um, I think one of my questions is that, you know, I guess in the translational spectrum, especially for the sort of topic we're talking about today, where we're talking about really, you know, brain and behavior um, sensing, or maybe behavioral sensing of brain responses. I mean, how how close, I guess, are we to seeing some more, uh, there's been a lot of exciting stuff happening in wearables and in sensors overall over the past maybe 40, 50 years, right? Maybe more. Uh, I thought the IMU talk, the inertial measures talk was excellent in highlighting that. Um, some of these have translated to clinical use. Many of them have not, right? And many of them, even for sort of physiology studies, people are using the same kind of ECG accelerometry, if that sort of sensing. Uh, what What's the big gap, I guess? Is it a technology gap? Is it that, you know, and this is, of course, one of the reasons why we have this workshop in the first place, but what is the big gap that needs to be addressed to see more of these, you know, beautiful sensors with incredible, you know, results translating into a commercial domain and into uh, the clinical domain, ultimately? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, uh, let me uh, uh, take a slam at this um, question. Um, let me stay for a second in inertial sensors domain. Um, um, it takes to develop a good inertial sensor takes at, at, uh, ten million dollars per year for ten years. This is how long it takes to develop a single sensor, um, and. Um, uh, so, and uh, the reason what, what is happening, uh, they, uh, suddenly uh, this low cost sensors uh, were available on the market. And the community, you know, uh, um, whatever they have access to, they, uh, they got access to and uh, they start using collecting data. And, um, and I think uh, uh, it will take a while until the community will reach a level of maturity to understand that the data maybe they're getting is not uh, of high quality. And they will start formulating what is really high quality data, what is the bandwidth requirement, what is the drift requirements, what is the shock requirement, what is the dynamic range, full scale range, and so on. And then uh, we will be able to uh, formulate what are the application specific uh, uh, sensors that need to be developed. But it doesn't mean we need to wait for the sensors uh, that will be able to do this. I think the approach which works 
perfectly well is uh, keep increasing uh, performance of the sensors and in parallel use whatever five ten dollar sensors on the market and try to look how to interface uh, how to uh, extract data maybe perhaps exercise learning algorithms these days everything tastes better with a little bit of sprinkle of machine learning right. uh, and so basically it's it's good it's good uh, for the community to get uh, kind of doing this keeping in mind yeah. that all the sensors at some point uh, uh, having very close look on whether this is exactly what you need for the application yeah. to take a very serious look into this yeah maybe one more answer and we have to move on. yeah, yeah. I, I think there's uh, the funding gap uh, the um, uh, sensors uh, for many sensors, I think they are ready, but there needs to be a big market for uh, investors to want to put in money to commercialize it. And uh, then for research usage, it's just not enough uh, market uh, for, for funding to support the commercialization. Even for blood pressure monitoring, uh, we have a spin-off company for uh, continuous blood pressure monitoring. Uh, but then uh, we already get to the FDA right now, but still uh, the um, uh, the funding from uh, for medical devices uh, it's just a much uh, much lower level of funding and also valuation is low, so it's difficult yeah. for commercialization. Absolutely. I can you hear me? Yes, um, I think I fully agree with you. But there's one point I also want to emphasize, which is you know, you alluded to, Andre. Um, the, the whole demographic of the sensors and MEMS devices and communities change compared to what it was in early days. We no longer focusing on just developing one singular module. We actually now emphasizing hybrid fabrication, hybrid integration, and 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 that is becoming more of a norm. So that's why it's so important for us to work with neuroscientists, with clinicians. Uh, with folks who can actually guide us. Some of the work that I show today are the simplest sensors I've ever developed in my career. But the measurements, the characterization, the actual testing of these sensors are really challenging. And this is why we need the neuroscientists and clinicians to guide us. And of course, the presence of FDA, the communications with FDA in terms of going toward translational work and something that is useful for, for society. Very much. Professor Bestia. Excellent talks. What I'm curious <clears throat> is the time scale that you believe is necessary for your devices to be used for either diagnosis or monitoring and what it's going to take to get them to that point. The limit to one answer. Answer will depend probably on the uh, type of applications. Uh, I would say for some applications, uh, it is, uh, for example, for um, uh, uh, monitoring of uh, uh, human gait, uh, adjustment of uh, prosthetic devices, uh, this type of applications, I think we are ready. Uh, we are ready to deploy this type of um, applications uh, for vestibular prosthesis devices. I don't know; it's uh, uh, it's a long horizon um, uh, for um, um, uh, use of uh, sensors to collect. Uh, to, um, to to measure uh, response uh, uh, from us uh, of uh, acoustic waves uh, instead of from microphones instead of microphones use accelerometers from a skull it's already happening in in uh, um, in uh, in the um, uh, stories uh, uh, ray band um, glasses so basically uh, things are happening and uh, depending on the technology it will be probably happening uh, uh, as uh, in sort of uh, uh, in parallel. Uh, also, the choice of material is really important for sensing, and that we need um, the material scientists and chemists to work with us uh, because we know how to develop the devices. Uh, but the starting point is always is the, is the starting material and how that material gets integrated, whether we do it in a hybrid fashion or some other format. So I just want to emphasize the role of material is really important. Yeah, uh, I divide, oh, sure. 
I divided the sensors into three categories. Uh, and I think the physical sensors are the most near term. Uh, and then the electrophysiological sensors are midterm. And then finally, the uh, neurochemical, uh, especially implantable ones are the longest term because of the material. Uh, compatibility needs to to be evaluated over long time, uh, but in animal models uh, they are all ready to be uh, studied. Mm -hmm. Professor Roberts, uh, thank you. So uh, in Dr. Skell's talk, I was struck by the, the different grades of inertial sensors, and I think engineers are often uh, driven by a roadmap of performance specs. Um, as you're all experts working in the area, do you feel there could be stronger end user driven kind of roadmaps and specifications that engineers could be targeting for? So if the users lay out, they want, you know, clinical grade, et cetera, would that help drive the research in a direction that would be useful? Yes, this is an excellent uh, question. And I think whatever we develop uh, need to be driven by the need, uh, by the application. Uh, so military, for example, has its own roadmap for this type of sensors. Um, consumer electronics has its own uh, map. Uh, what was, for example, what is good for a cell phone to, to track orientation or uh, do, uh, to do games uh, uh, is not uh, good enough uh, for, for example, for uh, virtual reality, for uh, mapping, for merging virtual reality, and, for example, and uh, physical world. Uh, so uh, we start seeing uh, uh, roadmaps uh, coming uh, from um, from uh, from applications uh, that are uh, driving the driving uh, uh, developments, and I think uh, um, uh, this is exactly what uh, need to be done um, within this community. Uh, it need to start with a, a roadmap of uh, performances that are needed to solve certain problems, and problems could be very different whether it's, uh, I don't know, it could be very different. I highlighted some of them. And then uh, this will be the basis uh, for the community to solve uh, these problems. And this is how I see the most effective way to do this. Thank you. Uh, now we are going to take one or two online questions that have arrived. So um, the first question is, could, you know, could the panel discuss the major challenge of sensor durability and fouling observed when used in vivo. I couldn't hear just a second. Can you repeat it again, please? Uh, panelists have not heard your question. Sure. Um, could the panelists discuss the major challenge of sensor durability and fouling observed when used in vivo? I'd like to take it. Uh, in the case of uh, neurochemical sensors, uh, uh, we did similar thing as um, uh, as your case. Uh, we coded uh, uh, the sensors with the nephia coding on the surface. Uh, uh, the longest we have monitored was 16 weeks uh, for dopamine sensing in vivo in the um, uh, uh, in the mouse brain, and uh, we saw similar level of. Uh, um, uh, of uh, uh, concentration we were able to measure uh, using optogenetic stimulation to control the amount of uh, dopamine generation, uh, but we haven't yet done longer term implantation measurement. If time maybe for one more online question. Yes, that would be great. So this question is for Dr. Bao. Um, is it possible to get microphone from soft bioelectronics um, is that what the distributed pressure sensors are essentially picking up on when measuring gut motility? Uh, uh, can you repeat the question? Sorry. Is it possible to get microphone from soft electronics? Oh, uh, microphone. Uh, well, I think it's possible if one makes uh, suspended uh, structures. Uh, we haven't looked into it. Okay, and now we are going to go to questions from the floor. So please introduce yourself and ask your question. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Ruth Bejafari from Texas a and um, So we all do sensor development with the intention of translation of these technologies. At the end of the day, they have to impact lives. Um, you all being at the forefront of this and understanding also the TRL level and uh, considering it builds actually on the question that Omar asked earlier, considering NIH 
how they have been supportive of our work and they move forward with this mentality of investigator-driven research, peer-reviewed research. What can NIH do to close the gap before we get to industry? Industry is gonna spend on it when there is a clear market. But what we need to do, in my opinion, is somehow get our sensors to the hands of health science researchers, physician scientists. They can smell it, touch it, play with it, build their own hypothesis. What can NIH do to support us? I can, I can maybe start with that. Uh, I feel very passionately about this, and, and you ask it really the, the right question. In fact, I brought it up with one of the organizers earlier. I wish that this is not the only meeting we have at NIH on this topic. I hope that it will continue, and, and it would be a continuity in, in some of these discussions. I believe last time it was on neuroscience part of this. This time is on sensors. We need to create a community that we can actually uh, interact more, and and this is this is the start of that. So I'm I'm very you know inspired, but then we also need to get those who do the translational aspect of this, the FDA involved, and and to be part of this discussion. So I guess in a nutshell, what I'm trying to say here is that we need to continue in this movement, and hopefully some of the questions that are asked today. And the points that we're going to continue discussing throughout this meeting will become new calls uh, for us investigators to actually, you know, address and get inspired by those challenges. Um, but but I think it really needs to have a level of continuity. Can I build up on this? Um, uh, in my opinion, uh, money cannot solve problems. Uh, people solve problems. So if the community is not conditioned to solve a problem. If the if community is not on the same page, what needs to be done, no money can solve the problem. So um, uh, meetings like this and uh, whatever building the community of people, um, a very multidisciplinary community uh, is super critical. So when the community is ready, uh, money will be very well used. Otherwise, it will be sort of uh, will get dissolved, likely uh, with uh, with minimal impact. I think uh, this combination of building the community and uh, and uh, identifying these uh, moments when the community is ready to take the money. I think this is what uh, uh, kind of critical part. Uh I, I think the need is really clear. That is, uh, uh, having integrated uh, multi-sensing uh, systems uh, uh, and and can have uh, uh, them even work on human. And uh, really, I think uh, the support to, to get these type of systems built and also get them to the hands of clinicians, I think that's a critical need. Absolutely. And, and I want to end this by... Uh, just emphasizing is something that I'm experiencing in my group. Uh, these types of problems also inspire different diverse group of people uh, to, to work on it. I mean, now my projects are more attractive to uh, female students and because they see the cause and as well as those who are actually facing those problems. Uh, so um, I think diversity is also one of the advantages that come as a result of this. I think uh, you'll attract more of different groups of people working together. So I just wanted to touch upon that. So we ran out of time. I'm sorry to have to ask it offline. So that concludes our session one. Thank you very much for all our wonderful presenters and uh, discussion. I want to welcome everybody back from lunch. Um, and welcome me back to session two, which is multi-sensor integration for tracking movement considerations for comparative and developmental studies. Our moderator is Yuan Lu, and I just wanted to say a couple of statements about her. Um, she's a program director of the clinical interventions and diagnostics branch in the division of neuroscience at the National Institutes of Aging, where she oversees the division's technology portfolio such as using technology for early detection, monitoring, and interventions for the aging brain, um, mild cognitive impairment, uh, Alzheimer's disease, and other dementias. Uh, Dr. Lau also oversees some of the branches, um, portfolios, and initi initiatives, programs and initiatives on plasma biomarkers and digital technologies. And with that, I'll welcome um, you on up to the podium. Thank you. Good afternoon. 
we have heard so many great talks this morning about individual uh, sensors for use in the babies in the ICU and also to detect neurotransmitters uh, to be used for detecting pain level and stress level. Um, there's so great talks. And one of the last, talk, last question for discussion was about uh, how to integrate these uh, sensors. And that's a perfect question to lead to the session two. Session two will hear about integrating of multi-sensor data uh, to track, tracking the behaviors such as movement and cognition and so on across the lifespan. We'll hear something about uh, in infants' use development in the stage, also the real uh, life in the uh, aging population for neurodegenerative diseases. We have five speakers, five exciting talks. I will introduce first one is uh, Dr. Beth Smith from Children's Hospital Los Angeles. And the second one is uh, Dr. Wukuhan Guler from Worcester Polytechnic Institute. And then followed by Dr. Uh, Ashkan Vizira, who is an academic spin-off uh, uh, company called Biosentics. And then followed by Dr. Thurman uh, Lockett from Arizona State University. And then finally, Jeff K, who is a neurologist, will talk about how to, uh, he uses these sensors, multi-sensors in the aging population. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm so happy to be here today to get to be a part of these interesting and important discussions. So I'm going to um, briefly talk about what we do and why we do it in my lab. I'm mostly going to talk about how we do it and focus on the challenges for using sensors to analyze infant motor behavior across days in the natural environment. So I wanna start by thanking the participants, partners, lab members, funding sources, and I also want to thank Jerry Loeb at USC for his um, comments on this talk. So just to start with a brief bit of conceptual framework, uh, this is the brain behavior link, which is part of the reason we're here today. So we know that movement experience influences plasticity of the developing nervous system. We also know that as the nervous system develops and changes, the movements that babies make as outputs change. What we don't know in regard to movement is what, how much, and when. And by this, I mean our, our research questions in my lab are guided by looking at movement as an input to the developing central nervous system. So what, how much, and when practice is necessary to learn to sit, to reach, to crawl. We also look at movement as an output of the developing central nervous system. And the questions here are focused on what type of movement, how much, and when uh, is representative of early identification of atypical development. So just as a brief example, I wanna make two points about how sensors can be useful in this regard. So the first, as you see, you see on the screen, this is an example from the Alberta Infant Motor Scale. This is a commonly used clinical assessment from birth to walking onset. You assess the infant in different positions. They basically get a point for each of the items they're able to do. You can get a total score of 58. So some of the limitations, this is a subjective scale. It is a snapshot of the infant at one point in time, and is, we're not capturing their full repertoire of movement, and it's an ordinal scale. The other point I wanna make is that typical development is highly variable in course and rate. So a score of 15 on the Alberta Infant Motor Scale, 5% of infants can get a score of 15 at three months of age, and 90% of infants can get a score of 15 at five and a half months of age. That's a really large range, and um, makes it difficult to identify atypical. So sensors, of course, can provide us with objective data, quantitative data, and we can capture and measure data across days and weeks. And you know, this way we can actually finally measure variability and define you know, what is the state space of typical development. I'm gonna give you an example now. Uh, you can see on the screen, two examples of movement data, full day movement data. Um, you see on the left, an example from a 12 month old child with typical development. On the right, a 15 month old child with developmental delay. And each figure contains on the x-axis hours of data. So these are 12 to 14 hours of data. 
And the data that you see are each child wore a wearable sensor, one on each ankle across the full day. So we are collecting triaxial acceleration and gyroscope data at 20 samples per second. And the sensors are actively synchronized to one another during the recording period. So just looking at this, um, you can see the this is the resultant acceleration for the right leg in red and the left leg in blue. Just visually looking at it, it's pretty clear that the 15-month-old child is making a lot less movement than the child with typical development. But how do we actually quantify this? So the way we approach this is with a threshold-based algorithm. So we have video as our gold standard, and we uh, calculated the resultant of the triaxial acceleration and gyroscope signals, and then detrend the data. So what you see in this figure, um, we have our acceleration signal in blue, and we have our angular velocity signal in black. Both of those, again, are the resultant. And the um, black dotted lines are the acceleration thresholds. There's one above and below zero. And then what you don't see is the angular velocity threshold, but there is one there. This is five seconds of data. And as you go across, uh, you can see there's a pink elevated stick there that indicates when a leg movement was counted. So the basic, to, to sort of summarize the algorithm, the acceleration signal has to cross the upper threshold, the lower threshold, and cross the baseline twice. And there has to be angular velocity present. And if all of those conditions are met, then we've identified that a leg movement happened. So each time the leg pauses or changes direction, um, then it's counted as a new movement. But one of the challenges to this, of course, for infants is externally applied um, movement. So what you see in the picture, there is a four-month-old infant wearing sensors, one on each ankle, and then on her right is a doll who is also wearing sensors on each ankle. And we collected data for a full day um, and basically, it was a good friend of mine, and for a full day, everything she did with her baby, I did with the doll. So the doll was moving around in similar ways to the infant. And the infant moved each leg around 7,000 times during the day. The doll moved her legs around 1,000 times each day, which, of course, is not possible with the way this um, doll is, you know, she was not moving her legs. So our estimate was that about 15% of what we count as infant-generated leg movements are actually coming from background motion. So one of the things, because we're using both the acceleration and the gyroscope signal, the gyroscope signal does help to essentially filter out some of this noise because things like riding in a car or a stroller that have acceleration components only, if the baby's not moving, get filtered out. So one complication is mechanical swings. So they're often below our thresholds, but not always. So it depends on the power of the swing, different brands. But here you can see an example uh, this is acceleration, um, right and left leg are the yellow and blue signals, and then the gyroscope resultant are the uh, red and purple signals. This is an example, and then the thresholds where a mechanical swing was going above our thresholds and being counted as leg movements of the baby. So one way that we can solve this problem would be, of course, to identify the unique patterns of movement and to remove them from the signal but that's a lot of work. You have to have multiple infant caregiver pairs. Not everybody moves their baby in the same way, different swings, different devices. You know, there's, it's, it's, it would be a lot of work. The way we've operationally solved it is by removing periods of data where there are more than 40 consecutive leg movements with less than 0.2 seconds between them. So when we see highly synchronized patterns like this in the data, we know that those are not human infant produced movements. So once we have this definition, we essentially have the start and the stop of the arm movement, uh, leg movement or arm movement. So in this example, you see a infant wearing a sensor on each wrist. And once we identify the start and stop, we can then calculate the duration, the average acceleration, the peak acceleration, and the type of movement. The type of movement being, is it unilateral, meaning just one limb is moving, or is it bilateral, meaning both limbs are moving? And that is, again, because the sensors we were using were actively synchronized to one another, which I'll come back to in a moment. So um, briefly, uh, we were, I'm not getting into the results today, but one of the results we found was that full day sensor data were able to distinguish typical from atypical development, while five minutes of data were not. And this is just speaking a little bit to the uh, noise, um, signal to noise ratio in the data. 
And once you calculate, once you identify the start and stop of a movement, there are, of course, many metrics that are possible. We can calculate sample entropy complexity to start analyzing patterns of movement. So now into the challenges. Ideally, since we're using the resultant, in my mind, that the, the analysis should be sensor agnostic, right? There are a lot of sensors that can, that can collect trioxial accelerometer and gyroscope data. So other than having to adjust for sample rate, we should be able to use any of them. But there's a number of things to consider. So gain, offset, drift, noise, resolution, sampling rate, synchronization, and then of course, even the weight and shape of the sensor. So I'm going to focus briefly on synchronization and also on offset. So this example is two synchronized sensors. We collected 10 hours of data at a sampling rate of 20, and these, these data were used to validate our algorithm. Then we chose a different um, sensor that are not synchronized. We collected 72 hours of data, sampling rate of 25. And both of them have similar ranges for their acceleration and gyroscope signal. So we downsampled 25 to 20 to match, calculate the resultant, detrend. We should have the same signal. Uh, turns out we don't exactly. So one of the problems is the synchronization. So unsynchronized sensors are off from each other in time by about one to two seconds after 72 hours of data collection. So this did not surprise me. I anticipated this. The solution is that we need to remove the type of movement. We can no longer talk about what's the right arm doing when the left arm is moving uh, because you know one to two seconds is critical for that relationship. Um, I also can tell you that I have been asked to review papers where people are unaware of this problem and they're collecting sensor data across many, many days and attempting, because they have timestamps on the two sensors, thinking that they're aligned and they can do these types of calculations when in fact those are unvalidated uh, data. So the other problem we ran into is that the offset differs by sensor and by axis for the sensors that we used for the 72 hours. So in the top, you can see uh, a short period where the x-axis is aligned with gravity, then the y-axis, and then the z-axis. And we get slightly different values for those sensors. This becomes a problem when we then calculate the resultant. And you can see in the bottom on the uh, right, the angular velocity resultant is in blue. The acceleration resultant is in red. And this is a particularly bad example. But you can see that that baseline is drifting up and down. And for our movement counting when the resultant goes above and below uh, threshold, our movement counting is impacted by this difference. So we can adjust for this by calibrating for each sensor, having a calibration file specific to each sensor. Um, but again, this was something that I did not anticipate. So just to briefly touch on, there are a number of infant-specific challenges for sensors, so validation of, of metrics. So we need to validate for infants versus ambulatory children and adults. Babies move very differently. I've also reviewed a number of papers where people are interested in, say, activity count as a measure of intensity of physical activity. So, and they say, well, you know, there are no cut points for babies, so we've applied the cut points for toddlers. And again, that's unvalidated and, it, you know, is not um, not workable. The other thing to consider, and this has to do with monitored versus unmonitored data collections, if you're in a hospital setting somewhere where the baby's being monitored, you can have very small sensors. However, we're putting sensors on infants all day in the natural environment, so we need to have things that are larger than a choking hazard. So we have artificially enlarged some of our sensors with a casing uh, so that we are making them large enough. So validation of metrics, these are just general things that you'll hear more about them. Uh, sensor data are generally easy to collect, but difficult to analyze. Caregiver burden, if people have to charge devices, place them correctly, start or stop them. They need um, a logging device nearby to communicate with the sensors, Wi-Fi access. These are all challenges and burdens for collecting data. There's a difference in privacy if the data are stored on the sensor versus passing through a cloud. Battery life is an issue, and then different data formats. Um, every sensor has a different data format, so this is a problem for coding. Your code has to be adjusted to find where are my accelerometer data in this file. So some of the next steps uh, create norms, focusing on diversity, equity, inclusion, which I'll come back to briefly in a moment. But we need to decide what are our useful metrics, optimize the analyses, be able to predict different diagnoses and outcomes for children, 
accuracy, sensitivity to change, affordable user-friendly systems implementation, and then just because, again, the focus of meeting integrating multiple data sources. So you can see the infant with the EEG cap. That's another tool that we use in my lab that I'm not talking about today. And just to finish, I just want to briefly mention uh, the Healthy Brain and Child Development Study. So that is, um, I'm we at CHLA are one of the sites involved. So we will be collecting data from a truly representative U.S. sample, 7,500 infant mother diets across the U.S. And the research question is, how is development affected by exposure to substances and other environmental, social, and biological factors during pregnancy and after birth? So this study is actually, we, wearable sensors are one of the measures, and we will be able to create a true normative database for these data. So thank you, and I'm going to pass it along to our next speaker. Good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be here today. Um, and I will talk uh, about emerging non-invasive blood gas variables. And I'll try to make a showcase through quantifying the adverse effect of hypoxia on cognitive development in early childhood. Right? So, so to be able to do this, I'll start with a discussion in the medical literature. Uh, this study published in Pediatrics in 2004 by a group of researchers from various universities and hospitals, including Harvard Medical School, Tokyo Women's Medical University, and so on. The objective or objectives of this study uh, were first to analyze the impact of chronic and intermittent hypoxia on cognitive outlier, uh, uh, outcomes during childhood and to assess the significance of various factors such as intensity and age of exposure to hypoxia. Almost 800 articles uh, published before 2004 uh, were screened. I'll try to use were screened. Uh, direct and indirect evidence criteria were developed and uh, 55 uh, articles met the criteria for uh, direct evidence while uh, 19 articles meet, uh, met the criteria for indirect evidence. So 78% of the articles that met direct evidence criteria refer, reported an adverse effect, and 84% of control studies reported an adverse effect. Uh, moreover, the studies were classified under five clinical categories, congenital heart disease and sleep disorder breathing, a full field evidence uh, full field evidence based, based pediatrics and child health criteria. So uh, here are two tables from this study. I wanted to emphasize the p-values that show the statical, statistical significance. And this is a table for CHD, and the next table is for SDB. So for all those reasons, Hypoxic infants are put on, on an oxygen supply. However, since excessive oxygen causes tissue injury and premature infants are particularly sensitive to the toxic effects of oxygen, uh, strategies should be developed to minimize the tissue injuries. And I think a miniaturized blood gas variable can, uh, which can continuously monitor blood oxygen uh, can probably help uh, to precisely regulate the oxygen levels uh, in infants. Since oxygenation is a critical, very critical parameter for infants, uh, we should take a close look into the oxygenation parameters. So the gold standard for measuring um, blood gases is arterial blood gas analysis. Um, it measures arterial saturation of oxygen SAO2 and also arterial saturation, uh, arterial partial pressure of oxygen. Uh, the transcutaneous oxygen, uh, partial pressure of oxygen is a direct surrogate method for PaO2 and peripheral oxygen saturation, SpO2, is a direct surrogate method for SAO2, usually measured with a PPG sensor. Due to how easy it became to use a PPG sensor in 19, uh, SpO2 became an indirect surrogate measurement for PaO2. 
The pictures on the right are the clinical instruments for measuring these parameters separately. There exist a miniaturized variable SpO2 sensor, but no transcontinuous oxygen sensor available yet. The translation uh, between SpO2 and PaO2 is done through this dissociation curve. SpO2 becoming an indirect surrogate measure for PaO2 is problematic for several very important medical reasons. First of all, these two parameters are different parameters. SpO2 gives the information of how much oxygen is loaded on hemoglobin, so the fraction of loaded hemoglobin uh, to total hemoglobin. PaO2 gives the information of dissolved oxygen molecules in plasma, which are ready to be used in the tissue or organs. Second, this is not a linear curve. At high oxygen levels, SpO2 curve will saturate to 100, around 80, 90 millimeter mercury. And after that point, it will not reflect any changes in PaO2. Third, there is a risk for hyperoxia, too much of oxygen, particularly for infants, which is impossible to detect reliably with a PPG sensor. The other risk is accurately identifying the hypoxia cutoffs too little oxygen cutoffs, because several factors such as blood pH, hemoglobin type, and temperature shift this dissociation curve right and left. An important thing to note is the replacement of adult hemoglobins with fetal hemoglobin in early childhood, which also shifts this curve significantly. On top of this, SpO2 has some limitations, such as discrepancies come with skin color differences and hemoglobin cards. In short, PPG sensor can be small, non-invasive, wireless, and we can extra extract oxygen saturation information nice and easy, but that's not enough to assess oxygenation. In this last part of my presentation, I will showcase a few selected emerging blood gas monitors. Transcontinuous oxygen sensor using luminescent sensing film can provide uh, accurate blast gas information in a non-invasive fashion complementary to pass oximeters. The luminescent sensing fin, uh, which consists of functional groups whose fluorescence is changed or suppressed in the presence of oxygen. And the sensor measures diffusing oxygen from capillaries through the skin. Uh, here is a quick rundown on the basis of luminescent oxygen sensing, and I'm not going to go into details too much, but when a luminescent material is um, exposed to a higher energy wavelength, uh, it can emit a photon at a lower energy wavelength. This is called stock shift, and the dynamics of this uh, process is described by Stan Volman equation, which shows the intensity and decay time of the emission is, are is inversely proportional to the oxygen co concentration. In our recent prototype, we use a lifetime-based luminescent sensing technique as it is more immune to optical pack changes, which actually indicates time-based measurements will be less vulnerable to motion artifacts and skin color differences. We closely collaborate with analog devices on this project and they offer us using the specialized component ADP to 4,000 series for luminescent sensing. And our aim was to perform human tests with this time-based measurements. So we conducted uh, several, type, uh, several human tests with this prototype. The first two experiments, uh, in the first two experiments, we use occlusion technique. So the fingertip was placed on the pin located underneath the sensor. Uh, and then there is a, uh, there is a short period of time uh, to allow the partial pressure of oxygen fin come into equilibrium with the oxygen in the tissue. To create a change in the partial pressure of oxygen in the first example, we apply occlusion with a ribbon or other hand. As a result, we see the oxygen changes during the occlusion period. In another test, we placed the prototype on the forearm and we applied occlusion with a pressure cuff which was inflated to 180 millimeter marker to incur arterial occlusion. After two minutes of occlusion, the pressure was released and PTCO2 value was measured in the rest as blood flow, blood flow restored. Besides this, we employed an altitude generator to create a uh, hypoxic environment through a face mask as in the high altitudes. So we gradually reduced the oxygen amount 
in the air breathed by the subject and the measured PTCO2 values from the fingertip. The benchmark table compares our oxygen prototype with the available ones in the literature. There aren't many players actually on the field. So the first prototype are our earlier prototypes. The third one is an invasive uh, oxygen monitor for deep tissue monitoring. The fourth one is a PPG sensor for SpO2 measurements since it presented some device parameters I wanted to include uh, for, for a comparison. And the fifth one is only a sensor, no prototyping was presented. And with our latest prototype, we successfully presented the human subject test under various scenarios uh, by using this lifetime-based method uh, in the prototype. I also want to briefly introduce some details about the second reference, uh, which is our prototype. Um, so in this prototype, uh, we develop actually an algorithm to calculate the decay type of the luminescence. In the algorithm, only three data points will be enough uh, to extract the lifetime. So we don't need to construct the whole curve. Uh, so we, we just design a specialized custom integrated circuit uh, to significantly reduce the data points required to calculate one oxygen value. Uh, data point with this with this prototype actually the transmitted data size is reduced significantly uh, which saves power and also area as well so this is the micrograph of the chip and evolution board for the test uh, the measurements proved uh, the operation of the algorithm by extracting three data points the lifetime of the luminescence is calculated on board and we perform a gas chamber test to quantify the partial pressure of oxygen versus lifetime measurements. We also tested the linearity of the outputs. With that, I'm concluding our transcontinuous oxygen work, and I will introduce some of our efforts on transcontinuous carbon dioxide sensing, because which is also a critical blood gas parameter. And yes, we are measuring light for the sensor as well, but the sensing material and its properties are totally different. Measuring only intensity is vulnerable to many confounding factors such as light source strength and then reflections, which will change the optical touch. In oxygen sensing, we use lifetime technique for robust measurements, but it's very challenging to use the same technique for CO2 as the lifetime of CO2 uh, sensitive fluorescence is very fast in the low nanoseconds order. So we came up with a ratio metric measurement, which is called lifetime referencing method to measure the transcontinuous CO2 accurately. This is the miniaturized prototype that implements this technique. Uh, the measurements prove that how efficiently this dual lifetime referencing technique reduces the measurements error compared to the intensity uh, measurements. And we have performed the first human subject test with this DLR-based prototype. We tested the prototype from the forearm and fingertip. Uh, it should be noted that CO2 range in healthy human is very narrow compared to the oxygen range. Moreover, modulating CO2 is harder than modulating O2 in the body. However, despite these difficulties, we could observe slight changes in CO2 from fingertip measurements. We will need to improve the resolution of the system uh, to obtain better results. But in summary, this is the first test on human, and it's very promising. Finally, I would like to thank to my former and current PhD students, our sponsors and collaborators for their contribution and support. And I would like to hand it over to Ashkan Vaziri from BIOS. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ashkan Vaziri. I'm founder and CEO of BioSensex. Just as, as a quick introduction, by, by Sensex is a biomedical firm located in the Boston area, focused on developing and commercializing wearable sensors and digital health technologies for different healthcare applications. The company was founded ba back in 2007 by three scientists from Harvard. Uh, in 2019, Best Buy acquired parts of our assets. In 2020, we were one of the winners of the Best Award uh, by the U.S. Uh, Small Business Administration. Since our uh, foundation, our team has worked on development and commercialization of wearable sensors for healthcare applications. This includes our fall detection technology that revolutionized the medical alert industry. It's used by hundreds of thousands of active users, has saved many lives, something that obviously our team is very proud of. 
It's used also in eight different clinical drug-related clinical trials to measure falls as one of the endpoints. We also developed the first FDA-registered variable devices for gait and balance assessments. These are widely used in clinical studies and trials, including more than 15 trials where they are used to collect the primary endpoint of the trial. Our PAMSI sensor technology is the most advanced physical activity monitoring solution that is used for precision actigraphy. It measures more than 40 independent parameters of physical act activity. It also enables monitoring upper limb function and motor symptoms. And our PAMSYS Plus, it's a multimodal variable technology that enables detection and monitoring bouts of talking, providing very promising applications in various disease areas, including, for example, monitoring mental health, monitoring mental health as well as neurological disorders, uh, a speech biomarker assessments continuously measured during activities of daily living, Another application is continuous monitoring of coughing frequency and amplitude during activities of daily living. Our company provides technologies for digital measurements of motor speech and cognitive function. In addition to our variable sensors that I introduced to you, this includes our digital assessments for monitoring cognition and writing skills, life space, voice biomarker, and other endpoints, video based assessments to quantify, for example, facial characteristics and ptosis or look at, for example, hand and finger movement. In addition to providing our products and technologies to clinical researchers, as well as pharmaceutical company, companies to use them in their clinical trials, we also perform uh, 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 clinical studies with the objective of developing digital measurement tools and digital biomarkers for tracking disease progression in our priority therapeutic areas. At this point, we have eight different priority therapeutic areas that are shown here. Our efforts are supported by close to $12 million of funding from the National Institute of Health and is in collaboration with various partners as well as multiple pharmaceutical companies and patient advocacy groups. I'm gonna show you a selected results on our work in ALS as well as progressive sucronuclear palsy and Parkinson's disease. Before going there, I'm going to actually introduce you to our whole platform. I'm going to specifically introduce you to our platform for at-home monitoring called by Digit Clinic. Sorry, by Digit Home. This is a robust solution for collection of digital biomarkers. Has five different components, including our uh, sensor technology for monitoring, for example, physical activity, posture, falls, digital assessments, where we have already incorporated more than 100 digital assessments into our application. This is the only system that enables gait and balance assessment at home. You can do, for example, two-minute walk test at the home of the participant. It enables remote physiological monitoring via off-the-shelf devices that we have integrated and has software features to facilitate uh, the use of these devices in a clinical trial or study, such as the screening, consent, text notification, virtual visits. The results I'm going to present today is, again, from our BiDigit ALS study. Uh, they are actually, at this point, from 10 participants who are monitored and followed for 12 months. Uh, this study is still ongoing and is still recruiting more number of participants. Each participant came to the clinic at baseline and every three months afterwards. Uh, each participant undergo uh, complete clinical evaluation during each study visit. And then afterwards, where a PAMSI sensor attendant, and uh, actually two variable sensors on each wrist in order to monitor their physical activity, posture, falls, as well as upper limb function. This is supplemented by our digital assessments of speech, handwriting, skill, and pattern tracing, which each individual performed, each participant performed on bi-weekly basis at home. Uh, the results I'm going to show you is specifically, I'm going to focus on comparison with ALS-FRS, uh, which is the gold standard in clinical care as well as clinical trials in order to assess disease progression in ALS. ALS FRSR specifically can be uh, classified to four different categories. The bulbar subdomains, which are the first three items of ALS FRS, uh, upper extremity motor subdomains, which are items four to six, gross motor subdomains, items seven to nine, and the last three items are the respiratory subdomains of ALS FRS. Uh, I'm going to show you that actually our speech assessments correlate significantly with 
the uh, bulbar and respiratory distress subdomains and our sensor to, sensor uh, derived measures uh, from dependent correlates with gross motor subdomains and then the ones from um, the risk sensor correlate with the upper extremity subdomains of ALSFRS, thus providing a complete solution for uh, measurement or, or tracking ALSFRS. First, uh, looking at the gross motor, I'm going to briefly talk about our PAMSYS sensor technology. As I mentioned, this is used for precision actigraphy. It measures more than 40 independent parameters of physical activity. It's the only system that can measure posture using one sensor, including posture transition time and duration. Uh, also, the sensor has 500 megabytes of memory and has a battery life of up to six months. So from those 40 different sensor drive measure uh, drive measurements, you can see actually in this slide, I'm gonna show you activity related or step related parameters. Uh, so on the Y axis are sensor drive measures. On the X axis is the clinical score related to gross, gross motor sub score of ALSFRS, where you see significant correlations in some case in, in most of these parameters with the clinical score. If you look at the postural classification as well, you can see significant correlations between some of the postural parameters with the clinical score uh, as well. Now, moving on with our wrist sensor, which enables upper, monitoring upper lip function continuously at the home of the participant. Uh, again, it measures more than 20 different parameters of upper limb function during activities of daily living. And uh, you see uh, significant moderate correlation uh, with some of the parameters that are calculated with the upper extremity subdomain score of ALSFRS. Moving on to the speech assessment, specifically there are multiple speech assessments that are performed. For example, Rainbow Passage, uh, the, the, our bi-digital speech analysis uh, uh, measures more than 40 uh, parameters of uh, speech. And again, you can see parameters that have good correlations with the uh, with the uh, ALSFRS Balbar score. And the next one is Foundation A, which measures, as you can see, which has correlations with, for example, with pitch and loudness uh, as collected by our device compar in compared to the respiratory distress subscore. With this data, acknowledging that the sample size is low, what we have done is we developed machine learning based predictive models. So, what is on the y axis is what is measured by digital and variable sensors. So essentially what is predicted by the system with no other input uh, from the clinician, what is on the x-axis is the clinical score. So for example, for bulbar subdomain, as well as for upper extremity subdomain, as well as for gross motor subdomain, you can see that the, predict the prediction or predictive model uh, works uh, relatively nicely in this case, providing again a solution to measure uh, ALSFRS. Um, or the ALS disease progression. Now, moving on to another study, this is our bi-digit PSP study on focus on progressive supranuclear palsy. Uh, this is supported by NIA at this time and is still recruiting. The results I'm gonna show you is from 10 PD patients and 10 Parkinson patients. This is a multimodal monitoring, as you can see. I'm gonna be including multiple sensors as well as digital assessments of speech, cognition, um, and also video assessments. I'm going to show you specifically results related to in at home monitoring of gait and balance. So just to show you how, what an example of this, this is from a, a patient with uh, progressive supranuclear palsy as data collected at the home while the participant is performing what's called the talk test, time up and go. Using the variable sensors, we can provide detailed information uh, about, for example, this assessment. As you can see, actually, some of the results are shown here. Uh, for example, we can look at uh, the characteristics of walking during various parts of this test. For example, during turning, during a standing up, sitting down, walking towards and walking return. And again, if you look at here, the differentiation between the PD and PSP uh, are much better when we look at actually walk return in this case. Again, uh, highlighting the value of using the variable devices in this case. Also similar to, kind of similar to the results I showed for ALS, you can see actually sensor drive measurements uh, show good correlation with both PSPRA, PSPRS, which is the clinical score for PSP data score, as well as the modified PSPR total PSPRS score. 
So multiple parameters show very good correlation. Um, and last one I want to show is longitudinal uh, measurements where we where essentially those tests are performed over 12 months on monthly basis at the home of the participants. When it's compared to uh, the clinical score, essentially the gray area here is the clinical score. Uh, you can see that sensor drive outcomes demonstrate less variance uh, than the clinical scores, and thus uh, it can, using sensor-based devices, it can reduce the number or required sample size for clinical trials. Uh, at the end, I would like to acknowledge uh, support uh, from both National Institute of Ag and Aging as well as the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke. Thank you. And please welcome the next speaker. Hello, everyone. My name is Thurman Lockhart, and I'm going to be talking to you briefly about fall accidents, like Ashkan has done. He has done basically everything. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna really focus on fall accidents only, and then kind of talk about what are the metrics that are important and things like that. All right, uh, so you ready? All right, and uh, to do that, I'm gonna to talk to you briefly about fall accidents and the problem associated with that. And then, you know, what it took us to develop the sensor to actually assess fall risk among all older adults and then talk about the outreach. Here is what's happening, guys. Um, by 2030, there will be about 73 million older adults, and we're expecting 52 million falls. And out of that, and out of that, 12 million individuals are going to be injured. So this is a significant problem. And uh, in 2019, about 39,000 people died. And 2021, 44,686. That same year, motor vehicle accident, 45,000. Very, very similar. So what are we doing for the motor vehicle accidents? Well, we got seat belts. We got all kinds of protection system. What are we doing for older adults? Really nothing uh, to a certain extent. And if they don't die, then they suffer significantly. Their quality of life diminishes and uh, it degrades from that point onward. What are we doing about it? Well, there are two different approaches, fall protection and fall prevention. In terms of fall protection, we are doing pretty well. You know, there's Code of Federal Regulation, CFR 29, uh, you know, things like that could kind of uh, help us to build appropriate steps, length of the steps or height of the steps such that that individual doesn't get into a, a an accident or pertur perturbation, as we call it. Uh, hip back perhaps could work, you know, side handrails and things like that. We're doing very well. But one thing that we're not doing well is fall prevention. Fall prevention entails things like coefficient of friction modulating, coefficient of friction or slippery surface or trippy surfaces. And that, you know that's hard to do. So it's almost impossible. Currently, what I'm doing right now, I'm working with the uh, CPSC, Consumer Product Safety Agency, to create a baiting surface standard that has been obsolete since 1978. 1978. Oh, right. So, so the key question here is again: is how do we? You know, one thing that we do very well, by the way, is training. We created all these training modalities: gait training, balance training strength training, all these things work very, very well. But one thing that does not work too well is fall risk assessment. And the currently fall risk assessments are done as somewhat qualitatively uh, to a certain extent, and the accuracy really, really lacks. What I call fall risk assessment is like this. If you are at fall risk and if you fall like that, you're at fall risk. All this. Fading surface, fall risk. Anyway, it was a slow motion of getting out of the bat fading surface. 
And what we're finding out is getting out of the baiting surface, there's a four times more accidents that appears. Uh, but that's the next story. Anyway, so how to measure fall risk? And so we did this kind of experiment for 25 years. And through that period of time, uh, we learned a great deal. We actually created a slip simulator for like UPS and FedEx to training on uh, to reduce fall accidents. So we did, we did a lot of different developments. But for the older adults, we really needed to get back and really understanding what has happened. Really, really bad. So here is the Leo Tali, Tanzania. Uh, Australopithecus afrensis probably made this footprint about uh, 3.7 million years ago in Tanzania. And what happened was plume of ashes fell, and then it rained. Then these beings walked on it, and then plume of ashes fell again, and it solidified and became a rock. But look at the beautiful footprint of this. This is bipedal gait, bipedal locomotion. But more importantly, the next one, right next to it is a smaller footprint, right? And the step length is about the same. So the, you know, the bigger one is taking a shorter step, and the younger one is taking a normal step and walking along. So you could tell clearly from 3.7 million years ago, it does tell something about their behavior. So the gait, in a sense, is a, is a powerful means to assess behavior. And so we looked at this really, really carefully. And uh, what we're finding out is that it, at the time of the hill contact, during a single support phase, uh, what happens is we are falling, basically, and catching ourselves. And when, ha when that happens, a significant variability occurs right there. But you can see other variability that occurs here as well. This is a phase, phase diagram. So what we are doing is, to a certain extent, is linear uh, type of assessment where we are assessing everything right at the time of the hill contact, right? But ignoring all other variability. That's what we call temporal variability. And that's the essence of what I wanted to talk to you about, temporal variability. Assessing that variability is the key to assessing instability. I don't know whose water this is. <laughs> All right, so, so in terms of our gait, of course, our behavior is related to exploration as well as escaping type of behavior. And that is uh, formulated through the cuneiform nucleus, just here, as well as peduncular panty nuclei. And look how small these things are right here. And what they're doing is uh, one of my... Uh, PhD student is actually doing a deep brain stimulation study and uh, going into STN, subthalamic nucleus, as well as PPN, peduncular uh, pontin nuclei, to assess if there is a gait effect. And uh, this is what she found. And so far, she has done three individuals. They are actually implanting STN and a PPN together. And here are, are the electrodes. Uh, they program this first second, third, and fourth, and then when they feel okay, and then they stick with it. And uh, so this is three months right here, and then this is before. This is, this is a reaction time. We're perturbing this guy. And as you can see, at three months, uh, reaction time decreases a little bit. Uh, medication uh, on and off on decreases a little bit. Uh, PPN also so you can see clearly PPN has a, a center that are relevant for gait adjustment and the uh, adjustment of that, that reactive motion. And in essence, that is what we found. And the difference of import from younger individuals to older adults who really fall, <clears throat> really not the initiation, it really is the reactive recovery. And that's where we see the differences. And so after about 25 years of, you know, 20, 30 years of uh, experimenting like this, we found that, okay, this is happening all the time now. So how can we utilize this information to actually predict an individual who will fall given a you know, slippery surface or, or, or that kind of a chance? 
So we start to look at a variety of modeling uh, paradigm. Um, and so in essence, I mean, overall, to a certain extent, in that brain center, hippocampus, and all these areas, and this is what's happening. So Alzheimer's, Parkinson's patients, uh, people with uh, dementia, people, you know, uh, who has a, a stress syndromes and things like that, that all influences that, that, that center of brain. And, and what it does is it, it influences spatial temporal parameters. And by assessing that appropriately, I think we could actually uh, assess uh, appropriate characteristics. So um, overall, what gate research is showing us is that bottom line is that there's a nonlinear time delay that can be quantified by assessing uh, some of this stability information. So again, I'm going to be talking about this temporal variation. Right now, what we are doing is really one way of measuring it, just right here or here, whatever that is. Uh, there are some other methods that are available. Uh, and another thing is, you know, all of our measurements, our bottom line is, you know, it's a voltage, current, right? Uh, resistance, a little bit, uh, and, uh, you know, phase, right? So that's what we're going to get, no matter what equipment it is. And we translate that into numbers, right? and then look at the patterns afterwards. And so then, you know, it doesn't matter what we are measuring, if we do not understand the, the, the essence of this type of, you know, accidents. For example, you know, why are you measuring step length? Why are you measuring, you know, uh, you know walking speed to assess fall risk? You, do we really understand that? Uh, and that's where the issue is to a certain extent, I think, kind of, time and time again. And as a result of that, there's a delay in development of device that can truly identify a characteristics uh, and, and, and thereof. And so what we did was we actually applied the nonlinear dynamics theory, uh, things like uh, the Apanop exponent and flow K multiplier, to actually assess this temporal characteristics. And here's one example of that. Older adults, falling older adults, a little bit higher, healthy younger individuals. Here's a little bit of our algorithm. We used the Rosenstein algorithm back in on those days. And it took us about two days to run it. But now, on an iPhone, we could run this, by the way. And this is how we do it, usually. Here's an acceleration, or you get a, you know, a marker position, or whatever have you there. We get into a three dimension or five dimension, whatever the dimension that we need to be. And we assess this information. There is some variability. And we basically use a Rosenstein algorithm to assess that slope. And we do this over and over and over again. And that slope represents, it, it represents instability. What it means is that given a perturbation, that person will most likely fall more than the other individuals who have flatter her. You could also assess this information using flow K multipliers, by the way. Flow K multiplier, you could cut it anywhere, put a point, point, point carré map in any direction, and then calculate those variabilities. Um, and so, so those are more of a chaos type of measure that you could actually assess. You could also use some nonlinear dynamics like complexity, someone talked about here, which is a beautiful measure. And especially for the older adults, and uh, this is uh, a real measure of a heart rate variability. As you can see here, mean standard deviation about the same, but the multi-scale entropy is a little bit different. What happens is that as we get older, uh, our gait, our heart, the rhythm kind of uh, stays uh, in, in a monotone to a certain extent. It doesn't vary too much. And as a result of that, given a perturbation, that person will not react and recover. So the bottom line here is that again, uh, using a fall risk prediction, I, we actually used about 171 individuals, community dwelling elderly data set of a 10 meter at their home. And we use the linear features as well as some nonlinear features. And uh, we wanted to veer away from things like zero crossing and skewness and things like that. That doesn't make any sense for rehabilitation. And so we input that data, and what we find out that was that in incorporating nonlinear 
dynamics actually improved about 12% of, uh, of the prediction range. And uh, we were just using, and this phone here, by the way, Lockhart Monitor is available, it's free, you could download it. It's been tested uh, to a certain extent. And there's another version of that. And so this is what we're showing the actual um, improvement uh, incorporating the non dynamics. And this is the whole story. The whole story behind it is that try to understand what's going on. It's really understand, right? Gay characteristics and things like that. I perturb, you know, really by understanding these true characteristics then and only then we could really start to develop devices. And we're developing a variety of type of devices, not only mobile app, but also uh, for CMG, uh, a variety of systems that could actually measure polypharmacy, some of the aging effects. And uh, Lockhart Monitor has been just now uh, got upgraded and then there is this version. This is more of an inter uh, enterprise version. Uh, hospital could use it or you know, whoever could use it. It's uh, already out there. And uh, thank you very much. And last but not least, yeah. Thank you. Well, I'm going to be uh, speaking about um, more um, focusing on holistic, um, naturalistic assessment of movement and behavior um, in the wild, so to speak. And I'm going to be um, focusing on the um, importance of context and use case and uh, how you know one size may not fit all. We're doing certainly in the research uh, space. Right. So, um, right for context, um, there's there are many different use cases to do to to measure various um, activities and behaviors. One can focus um, at the more the higher level of the type of study, whether it's a basic behavioral science kind of study, clinical or intervention trials, clinical practice, or even larger population health kinds of studies. When one dives down to more specific areas, um, often in, um, uh, most important to human activity is functional domain. So around this home is cognition, mobility, sleep, socialization, physiology. Um, we've heard a lot of these various areas uh, today um, being candidates for measurement, but also uh, the importance of um, how these actually interrelate. So doing multi-domain um, integrated kinds of assessments is very important. I'm gonna be uh, talking about um, examples uh, that highlight principles uh, to um, best address these various measurement areas. Um, I'm going to uh, describe uh, something that we call the Orchitech CART platform, which is an open, use case flexible, uh, technology agnostic, and shareable platform. Uh, this was actually uh, largely, most recently, uh, developed um, with funding from the NIH, with the NIH leading, and the VA to uh, create a, um, a system that could be used by researchers, um, particularly in the aging sphere, but it can be used for people of younger ages as well. Um, to facilitate uh, using um, uh, digital kinds of methodologies in their research in these various areas. So um, the system, um, importantly, uh, allows one to uh, also use other conventional kinds of data. I mean, there's many standard research types of data that's used. We've heard about many standard scales that people are in interested in. There's lots of EHR, uh, medical record data, and external environment, um, the, the air quality, the weather, and so forth that can affect these measurements. But ultimately, one uh, wants to look at the home-based um, activities of individuals. Uh, that's where most people spend their time, particularly in the aging group. Um, and so uh, what we've done is, uh, for each of these areas of function uh, or domains, 
um, various kinds of technologies or um, sensing systems can be used um, depending on the, the use case. Um, and I'll just give a few examples in a moment. Um, but uh, just to highlight this, you know, when we talk about uh, cognition, one can measure it directly by taking a test online, or you can look at the meta aspects of actually using the computer itself. Um, and whether it's a laptop, a smartphone, a tablet, or even driving your car. So um, one can tap into the data port of an automobile and look at driving um, as a cognitive task, as well as um, safety um, kind of measurement, assessment. Um, importantly, the um, field, as we know, moves very rapidly. Um, so one needs to be able to uh, integrate new sensors or methodologies um, this gets back to that issue of technology agnosticism. Some examples of the kinds of things that um, are measured or can be measured. I'm seeing the font has changed here, but that's okay. Um, uh, so for example, in the domain of what we call everyday cognition, so using a, a computing device, um, you know, we've shown that one can see very clearly that um, in individuals who have mild cognitive impairment over time, just their, uh, the time they spend on the computer um, gradually declines. Um, in the area of mobility, for example, um, looking at a, a group of um, older individuals, um, average healthy older individuals over time, some uh, develop early mild cognitive impairment, others uh, sort of were later. You can see here looking at the variability of their walking speed measured with passive sensing. I'm gonna highlight that in a moment can be uh, differentiated. Area of social engagement, simple metric, time together, time apart, time out of home. Um, this is a spiral plot, just plotting on a 24 hour clock, um, each little line circularly. Uh, this is about a month of data, just showing um, how couples might spend their time. This could be used uh, for caregiver kinds of um, ass assessments as well. And then just another example, sleep, which can be measured with um, passive sensing, with wearables, with a bed mat, and also very, very well distinguish different, in this case, um, categories of mild cognitive impairment. And even one might consider couples and how they each affect sleep of one another. Um, often in clinics, I find that people may be describing their disturbed sleep and blaming it on their partner. Um, so what are some of the main, the principles, uh, to, uh, most effectively or optimally, um, do these kinds of assessments? So one thing I will, I would strongly suggest is we want to move to be most ecologically valid. That is, we want the movement and behavior that we assess to reflect everyday function and, um, to be really, um, you know, based on, um, in the community. Um, as I mentioned, on average, uh, older populations spend about 20, 21 hours a day in their home. So in that regard, um, ideally, the more passive, the more um, unobtrusive the measurements are, the better. Um, I don't know if it's a real word, but Hawthorne-less, so the, you know, the fact that you know you're being assessed can affect the very behavior that you're trying to look at. And I also want to emphasize that we talk a lot about passive sensing or active sensing, but it really is a continuum. And I love dogs, so put this here. But it is it is important that um, you know there's there's probably nothing that's entirely uh, passive unless you're to well. So these are examples of um, some individuals who are in some studies using this system. Actually, this is from the original CART study. Uh, just on the wall are some passive IR sensors. Um, the pillbox is a standard pillbox, but it's um, recording the time of day when the compartments are open. And over on the right is a wearable. There are hundreds of wearables. Um, they continue to evolve. Um, and, and it does just remember, just really, I think it's the right tool for the right uh, job. Um, in and really, uh, the other thing to consider is, um, I think we often get focused on a single channel, 
Um, and ideally, if we can relate these different uh, domains of function together, uh, we get a better picture that really represents real activity and behavior in the wild. Um, it's uh, it's really important. So so this context is everything. I think is really important. So to kind of um, emphasize this, I'm going to just describe a couple of um, cases actually that come from um, longitudinal aging studies where this platform has been installed in homes. Um, this is an uh, an individual from a cohort of about 250 people who were followed over time. They all were um, average, healthy, normal aging individuals. This individual developed Parkinson's disease a couple years after being monitored with a sensor system showing these are pacifier sensors that are um, aligned in the ceiling. Every time the person walks under the sensors, um, a walking speed is um, captured. The little graph on the top with the star in the middle just shows um, uh, two months, I believe, of uh, walking uh, uh, episodes or bouts. Um, and the star is actually the walking speed obtained with a stopwatch um, in a clinic. So walking is very variable, as we all know. The, the plot in the bottom, though, shows um, something else, that when the person was given uh, medication, um, they um, were able to have some stabilization. Um, they then moved to a um, assisted living facility. And you can see the data changes. And this is actually challenging to analyze because one could argue that it's the change in the environment or the movement of the sensors themselves into their new living space. Um, another example of um, some of the context that we have to think about is here uh, is another person who was followed in a similar study, in the same study, um, who de also developed Parkinson's disease. And here um, they're measured, their mobility is measured just with step counts using a wearable. And you can see how that changes over time, um, just showing um, about 50 weeks before and after the diagnosis and treatment with Cinemat. Um, but you can also look more deeply um, in the same individual if you have another methodology available. So here also passive sensing was um, in, the, uh, in the same setup. You can then dive down into a, a more detailed uh, look at what might be happening. So um, again, here is walking speed um, and the um, it's really the average walking speed during that hour in the day. So the time of day is on the vertical axis. Um, and then the color indicates the speed. Um, so just to have this principle of um, complementary measurement of the same metric or, or domain of function, um, and then looking at people over time as they change under treatment or in different environments is what I'm trying to get at. Here's another um, just another example to uh, amplify this that on the top, so this is a person followed in a cancer uh, study um, where we're looking at um, how people respond to treatment or side effects of treatment. Um, and in the top rows are weekly answers online to a questionnaire looking at their function. Um, and then such as whether they went to the hospital or the emergency room, whether they fell, um, whether they had changes in their medication, and then um, looking at multimodal um, assessment using different um, devices or sensors. So the uh, row, there's a row looking at step counts, um, weight changes, um, and then sleep um, metrics um, in the bottom two uh, panels or, or lines. Um, and the, just the principle that, um, you know, these, these can all be uh, integrated to give a much more... Um, holistic view of what is changing or not over time relative to real world um, events. So um, just a few other principles, if you will. Um, ideally, um, this term technology agnostic is used a lot, but just I think it's important that uh, you know things come and go. Um, I'm a somewhat older guy. Um, so some of you may remember the Pebble, the Jawbone, Microsoft Band, which was terrific. Um, the Acta Watch was just discontinued, and actually, the the Amazon Halo um, uh, was banned. Was 
I understand is no longer going to be supported or aid. Um, so, so one has to be prepared for that and understand that, you know, the measurement has to be um, well understood, specified, traceable. And this is where things that ideally are non-proprietary, open and shareable are really important, certainly for research. Uh, whether the uh, te technologies are tested in the real world is important. And, um, Oh, is the time fast? Um, <laughs> all right. I'll just have to really speed up here. So validation is important. Um, so biological validation um, here um, with actual people's postmortem results. Um, this is an Alzheimer plaque related to these, um, these variables. And then finally, um, whether the real world whether testing is done in diverse populations. So these um, tools have been measured or used in um, minority aging project in Chicago, veterans in rural areas, low income individuals, um, Hispanic participants in Miami. Um, the context again is important. So asking people what has happened will affect data. So here during the pandemic, showing loneliness going up when asked on a weekly basis, bottom step counts, and then the last thing, I just have a couple of slides. Here. The last thing that I want to be, uh, make uh, a point about is it's not just behavior itself, but also where it's happening is another really important feature. So here, just showing um, movement about a part, an apartment of an individual, um, looking at the uh, time they may spend in particular locations during different uh, time periods. Um, and then lastly, or second to lastly, um, you can see how whether you live with somebody or not, or you have some cognitive impairment or not, really um, affects where, how much time you even spend in a particular location and how much you transition from one room to another. That's a measure of mobility. Or in a person with severe dementia living in a uh, memory care unit, in a room, essentially, you can look at agitated behavior, movement about their room on the left panel is agitated nights, the right panel is non-agitated nights, and just showing how there's much less time in bed um, and actually even in their um, room uh, during those periods. And with that, I will um, end um, and just uh, remind that everybody that we've come a long way, I think. Um, this is a... Um, Darwin diary of what he was doing during the day, 24 hour day. And then on the right is what we can measure now with sensors um, continuously in the wild. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I also would like to invite uh, the two discussants. Uh, we have met the first discussant, Dr. Uh, Andrea Shako from the University of California, Irvin, Irvin and uh, Dr. Laurie uh, Cabrera from Penn State University. So we can start with uh, Laura, you can. Uh, Laura's background is in neuroethics, so you will talk a little bit about your work and then ask your questions. You start. Okay, thank you. I hope you can hear me now. Um, so we don't hear you. Right, it says the screen. Is it better now? Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, thank you for the very exciting talks. As uh, you were mentioned uh, I'm a neuroethicist, so that means that I look at the ethical, social, policy implications of advances in neuroscience and neurotechnology. So here in these talks is very interesting because I have both technical but also ethical questions, but I only get one question, which is tricky. Um, so my question, it really is, is I was really, I really appreciate Dr. Smith 
getting at that very early in your talk when you mentioned some of the issues that you see in your own work. So, but I, the, the, my question is initially to you, but I want to open up for the rest of the speakers. So what would be a key ethical consideration of your work and in particular of the populations that you're working with, right? Because you're working either with infants or in children or really adult populations. So those raise particular ethical issues. And related to that is if you are currently and actively working in ways to addressing that particular issue. We're going to start with you, Dr. Smith, because you raised it, but uh, yeah. Sure. So, um, it, so yes, you know, the with infants, there are a, a number of different um, scenarios. So some, some of the infants that we're working with are uh, known to be at high risk for neurodevelopmental disabilities uh, because of how they started life. Um, and, you know, those diagnoses are often not made until two or three years of age. Uh, so I think, you know, sensors can help us do that earlier, um, as we were talking about. But, you know, it, it what those what those variables are, um, are going to likely be different in different cases. And so I think one of the things that could be valuable is by having a truly truly representative sample of the wide variability of normative development, we can sort of define, okay, you know, here's typical development in this large state space, and maybe autism is over here, and cerebral palsy is over here, and other conditions are in different places. Um, and what, I'm sorry, the second part of your question? It's... If you actively work in ways to address a particular ethical issue that you raise the which particular ethical issue well the first part of the question was what is a key ethical issue and then the second part of the question oh, is exactly. if you're actively working on ways to address it um sure so i mean there are a lot of ethical issues when when working with children um you know where so safety is one of them um so i talked a little bit about choking hazard being particularly relevant in working with infants um you know we also have um, ethical issues of it, it if we are measuring infants depending on what what you're measuring you know you can measure things about the home environment things about parental I interaction you know for example we are um, mandated reporters of child abuse so th things like this get to be tricky and you have to have a lot of conversations and a plan on on how you will address things like this when they come up anybody else care to comment Others? A oh, different question? Or is this, you can answer the same question? Five. Want the same question? Or I can go with the next one. I can quickly say something about yeah, this. I... So we haven't started uh, measuring our sensor on infants yet, but it is scheduled. So one of the things is, uh, uh, it, it works, yeah. Uh, so one of the things, uh, so we, we will need to check oxygen and carbon dioxide, blood gases. Uh, and um, because of ethics, of course, we cannot really like do any, uh, uh, you know, interventions, right? Like whatever the natural population, we have to use this population's data and we can't do anything else. So this is kind of limiting our uh, measurement scope, uh, test scope, but this is what is it. Should I go with the next question? Yes. It will be very dry, not as exciting uh, philosophical question, very, very dry related to um, all the sensors that were used in applications. What I noticed that uh, in, uh, um, I think in pretty much all uh, presentation, which I very much enjoyed, uh, uh, commercial off-the-shelf uh, sensors were used. So in a way we are, piggybacking um, uh, what developed for high volume applications uh, 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 sort of and this high volume applications are developed for some uh, generic uh, uh, goals in mind and so my question is um, when you select the sensor of the shelf sensor in on dg key or elsewhere um, how do you select it uh, and um, are you satisfied with what uh, you find on dg key 
uh, and gen generic DG key. And what would be your wish list if you are not satisfied with what you find? So, so there's a sort of a hierarchy of of uh, requirements or ideal. So there's no ideal solutions, and it's a trade-off. I think the first part is um, is it is it going to be usable or acceptable in the population that you're doing a study in, so in the research context? Because um, if people don't, you know, you don't use the device or tolerate it or whatever, then you have no data. So, I mean, I think that's that's actually, in, in some ways, um, at least in my experience, often neglected. So it's a, somebody has a really shiny, cool, I mean, you see this like, Apple Watch is a tremendous device, but in certain instances, it's not actually that usable by, you know, some people. Um, the um, The degree that the, quote, raw data is available. And, you know, we have a whole discussion about what is raw data. But um, the, the degree that the data is traceable and um, uh, available, and if there are algorithms involved, um, that those are uh, also open and available um, is another important consideration. Um, the cost, um, the... Um, uh, whether there's any uh, data that suggests it's been validated or measured across other standards um, is important. And there, there's a whole host of these. Um, but your, the other question you asked is really interesting, I think. Uh, so what if there isn't anything that's quite, you know, so then you're sort of faced with, do you go and try to make something yourself? And I, you know, again, just an anecdote. We originally there was surprisingly there was no we we wanted we've always wanted to measure um medication use so this we're not reminding we just wanted to use pill boxes to know when it was likely the person was using medication so taking out so the the plastic pill box is the most widely used medical device <laughs> for medication tracking if you will um but there was no device actually in the market so we went ahead and we constructed a bunch of these boxes. So we had artesian pill boxes that were hand done, but that's not scalable. So, but in the, it, it subsequently turned out in the marketplace that there were companies that then began to make these and they became available. So we quickly were fortunate not to have it. But I think that there is this, um, you know, sometimes you have to accept that, you know, the, what is it, the, uh, you know, perfect shouldn't be the enemy of the good. And um, and and accept that you know it's, you don't have a perfect solution. Um, just to add a little bit to that, so you know another consideration is battery life. It depends on what you're trying to do with the sensor, but some sensors have uh, user interactive interfaces, and you may or may not want your users interacting with the sensor, and that also influences battery life. Um, so you know there are considerations like that, and I also want to echo about validation whether or not the sensor you're choosing has been validated if you're if you're using the metrics that exist from the sensor have they been validated in the population that you're assessing um and that's one thing you know i was actually talking about use of the raw data in which case even at that point it there's not necessarily equivalency among different sensors measuring the same thing which is yet another problem in terms of validation Others? Have Actually, I'm curious everybody's answer on this question. For example, uh, BioSensix um, didn't mention what sensors uh, I used, uh, who is the vendor for the sensors, what are the characteristics of the sensors? Um, so um, we develop every part of our technology ourselves, including the variable sensors, uh, all software, all algorithms, the backend, Mm -hmm. all portal everything is developed by us i think uh, there are many obviously variable sensors out there which can be used at small scale for for example performing uh, research 
I think another consideration would be um, application. For example, if you're specifically looking at the medical application, if you want it to be used in the context of FDA submission, looking at what FDA requires is uh, essentially country recommends that all sponsors or essentially when, whenever a sensor is used, uh, the sponsors need to have access to uh, the raw data, which is not provided by many of the current variable devices. Or if they do, the battery life is very low. Um, and the other consideration is the scalability. Many of the sensors that are off the shelf can be used in, you know, a study in 20, but really cannot scale to a, um, to a solution that, for example, can get FDA approval and then can be put in the market. Mm. So we, uh, based on experience, uh, we develop everything ourselves. What sensors do you use? Mike. Yeah, we have multiple sensors, are, uh, and we are actually unifying them into a single sensor. Uh, that single sensor has uh, a 3D accelerometer, an independent 9 degree of freedom, an altimeter, two microphones, a wireless charging, one gigabyte of memory, six months of battery life. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let's uh, answer some questions from the virtual audience first. Yeah, so the first question is about data sharing and um, <clears throat> would love to get the panelists' thoughts on how might these data be openly shared for the community to analyze the data as well, considering the host of uh, different sensors that data are available from. Can you please repeat that? It's about data sharing. How can data be shared effectively for the community to analyze it um, from all these different sources? I can at least on our side, I mentioned that um, um, obviously we are a business, um, so we do value the data that is collected in our studies. Um, but in limited cases, we actually provide the data to collaborators and others who uh, would like to use them for research applications. Uh, we are also, uh, for example, releasing a pipeline uh, for a speech analysis that uh, by before the end of this year that actually enables anyone uh, very similar to actually chat GPT to online analyze the speech data that they collect using any devices. Um, so uh, as a small business, we are protective of the data, but on Case by cases, uh, we provide the data to researchers who would like to publish it. And, and for us, uh, we publish that in GitHub usually. So most of our raw data are in there as well as our MATLAB codes. So you can use all that stuff. Yeah, I was just gonna say, so if, you, if you're accepting uh, NIH money, you're supposed to share your data. Um, however, I'm gonna maybe be pro no, not, not that provocative, but um, I think what's not really um, appreciated is this kind of data is, you know, so you can say like, oh, here's the data streams, it's for you. But there's so much um, that goes into how that data was captured, the context, um, even trying to annotate it um, adequately is, is a very difficult um, enterprise. And in our experience, we, we have many people who have asked for our data and we give it to them. And often they we get second and third asks about questions, which we're happy to entertain. But I think this idea that, oh, you just post up a, a bunch of raw data and then, then you're done is, is not um, correct. Yeah, I think uh, label. That. Next question from the audience in room. Is that me? Can I go? Yes. <laughs> Ruth Bejafari from Texas A&M. I have two questions. Uh, I think one of the common themes uh, among the talks, Dr. Smith, Dr. K, Dr. Lockhart, was activity of, activities of daily living, motor functions are very much personalized. Tell us a little bit about when you try to detect changes, you try to detect deviations from normal self. Tell us a little bit about how you can build models, digital twin potentially, 
that would help you to look for those changes, but the models would also continuously update. The second question is about how we can unlock the capabilities of these technologies. If you consider a physician, care provider, they want to use this data to make some determination, but looking at the raw data is not the solution for them. What are the low hanging fruit sort of directions that you might suggest that can really take you to the next level for translation? Thank you. Uh, for which one? For Dr. K? Anybody. Anybody. You start first. Great. <laughs> okay. If I could, you know, there's this echo. It's a little hard to get the uh, full question. So if I heard it correctly, at least the first one, um, I mean, building models from the data that are predictive um, is, I don't know that it's, I mean, it's, there's many ways to do it. In fact, um, you know, we don't, there's a lot of um, spin and buzz in a way around artificial intelligence and machine learning. And, but if you can use a, you know, a linear regression model, a logistic regression model and get a result that's reliable and reproducible, that's okay. And in fact, we've taken, for example, the uh, walking speed data that I, that I showed, and we can predict falls within uh, a week looking at the variability of walking speed. So variability is very important, as Thurston pointed out. Um, with with a simple logistic regression kind of model approach, um, but then of course you know there's tremendous um, detail in in these data streams, and so one can certainly aggregate the data and you know uh, train models to um, then predict uh, all sorts of outcomes. It's, I know it's a kind of more general answer. Maybe later we can talk more about it. I was thinking about maybe, you know, you could create a uh, rehabilitation type of scheme Perfect. given some of this information better. So that's how we use the model, I would say. Next question. So my question is for uh, Last one. Dr. Smith. Uh, you said that like the timestamps are not reliable. So are you making a general statement? Or is it like a specific cases where the timestamps from the sensor are not reliable? And secondly, when I look at the, the data you shared, it was, it was a two second difference in 72 hours. So does that matter? Like does that much of a drift or does that much of a uncertainty with the sensor? Does that really matter? Yeah, so, um, so yes, my point was that there, that drift is a known situation with with sensors and with accelerometers and that you have to test for that to be aware of that so whether or not it impacts the measurement you're making depends on a number of things how long are you recording for what what measure are you making in the case of what we were trying to do which is is the right arm moving by itself or is the right arm are the right arm and left arm moving at the same time a difference of two seconds absolutely matters because movements are often shorter than that if, if your measurement is, uh, you know, if you're measuring something else, it might not be important to you. But um, my point is that that's something people need to be aware of and then test for. It's going to vary by different sensors. Um, it, you know, it depends on the sampling rate of the sensor, it depends on a number of other characteristics. But if they're not actively synchronized to one another and communicating, accelerometers are going to drift apart from one another over time. And the further along you get, the further apart they're going to get. Anything to add? Thank you. Yeah. Well, let's thank you, the speakers, and discuss it again. And for more questions, you can still discuss with them during the social time and the breaks. Uh, we have five minutes break. Yeah. And come back for the last session. And again, welcome back everyone from break. It is now my pleasure to turn it back over to Dr. Svetlana Tatiklusik. Please go ahead. Okay, so I was told to start, I will. So you already know my name and I will be moderating the next session, session number three, titled Sensor Network Signal Processing and Considerations for Artificial Intelligence. We have two speakers in it. The first one is uh, Professor Vina Mistra, from North Carolina State University and DARPA. 
And the other one is Professor Hongang Wang from uh, University of Massachusetts Dartmouth. We will also have two discussants, uh, Professor Edwin Khan from Cornell University and Dr. Rajashri Raji Bashkaran from Super Bloom Studios. Okay, and uh, I didn't say that Professor Misra will be um, virtual, so her talk is about to start now. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Vladana. All right. Um, so thanks again for uh, giving me the opportunity here to tell you a little bit about what we're doing in the Assist Center. Uh, we are a NSF funded and now graduated engineering research center, which stands for the Assist Center stands for Advanced Self Power Systems of Integrated Sensors and Technologies. And it is a partnership of multiple universities. And it is my privilege to present to you some recent highlights from uh, the team members involved in the center. All right, so our vision right from the beginning has been to um, has been to get the battery out of the picture uh, and more accurately uh, get the user not to have to worry about charging the battery so that continuous monitoring could be possible. We are using uh, both the wearable uh, platform as well as implantables. Uh, we also are trying to make sure we have enough power coming from autonomous sources uh, so that we can have multiple uh, sensing modalities uh, as part of the wearable and implantable system so that we can capture different dimensions of health. We also would like these systems to be passively on all the time, and therefore they need to be able to communicate on their own. So the communication uh, uh, protocols have to be very low power and uh, data analytics piece of course is very necessary to convert the data into uh, inference and, and action. So our center, uh, just like a typical National Science Foundation ERC center has been very focused on systems driven approach. Uh, we have identified uh, health use cases, such as the ones shown uh, on, 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 the, on the top here. For example, we're looking at asthma, uh, mental health, aging, behavior tracking, cardiovascular disease, and so on and so forth. We uh, have built numerous wearable systems, such as shirts and armbands and rings uh, and watches uh, in order to address the needs of these particular uh, uh, use cases that you see. So the driving force uh, has been to ensure that the power available to the sensor system from autonomous sources, such as the human body, is always going to be greater than the power that we consume so that we get always on operation. Uh, especially important uh, is the use, are the use cases concerning behavior, uh, because in behavior uh, assessment, uh, the actions are not predictable and having a reliable running uh, sensor system is key. Already we heard just in the previous session for infants that a full day's data was actually needed to identify differences between normal and not normal behavior, whereas five minutes of assessment was not able to do that. So the use of always on systems uh, is quite enabling for some of these types of use cases. Um, the second aspect of it is, is, the, is, is the number of sensors and the types of sensors that we have in these systems. And, and also we need to make sure that the systems we build are actually adopted by different kinds of uh, individuals and the data that we're collecting can be uh, converted to actionable information. So I'm going to touch upon these three aspects of what we do in the center uh, and, uh, and discuss with you some emerging opportunities. So one way to ensure that we have always on operation is to keep is to take the battery charging out of the picture and instead rely on the human body. In this regard, over the course of the past several years, we have looked at uh, sources of body heat and body motion as the as powering up our sensor systems. Uh, we have built uh, advanced, uh, flexible uh, uh, thermoelectric wearable systems that have generated quite a bit of power. We've also built uh, novel piezoelectric systems that can harvest uh, foot strikes and convert that to self-powered gate systems. And in more recent years, we're looking at uh, biofuels where we can collect the sweat and, and convert that to power using uh, uh, robust enzymes for lactate and glucose. And in cases when uh, autonomous sources of energy are not available, uh, such as in 
the implantable devices. We're also looking at ultrasonic energy transfer uh, to keep those systems continuously working as well. So uh, here's an example of a cardiac shirt that we built in recent years. This shirt has flexible thermoelectric devices. It has dry electrodes. It has supercapacitors, uh, compressed sensing uh, chips, uh, uh, flexible antenna, and dry ECG electrodes uh, shown here that can provide continuous uh, battery-free operation for, for continuous monitoring of ECG. Um, we have also uh, recently developed a very uh, high efficiency elect ultrasound energy transfer uh, for uh, implantable devices uh, using um, a CMUT, a, a capacitive micro machine ultrasonic transducer, uh, uh, transducers to convert, um, to, to transfer energy into the body. So with these types of approaches, we're able to power up these devices in a continuous manner, but uh, that's not the complete picture. Uh, Alongside providing energy, we also need to lower the power of all the electronics that are in the system. And uh, this is an example of our custom electronics that we have built in recent years, where the power levels that we are, are consuming are, are minuscule versions of what we can get in the commercial space. You can see that our, our system here is, con is uh, consuming less than 0.5 microwatts of power. We have our radios that we have uh, uh, simplified and now operate at 150 microwatts. And in addition to that, we have also built uh, unique uh, uh, circuit components like an analog front end that has four channels. So it can have four different kinds of sensing modalities working in parallel, along with a multi-harvested power management system, which can not only take your body heat, but also take RF sources um, and other ways, other sources of energy available and pass it to the sensor system. So uh, this is the kind of uh, 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 reduction in power systems that's necessary to be compatible with the energy that we're harvesting from the human body. Since uh, some of you may know that Bluetooth communication is, is the most power hungry component of wearable systems. And if you want to achieve continuous monitoring with real time transmission, we are also uh, uh, positioned to look at alternative routes. And in this particular case, we looked at wireless uh, ECG measurements using backscattering communication, which is basically, basically communications via reflections. And this comes in the form of looking at Bluetooth packets that are then reflected off of a, uh, of a, of a backscattering component component that is located on the phone. And with this approach, the power consumption of an EKG sensor can be driven down to 10 microwatts, which is, of course, 100x lower than anything in the conventional space. And again, it does not require a battery. And our demonstrations in this uh, regard have allowed us to work, uh, combine, combine this with sweat harvesting. And so this is another example of being able to achieve passive continuous monitoring um, uh, without power consumption. So with that little bit of background on the harvesting and ultra low power uh, communication and computation, I wanna move on a little bit now to sensors. Uh, we have heard so many excellent talks today about sensors and our team in the ASSIST program has also been working on all these different modalities that you see here. Um, and uh, our approach, however, has been to focus on reducing the power consumption of these sensors so that they're compatible with the energy harvesting that we're also uh, developing. So I'd like to highlight uh, three types of emerging sensing modalities that have, uh, I think, great, great potential in assessment of behavior, cognition, and emotion. These include optical multi-wavelength PPG, uh, human volatome, um, and blood pressure. Um, and I'll show you some opportunities uh, in e each of these areas. So in the, in the area of optical sensing, uh, one uh, immediate application is sleep. Uh, as we know, sleep is connected to cognition. Sleep is connected to early decline in, uh, de in dementia and Alzheimer's. And also in general, there's a lot of the percentage of the world that suffers from chronic sleep disorders. So um, our team has built a new wearable system that has the capability of combining multiple modalities, such as infrared spectroscopy, near-infrared spectroscopy, and other typical sleep-related sensor signals in a conformal conformable patch. This system has been test 
tested in uh, sleep studies. If we have um, uh, used machine learning uh, to further build the resilience in this system um, and provide a, a platform that can be used in clinical studies. But there is an opportunity to take optical sensing even beyond uh, just what we see, what we have seen so far. There are many biochemicals uh, uh, in the blood that respond to much longer wavelengths. Uh, for example, it's been well documented that uh, both glucose and many lipids are observed at longer wavelengths, um, and, and these are typically not possible to observe in the in the in the visible spectrum. Uh, to this end and to this opportunity, we have built uh, rings that can uh, that have the capability of uh, of, of uh, generating twelve different wavelengths of light. Uh, and then these different wavelengths can not only uh, help us detect the total hemoglobin and hematocrit, but also the other kinds of uh, biochemicals that I mentioned uh, already. And uh, our, dis our, our uh, system design for Bluetooth allows this, this ring to operate at uh, power consumption that is in the 100 microwatt or less. And this can be applied towards chromoph chromophores that we are not even sure of yet that can help us assess uh, some of the cognitive and emotional states um, that, are, that are being discussed. Uh, another new emerging area that is relatively unchartered is the human volatome. Um, so we all have heard that breath has many uh, uh, signals that come out, uh, VOC signals that come out that are connected to diseases like cancers and diabetes and more. And we also know that the environment contains many toxins. Uh, what we don't know too much is what is happening in the skin. Uh, and there have been studies shown down here that uh, even human fear has a specific VOC signature. And so there's an opportunity to look at uh, skin emissions uh, on a continuous manner and assess them for different changes in behavior or lifestyle. And here's an example of some of the work that we have been able to detect using uh, very low levels of uh, VOCs coming out of skin, but still being able to detect them using array of metal oxide gas sensors. And uh, the, I think the, the, uh, a very important parameter is blood pressure monitoring. And several studies have shown a significant association with hypertension and uh, mild cognitive impairment. Uh, we have used uh, ultrasound based uh, a, a sensor system to look at uh, the blood vessel diameter and use that as a way to interpret blood pressure. And I'm going to, in interest of time, I'll move forward. I think we, uh, I'd like to share just a little bit about sensor systems uh, powered by machine learning. So um, one of the areas where behavior is a big problem is uh, individuals who have, uh, who are suffering from uh, conditions like uh, autism. And right now the prediction of these is done by a caretaker. Uh, and that's prone to bias. And so we want to build a, a wearable platform and, and use machine learning as a way to create a more objective approach to predict, predicting problem behavior. This is what our system looks like. It comprises of, uh, of many different sensors, five posture sensing nodes, as well as physiological sensing. And with all of this data being put together in an algorithm, we, um, we are uh, able to detect um, uh, early signs of behavior changes. Uh, finally, we are looking at uh, gait sensing as well, uh, and, and using this to uh, with wearable IMUs uh, and compete very well with COTS-based expensive gait uh, monitoring approaches. Um, I know my time is running up, but there's uh, one final slide I'd like to share, <clears throat> which is looking at uh, robust audio training. This is being done for cough, but also for speech, because co uh, speech uh, changes are connected to cogn cognitive decline. Uh, and here we are looking at training deep neural networks by uh, and not lose their performance, uh, even when additional unexpected sounds are, are put into the into the network. Uh, and we are looking at uh, and at. at transferring this to neural network chips uh, to make the system uh, even more robust. So with that, I will conclude and uh, basically state that there are many promising directions for sensor systems to actually make an impact in patients. Uh, and this is possible by enabling systems that provide long-term and continuous monitoring as well as uh, novel sensors. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Hong Gang, Hong Gang Wang. 
Good afternoon. Uh, I, I will, I, I'm very happy to hear uh, to present uh, my research on IoT for wireless health. Uh, so I, in the morning, I, I saw a um, great uh, talk related to sensor design. And also the afternoon, the lot research related applications, uh, the healthcare applications. My, my research is a little bit different. It focuses on the system level, how to build up IoT systems for wireless health. Okay, so you, you, you may hear a lot of uh, you know, terms like e-health, mobile health, also NSF has a, a smart life health, right? So the wireless health actually, uh, uh, they are same, uh, is similar uh, as those terms, but they are, uh, I think all those terms are different. The wireless health involves internet sensing, uh, wireless communication, computing, and uh, inter in intelligent techniques, such as artificial intelligence, in small health related applications, we look at the uh, uh, three actually main uh, components. The first sensing, so basically the uh, different type of sensors, like physiology signals for the body, uh, communication, so the wi wide communication, wireless communications. Uh, so, you know, like 5G, 6G, Bluetooth, you know, Zigbee, different kind of, uh, I think the people already talked today. And uh, a lot of actually, so we are not only just using sensors to collect data, but also want to actually uh, more data to the decision. So basically, uh, you know, give the uh, patient recommendations. So, so wireless health has um, two major components. The first is uh, digital health infrastructure, right? So basically, uh, through the wireless health, the health uh, we can ex expand traditional uh, health delivery models, uh, you know, with uh, communication infrastructures and also uh, with devices and uh, enable, also can enable, uh, uh, persuasive health monitoring. And uh, another aspect, uh, important part is uh, uh, through the wise health care, uh, health uh, technologies, the health care services can be transit, can be transited from the uh, clinical single health to care to the patient's single care and wellness. That means the health care services can be, uh, you know, uh, delivered to a home, workplace, and a community. So a lot of aspects, uh, actually, I've said I, I work on uh, my research mainly focus on IoT. So the IoT actually has a, a very early definition. I think that today we have a lot of IoT devices. I think the, uh, the, the variable device part of the IoT, right? So, uh, so the early definition was made by IEEE, uh, each embedded with sensor which are connected to the internet. That's what we call the uh, Internet of Things. Uh, but now it has uh, uh, broader definitions. Uh, if you look at one of the definitions, it's uh, uh, inter interconnection of the smart things, uh, involves multiple aspects. And uh, you look at the middle uh, figures, it shows uh, uh, you know, the internet thing, including applications, uh, network communication, data, uh, data communications, and the sensing part. So the IoT also, of course, there uh, has a lot of applications like smart cities, transportation, manufacturing, and so on, but healthcare is one of the main uh, applications. So, uh, so there are some applications IoT for wireless healthcare applications, uh, such as home back, uh, based care application. I think today, uh, several speakers talk about uh, in home health monitors, you different kind of sensors, uh, 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 you know, machine learning technologies, and sport health management and uh, uh, drug deliveries like electronic pill. Uh, so those, uh, all those actually applications relies on the sensors. Actually, the uh, people uh, already talk uh, have talked about today. So like uh, Zemisin sensors, ECG, SPO2, glucose, blood pressures. So I want actually uh, my research focus more on the body area networks. Okay, uh, another I think the uh, popular term is called body sensor networks. Body area networks. Uh, uh, so, so they're also similar. So the wireless body area networks is a, a key infrastructure of IoT for the wireless health, right? So the sensor usually, not, not just sensor, you know, also the, uh, uh, I mean, the, the uh, resource limited. Uh, sensors are actually resource limited in terms of uh, uh, computational power, in terms of uh, energy, uh, in terms of the, uh, the, the transmission barriers, like, like you, uh, 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 I, I would say the uh, five, six years ago, we talked about the sensor uh, communication. So basically, talk about 250k uh, BPS. You know, it's not a giga BPS, right? And another, uh, I think the low power, as low, because it has a low power requirements, uh, 
for the uh, sensor communications. In the middle, I showed uh, uh, a while ago, we have developed this wireless EGG systems. So it has three really systems. So uh, of course, the battery is uh, still big, right? Compared with coal, but, uh, uh, we can actually significantly reduce it if we uh, replace this battery. You, uh, so uh, it's it quite small, so the patient can carry the uh, this wireless ECG sensors uh, work around the hospital still at a home, but uh, we can uh, 24 hours collect ECG signal. So there are also other uh, kind of uh, applications like uh, EPO asthma monitoring, so I think the skin cancer detection. So, uh, so basically IoT can do a lot of things for the healthcare. The wireless body area networks, you know, uh, consists of the, the typical uh, architecture for the body sensor networks. You have the central unit, right? So uh, uh, generally, we can have a smartphone as a central unit, but you can also the, include, a, a, you know, several mini, uh, min, miniaturized body sensor unit we call the BSU. So different uh, uh, protocols like Bluetooth, I think Bluetooth today becoming popular, low power Bluetooth. Zigbee was uh, uh, was developed a while ago, and and also actually has a different kind of communication protocol for the wireless body area networks. So there are a lot of challenges for wireless body area networks. One is uh, you know the devices, it's all, you know challenge how to you know the, the the device must be small in size, you know large weight, uh, easy to use. Second is the privacy and the security. So. Uh, well, for application, we call uh, diabetes, uh, diabetes drug delivery systems. You have, uh, you know, the glucose sensors, which uh, measure the, uh, uh, the the glucose level in the blood, and virus transmit the glucose level to the pump, which deploy and uh, 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 other part of the body. So the the pump gonna inject insulin in the blood. This is a loop systems. However, if the virus transmissions of type could you know modify this glucose level, eventually you know a uh, pump could inject in, uh, redundant insulin in the blood, which kill the patient. So it's, it's the security also is a, a bigger concern uh, for the virus body area networks. A lot of interference. Uh, so today we talk about you know one sensor, two sensor, but future multiple sensor on the body. You know in the crowd. Uh, area so the people uh, because use the wireless communication they could have some interference how we kind of reduce the interference and uh, improve the system performance and improve the uh, also uh, interference could uh, uh, consume more the allergy dealing with the interference called consumer allergy how we save the allergy so the allergy uh, uh, the constraint is the fundamental challenge for the wireless body sensor networks you know uh, you know, the, of course, there are a lot of uh, uh, allergy harvesting technology available today, but there are still not enough to support at various body area sensor networks. Uh, reliability, we need a kind of reliable uh, software hardware for the sensor systems cost, right? So we want cheap, uh, cheap uh, sensors, you know. Uh, you know, today, you, you, you uh, like like the sensor, I, I just, uh, later on, I'm going to show ring sensor $200, that's still very expensive. Can we, you know, uh, reduce the cost of sensors. Okay, so well, for our study, actually focused on the communication aspect. So we actually developed this uh, called sixty gigahertz millimeter wave wireless body area networks. So that uh, basically, uh, of course, you know, today you you know the five G six 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 G uh, communication network use a high frequency band, like uh, uh, about twenty gigahertz or, or from twenty sixty gigahertz. Uh, but definitely, you know, we utilize this uh, definitely will improve the kind of uh, uh, transmission speed of the wireless uh, uh, body area networks. Uh, so basically, can increase the system capacity. Another aspect of uh, use uh, millimeter wave communications because we uh, use uh, directional communications that actually can uh, secure uh, more secure because uh, it's not like a traditional Wi-Fi or Bluetooth is omni. Direction communications, you know, that means a hacker could, uh, you know, uh, hear your communication uh, message, you know, but this is more directional communications. Another actually for the device miniaturizations, you know, the, the itinerary size actually is uh, uh, inverse proportional to the frequency, but you have high frequency band, so you, you can have smaller uh, itinerary uh, size antenna. So the basically use a high frequency band can actually minimize the the antenna uh, initially minimizes the device. So that's uh, uh, some performance, uh, uh, I think we started the pass loss uh, compare the conditional 2.0 gigahertz communication and the 60 gigahertz communications, so you see 
this uh, uh, six gigahertz can have uh, uh, lower price loss. Uh, so we have some device also a model here. So where for key study we uh, actually focus on is uh, uh, a variable by synthesis for remote de detection of life threatening even in infant. So this uh, uh, research is funded by uh, legend side for smart clay health programs. So we have been working with the UMass Medical School doctor. We went to UMass uh, uh, Medical School. Uh, uh, at the hospital, we saw a very tiny infant, you know, just one pound. You, you can see the difference in the ICU, different sensors attached on the infant's body. They are getting very sensitive. They cannot move too much because you can see a lot of people uh, use, uh, use uh, uh, I collect, uh, you know, the devices with with uh, kind of uh, uh, equipment like ECG equipment. So we say uh, that time we we say can we utilize various technology, sensing technology, and artificial intelligence uh, technologies to help those infants. So the system itself is not we we build up the system not just collect the physiology signal from the infant, but also we want actually make some predictions. For we for those infant could have some serious disease such as. Uh, uh, apnea, bradycardia, uh, hypoxia. Well, like bradycardia, so can we predict like three minutes uh, in the once when the uh, the infant could have bradycardia? So that's actually the goal of our project. So you can see the. Uh, so we actually develop some kind of uh, firstly utilize this called the uh, PCG approach, uh, body cardiography approach. So we uh, deploy the load cell sensors under the leg of the crib. Uh, for creeps, so the big heart going to cause some kind of uh, vibrations and the movement. So those kind of low sensors are very sensitive. They can measure that. So eventually we can come up the uh, the heart rates. Uh, you can see advantage of this approach is uh, long con sensors is easy to install and uh, also uh, free of size constraint uh, because it doesn't contact the infant's uh, uh, body. So it does, uh, doesn't require the patient's consent. Uh, but but of course there are some disadvantage because uh, uh, you know the, the the infant could have other kind of the regular movement so that creates the noise. We need some uh, approach to filter filter those noise and eventually uh, a lot of uh, it can only measure heart rates uh, very uh, sustainable to the motion and the environment noise. Uh, also of course it's costly. So a lot of our studies use this called EPIC sensors. Uh, Monitor heart rate use a capacitive uh, based ECG. So this uh, basically is measure electrical field changes. Uh, so it doesn't require any kind of uh, contact, uh, you know, to the uh, infant skin. So you can see just uh, so uh, this is a system we design. Uh, so basically, you can see the advantage is long long uh, It has wide compatibility, and but still some uh, as a disadvantage show he showing here. Uh, you know, sensitivity to motion, environmental noise, and heart rates. And also, uh, of course, they, this uh, if a, a wireless device need a, a regular be charged. So that's the some disadvantage. And uh, we also developed the reasons, I think the, pro, uh, the last speaker, uh, Professor, uh, also mentioned about this uh, uh, room sensors. We also developed similar things. Uh, 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 I think the, because, uh, because the advantage of the room sensors, the, the ring has a very close uh, contact with the uh, kind of uh, skin. Uh, so tight, tight, tight contact, so we can get a very strong signals. You can see the advantage is uh, very clear, strong signals, and uh, cost effective compared with the wristwatch. Uh, small in size, you know, we, can, we build up actually different kind of sensors. Uh, as I said, I'm, I'm, I'm doing kind of a system, basically integration different sensors, and uh, so the uh, measure the different signals. Uh, but of course, you know, the, I think the power is a lot of challenge for those kind of sensors. Uh, it has a, a close contact with uh, the uh, the, 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 infant, uh, the, the people's skin. So that, that's a lot of, you know, the, uh, it's not, uh, requires, uh, it requires patient contact. Also, it's not purely, uh, purely, uh, lung contact sensors. Uh, so, uh, we actually compare our uh, the, uh, the 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 sensors with uh, uh, E4 sensors developed by MIT. Uh, so the, the different uh, we actually do, did a, a real uh, kind of experiments and uh, uh, in our uh, by engineering department. And so uh, uh, so our sensors actually is very uh, have very comparable performance with these E4 sensors. Uh, therefore, in terms of this uh, 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 the hurry measurements. 
So, uh, of course, the last step is the feature extraction. Once we have signals, we need to uh, extract the features. So, the, uh, also, I think in the morning, uh, I think one speaker talked about the linear feature, long linear feature. We also look at this uh, uh, time domain features, frequency domain features, and the joint time frequency domain features. Uh, so, basically, uh, different kind of features we collect. And then you can see three major components, uh, data acquisitions, data collection, and the visualization data analysis uh, prediction models. The sensors and uh, communication data collection part, processing, uh, feature extraction, learning feature, uh, time frequency domain, joint time frequency domain features. And then we uh, map to feature different models and we do classification. The all, all, output of this system is, is the prevention. Basically, one actually predict when the infant can have a bricardia, like uh, three minutes at once. So, so the output is uh, uh, basically is, uh, uh, the, the, the prevention. Okay. So uh, we have the uh, so emulation uh, systems. And so basically, uh, it's, it's, not, uh, very, it's not actually easy to test uh, the stuff uh, you know, when build, after we build a prototype, you, you know, like directly uh, send it to the uh, hospital, test uh, on the uh, infant in ICU, but we have this. We also uh, have this uh, emulator systems. So basically, we have camera, different sensors, feature attractions. We actually try different, uh, uh, you know, the machine learning algorithms like decision tree, extreme uh, graded, king uh, different, and uh, uh, with all the features we have, also with reduced features because that, uh, you know, the uh, impact kind of the prediction uh you know the the time so we have different accuracy different uh uh the the, the latency and uh, I sh will show here so so uh, uh so rather uh, to end of my uh, my talk I'm gonna talk about some challenging issues uh uh, uh so why is it like sensor design so uh so we we actually can design different sensors but I think the well for important is uh, uh, specific to applications we actually need to customize the sensors you know uh it's not like you have built a one sensor you can that sensor can be used for our kind of uh disease applications you know so that's a lot uh, i think one of the challenging issues second is the processing because we uh, have uh, uh you know data we have uh, uh, for example machine learning algorithms so where we should uh, perform machine learning so uh sensor itself you know the as i said sensor resource limited so it has uh, uh, no uh, uh, powerful compu computing capability. So, but the sensor can do a little bit of processing, right? Single processing. Uh, so the, the 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 machine learning can be performed the age device. You know, like a uh, uh, your smartphone could be the age device. Or you you know today uh, we can uh, cloud. We have uh, uh, powerful servers with uh, powerful GPUs. So the data can be sent to the cloud. But there's a trade-off between the Always communication and the computing. Communication uh, uh, consume uh, more energy, uh, much uh, higher, uh, uh, like a, a high order energy than actually the computing. So it's important actually to 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 uh, to decide where the, those per, per, uh, processing should be performed. Another wise communications, uh, how we can uh, try different uh, communication techniques, not just. Uh, you know, two point figure gigahertz with different frequency band. How we can uh, improve the communication performance, energy performance. Uh, another important challenge is real time performance for AI machine learning. So that also the you know involves uh, my second uh, uh, you know the the question was pro processing perform. If you want to achieve the real time performance, you have probably you have to can run the those the machine learning actually age device. Okay, that's another. Issues, security, privacy, I already talked about. So I just stop here. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Uh, and we know that Professor Mistra is uh, in the background, so she can respond to questions too. So again, please close uh, close to the microphone and press the button, yeah. anyone. Okay. Uh, Dr. Bashkin, the floor is yours. 
Thanks. A wonderful talk, both of you. Is uh, Dr. Mishra? Yeah. Can you? Uh, for your uh, commentary on, based on all your work at the system level in the engineering space, if you had to kind of um, ask NIH and behavioral scientists uh, a roadmap of requests, you know, uh, what aspects of sensor design you think you need a prioritization or inputs from in order to translate that, you know, to use case faster? Can you comment on what you have heard from your colleagues and also what you think you know are still uh, missing or what you would like to learn? To both of you. First, but then you see the uh, uh, that's very a uh, good question. So I uh, so the previously actually I I think why go, you know I, today I, I I was talking about this uh, uh, infant monitoring uh, the project so. Uh, but uh, uh, that project is collaborations between uh, my, uh, between me and the UMass uh, medical school doctors. Uh, but you know that's actually uh, I think is uh, very important. Uh, you know how you know the uh, you know as uh, like an uh, engineer, right? So we build up sense of build up communication, build a system. How we can you know work with uh, uh, I think the uh, the the. Uh, the, the the medical school medical doctors de develop kind of real world applications. So uh, I feel uh, I I learned for that you know from my experience that you know uh, it's very important to have good communications. You know uh, you know focus on some kind of real medical problems. Uh, you know understand the the, uh, the needs and the requirements for medical side and then decide what kind of technology, what kind of sensor we want to develop. So that's the I feel quite uh, important. Uh, you know, uh, I'm not sure how to answer your question, but uh, that's something I learned. You know. I can also add maybe one aspect. Uh, one thing we would like to understand better is when uh, when there is uh, the phrase that people use: "We want continuous monitoring." What does continuous monitoring mean for different use cases? Um, Maybe in cardiac monitoring, it's really continuous, like every second counts or every even shorter than that counts. But is that true of all different um, scenarios, uh, whether it's maybe behavior or cognition? What does continuous mean in different use cases is, is one thing that will help us better design systems and better manage the energy so that they're always available to sense. And, uh Professor Khan? Yes. First question for Dr. Bina. Of the, uh, you talk about this uh, uh, power harvesting uh, from one device. Uh, will there be a power uh, distribution network to all the different sensors? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, so we uh, realize that no, there is no one type of power source that will be reliable all the time. Um, because uh, sometimes uh, uh, the thermal energy is not available. If the person's skin is covered up, uh, then the thermoelectric generator will not be able to generate the voltage because it's relying on a temperature difference. If the person is not moving, then you won't have the motion energy. And if the person is inside uh, in the dark uh, room or even indoor lighting, there's not enough solar available. So we, that's why we have generated a multi uh, uh, harvester power management unit, a circuit component that actually can uh, harvest from all different kinds of uh, sources that are available so that we can maintain that, um, that reliable operation. So we have been able to generate power from uh, motion and, and thermal, and even combining thermal and solar into one, uh, one combined uh, device is, is uh, also something we've been able to, to demonstrate. Thank you very much. One more question for uh, Hongge. Yeah, do you think Bluetooth is enough or this is a 60 gigahertz is really necessary? Uh, that's also a very good question. So. Uh, you know, the, uh, the low today, so uh, we have low power Bluetooth tech technology, right? So the, they, 
uh, actually this technology has been utilized for many uh, application, not just medical, uh, Medicare applications. Uh, I think the currently, uh, you know, for many applications, the data rate, uh, you know, the transmission rate supported by uh, low power Bluetooth is, is good enough. Uh, but the they future, there will be more uh, applications, you know, medical applications, which require the higher data rates, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, we, uh, so, so uh, today, uh, I think that we have more kind of, uh, uh, for example, uh, we, uh, one of the applications is just uh, like uh, uh, virtual reality, uh, video monitoring, so those stuff. So that actually requires a higher data rate. Another, uh, I think, 60 gigahertz communication advantage is, is uh, secure. So basically, it's directional communications and said, uh, you know, uh, that. Uh uh you know the the has uh can uh you know the the better than the omni direction like traditional uh you know, two point four gigahertz uh, bluetooth te technologies and also helps uh, actually reduce the size of device and antenna size because the the frequency band you know uh that's uh, uh i think the uh you know i i believe there should be some better techniques in future that replace the low power bluetooth Sergeant? One more question, it's a slightly different topic uh, for both of them. Uh, both of you mentioned briefly AI ML in your pipelines towards the end. Can you make some commentary on how not just you, but as a community, we should think about how much data is enough to build a model and how do we understand, you know, representation of the data and the distribution of the data? And, you know, can we think about ways in which we can start quantifying you know, something like a figure of merit for not just the performance of the data in terms of how accurate things are relative to a baseline, but because all machine learning data actually learns from a, you know, a population, we need figure of merits for also representation of the population mm -hmm. itself. Please talk into the microphone. It would be good to speak straight. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I wanted them to comment on the AI ML data, both in terms of how much is good enough for building models and how do we build figures of merit for representation of population uh, in the data set to know that it's good enough. Because unlike physics based, you know, figures of merit, it's not about that one person, it's about the whole population that the model is learned. I think that's a very good question. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, uh, I think that's a very good question. So uh, today we talk about uh, learn learn from big data, learn also from small data, right? So I think people mention small data. I, I would say that really depends on what application uh, you're gonna uh, uh, you know work on. So what kind of medical uh, application uh, you know uh, uh, the problem, the medical problem you, you're gonna solve. I. I you know, even uh, we, uh, I think in the morning, talk about some machine learning algorithm, you know, of course today, like a deep learning, uh, you know, it's very popular, a lot of people use a deep learning, but probably some application, you just even linear regression, you know, decision tree you can solve, you know, perfectly. So that's uh, uh, really, I would say the deep on, uh, you know, what application you work on. Thank you, Nina. Uh, I, I guess I can add that uh, I think we're, we are, that's a really good question. And we're still, I think, at the very early stages of uh, getting all the data that we need to train the model. So one example is, you know, when we have the, 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 the measurement of cough, uh, as I was showing, um, if, if you just measure, uh, you know, very straightforward, clean coughing, that's and you can train the model that way, but in the field, you're gonna have all these unexpected sounds like the cars going by or the environmental sounds. So we have to actually make sure that we have all that kind of data. Uh, so uh, I would say that we are we don't have that problem yet of having too much data. So, um, but this is something that we have to build into the models. Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions from virtual participants? No questions at the moment. So we have more time for audience participation here. Thank you. Uh, so we can do. All right. Okay. So I'm Laura Cabrera from Penn State. Um, so I was really intrigued by a point that Dr. Wan made in his presentation where he said a con 
of the sensor ring was patient consent. And so that really elicits my thinking in terms of, you know, we have all these multimodal sensors. And you mentioned consent in the light because this was a, a you know, it was a contact, a, a direct contact with the, with the person. But how are we supposed to think about consent where we have all these ways in measuring different things, some with contact, some without contact? Um, so any thoughts on that would be, you know, very welcome. And that connects to the point that uh, Dr. Misra also made in terms of continuous monitoring. Again, you know, if we can monitor 24 seven, when do, do we or do patients or participants have a, you know, do they have a say in what part of the day they might not want to be monitoring? Because I think that's relevant if we really want to get buy-in in terms of, you know, people using uh, these devices. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, thank you for your question. I think the, uh, uh, the, the contact, the long contact, what, what I mean, so uh, basically, uh, you know, the contact means uh, uh, contact uh, the skin, okay? The long time contact, so, uh, you know, basically, uh, either uh, the sensor doesn't touch kind of uh, body or the, just uh, touch the closest. So that's, uh, uh, so the, 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 the diff yeah. So maybe I was not, uh, did not explain myself. You mentioned that consent was a con of the sensor ring. So you mentioned patient consent is a con. And I'm thinking, why is patient consent not even relevant in all of the other ways that you mentioned? And so I wanted to just kind of get clarity why in that particular context it was oh, more so relevant. It, so that, so that uh, basically mean consent means, uh, you know, if we actually give the sensor to the, uh, like a hospital, right? Ask the, we ask the, uh, the the new lace to to wear the sensors. Uh, so basically, uh, that actually need a kind of a, uh, you know the 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 the, the agreement, right? So because it contacts the uh, uh, you know the skin of the uh, the the infant, right? So that's that's what say the consent. So the third ring sensor is not a uh, you know long contact sensor. So. And I can just maybe add a second part of the question that you that you asked about the the twenty four seven monitoring and and how does this impact uh, the patient's consent? I think this is a, a big problem unless we show the the value of twenty four seven monitoring. And for that, we need to show how collecting that data will provide a much better uh, uh, result or much better better inference for the person. Uh, otherwise, uh, otherwise, I think there will be a major pushback on 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 this this much sensing. So, we have to provide uh, the value, and that's why we need to work with the clinicians to understand what use cases need that you know twenty four seven monitoring, and what use cases are okay just uh, uh, with much less monitoring. I'm not sure if Dr. Cabrera was happy with the answer on consent. Is that okay? Close the issue for you or not? So um, I'm trying to think how to best ask my question. So to me, even those previous examples that you provided in terms of, you know, you have the sensors that are not touching the skin of the baby. If you're monitoring someone constantly, so why wouldn't that require, you know, consent from the participant like i wouldn't like someone measuring my you know my uh bio you know biological measures without me knowing right just because you can do it wireless doesn't mean that we should do it so that's the point i was trying to make and i mean you don't need to specifically answer but i think you making the point made me think that in 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 the conference overall we should be thinking about those questions so okay thank you thank next you. Thank you. Hi there. Satra Ghosh from MIT. Uh, I have a question coming back to the sensors. In the open source software world, we put code out there for other people to use. We put models out there that people can use and validate. In the sensor development world, is there a similar analog to GitHub, some hardware hub or sensor hub, where you can put blueprints to kind of create this transition where other people can build out those same sensors and collect data to validate it. Is that something that's in the works that you are thinking about, or would that be a useful thing to exist? Uh, I think that's a great vision. So uh, 
you know the uh so the the i think the uh, we need a kind of the infrastructure you know for example sensor collect to the cloud so cloud have a database collect all the data in real time somehow you know the users or the researchers basically can access those sensors from the cloud even but i think that that's uh i think a lot of challenging issues you know because the uh, not just data itself, right? So you, because if you sensors are uh, deployed on the patient's body, right? So somehow the, the patient need to decide, you know, all, you know, some kind of strategy we need to use to keep, uh, keep private data privacy, something like that. It's hard to do kind of, uh, you know, uh, you know, for, for example, the researchers can real time to more, you know, for example, control that kind of sensors, collect the data remotely. You know, I think that's some challenging issue there. So, but I think that's a great vision, you know, how we can, you know, like sensor community, different sensors, we can, you know, for example, collect, you know, maybe like a build up cloud infrastructures, like, so basically for other research to re, uh, use those data or the devices, I think that probably, you know, I think will be good for the, the research community. Uh, I can add just a, a little bit more to that. I, we already are doing uh, this type of collaboration with several people. Uh, we we build platforms in our center, and uh, some of the some of the components are COTS, and some of the components are research uh, components. And we actually uh, can and do send these out for other people to either add on their sensors on top of it or uh, collect the data. So we are trying to get to that that vision that you just presented of having a open open source uh, hardware uh, approach for sensors. Thank you, Vina. Any more questions from the floor? Or do we have any virtual questions that have arrived? One. Oh, there is. Oh, please. Hi, a really interesting presentations. Thank you. Uh, I'm Kent Warner. I'm a associate professor of neurology at across the street at the Uniform Services University, and I do a lot of uh, wearables uh, sleep research. And I'm really interested. I didn't hear a whole lot of sleep. I heard some from Vina, and uh, I was just interested. What kind of challenges in the sleeping realm you guys are interested in tackling? And uh, you know, it's really challenging for us clinically and from a research standpoint to understand the impact of our therapies, uh, either in a clinical trial or as we take care of our patients. And that, while people are sleeping, it seems to be one of the most, uh, you know, I guess we need the most objective data, the, the most monitoring because we can't get it from them and bringing them into the lab is not only uh, challenging and expensive, but maybe not so accurate. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on that uh, topic specifically. Does anybody want to take the question? Uh, yeah, I think uh, one one challenge is the size of the sleep system. So um, if, if typical sleep, sleep systems are a little bit cumbersome to wear and, and actually get accurate uh, sleep studies while they are at home. So that's one of the motivations for us to build the platform that I showed where it was a Band-Aid or a very, very thin form factor patch that allows us to get more accurate sleep data. Um, so that's, uh, that's one big aspect of it. And I guess coupling it with other sensors that are not available in typical sleep monitoring systems, whether it's activity or core body temperature and, and making a multimodal system. And, and also looking at the performance of the sleep beyond just sleep apnea. Uh, sleep apnea might be easier to detect, but there might be other more in-depth uh, signals that might be uh, available if you have this um, high-performing, high-accurate sleep monitoring system. Okay, it seems that uh, this is it. So I'm closing the session three and uh, the floor is going to be taken by Professor Chiao and Rogers. Okay, um, first of all, thank you all very much. I know it's a long day and we have, we try to pack as many as uh, possible talks uh, because this is a very rare uh, occasion 
that uh, we can bring so many top researcher together in one room. Um, so, and first of all, also, this is our first in-person meeting. So uh, without any accident happened, so I would like to thank you all very much. Uh, so today, we heard about hardware development for sensor, a wearable, implantable, and we talk about our presenter talk about device, component, system, firmware, and software. And these are being used for physiological, electrochemical, and biochemical signal sensing. And there's uh, obviously a lot of innovation uh, for our clinical colleague uh, to consider. Then uh, we have a, a section to discuss about multi-sensor platform for clinical aspect. And we heard uh, five experts to talk about their real experience uh, in using the sensor in SS uh, children and elderly. And now we also know that what kind of an issue uh, our sensor community has to uh, overcome. Uh, then our next uh, section, uh, we have talked about a power and energy uh, issue. Uh, uh, Dr. Smith mentioned about the battery life is very important uh, for sensing. And this, uh, I think our sensor community can address in near future. And then we talk about the connectivity with a body uh, area network uh, to talk about the ubiquitous uh, networking uh, to connect all the sensors. And of course, uh, during the uh, conversation, several questions keep popping up, such as uh, privacy, consent issue. And so uh, tomorrow, uh, we have uh, one session. We'll talk about remote sensing uh, combined with AI and machine learning, which we also discussed uh, today. Uh, the remote sensing can sense the person Passively, so you don't even know you're being monitored. So obviously, uh, the privacy issue will come up. So after that, uh, we also have a section to discuss standard, safety, ethical issue, and regulatory uh, issue. Uh, many of these issues, as engineer, cannot resolve. And I think we have to rely on NIH's effort to push this issue up to the Congress uh, to pass a law to allow uh, everybody use the data safely. So uh, tomorrow we will have a section uh, to, to discuss about this issue. And then we also have a section to talk about computational model that uh, can accelerate the sensor development and try to predict, uh, try to have predictive uh, model for all this clinical issue. Then tomorrow we will end with a future direction discussion. I think uh, this is a very rare occasion. We all are together. So we would like to provide as much as uh, feedback uh, to NIH so they have some foundation to build up uh, the future program. And since I all got you all here, this is a very rare opportunity. So please don't leave too early. We're going to have a group photo after this. And now, uh, Dr. Rogers. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say a few words. First of all, thanks to uh, JC for his uh, you know, excellent stewardship of the of the event today. Uh, maybe even more importantly, Yvonne and Dana and all the support staff at uh, NIH. It really ran smoothly uh, today. But but I think you know it, it wouldn't be a workshop without the speakers in the audience and. Uh, I think we heard a lot of really great presentations. Everybody stayed on time, which was amazing. I think we're within one minute of the, the schedule that we have projected uh, for today. But but also thanks to the audience. There was just tremendous engagement, great questions, great discussions. And I think that's kind of the purpose of an event like this is to get that dialogue started and, and to kind of bring these diverse pieces uh, together. But what really struck me is not, not only the quality you know, of the of the presentations, but but the diversity of the content uh, as well. It, it was amazing. I think we started out talking about tunneling transistors, and <laughs> we ended up uh, you know discussing scale deployment of uh, commercially 
available devices and, and sort of uh, everything uh, in between, you know, in terms of device uh, diversity, but, but also, you know, application to, to neurons, individual cells, crayfish, mice, babies, the elderly, pretty much span the, the whole gamut uh, there. And, and in terms of uh, modality sensing, you know, not only biophysical, but also biochemical, I think multi, multi-modality is kind of a theme that, that emerged uh, from today, uh, from today's discussions. Um, so deployability, accuracy, longitudinal capabilities and tracking variability and the, sort of the context and the cost and so on. And, and thinking about, you know, the full pipeline, not only sort of academic research level devices, some of which may turn out to be curiosities, but others of which may represent, you know, a starting point for, for devices that really can be can be deployed and, and used in a meaningful way with, with human subjects. So this whole idea, I think Professor Lockhart, I'll steal this from sort of research to reality, uh, I think is, is a real opportunity now that you know, so many different types of sensors are, are, are available and sort of offering the kind of accuracy and the deployability, the scalability that you need to really, you know, test hypotheses around brain function and, and connections to, to behavior. And, and then, you know, kind of the question is, how do you do that? How do you go from research uh, to reality? And I think in one of the discussion sections, something that really stuck out to me, uh, to me anyway, was this idea of deploying and developing in parallel, you know, because, because I think, you learn a lot when when these devices get out into the field and users are engaging with them and data streams are, are are coming back and you can kind of understand the gaps and the opportunities and that kind of information can really feed back in a powerful way to the developments in engineering science that that can uh, you know further refine the devices and enable them to use, uh, be used in, in in a more practical way and so I think today really sets the stage for a lot of the conversations that will happen tomorrow around the question of how do you extract decisions and insights from, from the data. And, and I think it's going to be a very exciting day uh, tomorrow. And so I look forward to seeing you all uh, again uh, tomorrow morning. Thank you. So thank you everyone for today. And thank you for your participation in the room and online. So this will end our discussions for today. For those attending online, we will start again at 10 a.m. Eastern. Thank you.